Varmt välkomna till Arkitekturdagarna i Malmö. Vi sänder live från en studio på Form Design Center och vi har nu två heldagar. Fyra halvdagar med lite olika fördjupningar och ett fullmatat program på temat arkitektur att se fram emot. Arkitekturdagarnas återkommande tema är framtidens arkitektur och framtidens arkitektroll. Och vi diskuterar från olika perspektiv för att få en bredd i samtalet. Jag som är moderator och initiativtagare till Arkitekturdagarna heter Gunilla Kronvall. Och jag vill särskilt idag tacka årets huvudsponsor Mur och Putsföretagen som stöttar Arkitekturdagarna för andra året i rad. For our English speaking audience, welcome to the Swedish Arkitekturdagarna. The talks today are in English. However, some introductions and conversations between Swedish guests will be in Swedish. In a few minutes, I will introduce the first speaker of the day in English, so bear with us. Arkitekturdagarna arrangeras av det som kallas Sveriges arkitekter på Form Design Center. Och nu har jag med mig här i studion Tobias Olsson, förbundsdirektör på Sveriges arkitekter. Och Dorte Boboisen, vd på Form Design Center. Välkomna! Tobias, Sveriges arkitekter, det känner ju många i vår publik till som organisation. Mm. Men vill du berätta lite mer? Jag är inte säker på att alla känner till riktigt hur, hur Sveriges arkitekter arbetar. Och kanske framförallt, vad är fokus just nu? Mm. Nej, men eh, jättekul att vara här. Eh, jättekul att arkitekturdagarna är, är igång igen. Jag älskar den här eftersommaren traditionen som det har blivit nu. Eh, och, och Sveriges arkitekter, ja men vi sysslar ju med en rad olika frågor. Ett sånt här sorts event är en av de sakerna som, eh, som, som vi gör. Men vi är ju eh, en organisation för dig som är arkitekt, landskapsarkitekt, inredningsarkitekt eller planeringsarkitekt. Och vi finns där för dig vare sig du är eh, anställd eller chef eller driver eget eller är student eller är arbetssökande. Och jobba med allt från fackliga frågor och just nu är det ju ganska mycket fokus på, 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 på LAS eller lagen om anställningsskydd och den omgörelse på svenska arbetsmarknaden som håller på. Men vi jobbar också mycket med kompetensutveckling, med grundutbildningsfrågor, med tävlingar, vi ger ut tidningar och böcker och inte minst lobbying och opinion och det som är... I fokus där, det skulle jag säga är ju, eh, ja, LOU är alltid i fokus på ett sätt eh, och, och annan lagstiftning. Men även klimat- och hållbarhetsarbetet och framförallt liksom omställningen som också den här dagen kommer att handla mycket om. Mm. Hur ser det lobbyarbetet och politiska arbetet ut? Ja, men det sker på massa olika nivåer. Allt, allt från att, eh, att få eh, lagstiftare och, och beställare eller byggherrar och förstå vad arkitekterna kan bidra med i den här omställningen i ett, liksom ett opinionsarbete. Men det handlar ju också om, om, om rent konkret lagstiftning för att höja incitamenten för att eh, göra smartare och göra bättre och, och göra mer hållbart. Och där, ja, vi, I nästa vecka har vi ett möte med, med bostadsminister Märta Stenevid till exempel för att och, och snacka just om hur vi kan minska sårbarheten i materialförsörjningen men att minska materialanvändningen mm. totalt, inte minst genom återbruk. Då. Mm. Så många frågor på många fronter arbetar ni? Så är det. Ja, ja. Tack Tobias. Eh, Dotte, Form Design Center, arkitekturdagarna sänds ju härifrån. Men berätta gärna kort för vår publik runt om i landet också, vad är Form Design Center? Mm. Jag vill först tacka, tack till dig Gunilla, tack till Sveriges arkitekter och också säga varmt välkommen till arkdagarna här 2021 på Form Design Center. Ja, Form Design Center är ju en traditionsrik plats och vi är ju den främste mötesplats för arkitektur, design och konsthandverk här placerat centralt på Hedmanske gården i Malmö. Och verksamheten ser jag som en hybrid mellan kultur och näringsliv och med en jättestark lokal och regional förankring. Och det har vi ju haft faktiskt med den historik vi har. Och den är ganska genuin, 57 år mm. på plats här i Malmö. Och vi har faktiskt en verksamhet som berör någonstans mellan 110 000 till 115 000 människor analogt årligen. 
Så vi når jo ganske bredt ud. Og det gør vi jo i relation til kan man sige, det nationale opdrag, som Form Design Center har, som noget for gestaltet livsmiljø. Og i en regional kontekst, så skal vi netop bidrage til en øget forståelse for, hvad arkitektur og design og kunsthåndværk og dets rolle har i en holdbar samfundsudvikling netop for øh, livs, eller kvalitets- og livsmiljøer for alle. Og det bliver uhørt vigtigt, og vi centrerer ganske mykke på det, og det gør vi jo igennem at udvikle, apropos med en programformat, som arkdokkerne i dag. Vi gør det igennem udstillinger, og vi gør det jo også igennem at deltage vældig aktivt i øh, udviklingsprojekt. Og det gør vi jo i en, en samværken øh, med et, et, et øh, kan man sige, vi jobber ganske holistisk, det står jo også i politikken, og med fokus på holdbar øh, udvikling og netop i samværken i en tværdisciplinær øh, præmis, så skal vi jo jobbe med brancheorganisationer, øh, offentlige sektor, akademi og så også aktører. Og på det sæt, så fylder vi jo huset med ildehold året om. En intensiv verksamhet på många fronter hör jag och som berör många Malmöbo och människor i södra Sverige och som nod för att livsmiljö. Stort tack då. Jag vill fråga er också, är det någonting i programmet de här två dagarna som ni ser särskilt mycket fram emot? Då jag börjar med dig. Ja, alltså jag, när jag läser programmet så tänker jag, wow, ett spännande program. Och, och ju både med ett, ett internationellt perspektiv som adresserar arkitektur och design. Jag tycker det är viktigt att vi också bør at diskutere de her to emnesområder, og hør, dog går de enkelt ind i hverandre. Jeg tykker, der er uhørt mange interessante indlæg, som jeg ser frem imod. Men specielt ser jeg vel frem imod førmiddagens introduktion til begrebet antropocene. Og hvad, hvad er det enkelt at høre? Kan vi jobbe med det inden om de her emnesområder? Og så er det klart, at eftermiddagens internationale session er også vældig vigtig. Spännande. Och Tobias, vad säger du? Ja, men det är faktiskt en väldigt svår fråga att svara på. För det, det är ett enormt eh, gediget program. Eh, och det ena ser mer intressant ut än det andra. Eh, men, jag, jag, nej, men jag ser fram emot det bästa. Jag tycker också att f, 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 eftermiddagens liksom, fokus på lite, lite nyheter och metodutveckling. Mm. Om man liksom kan få med sig. Det kommer jag anteckna ganska mycket inför mm. nästa veckas möte. Till exempel då som jag pratade om. Men, men också den här nordiska spaningen i morgon. Den tycker jag ska bli jättespännande. Men jag tycker det mesta ser väldigt, väldigt roligt ut. Härligt. Det är gott att ha er med här. Och ni är ju kvar under dagarna. Vi möter er imorgon igen. Stort tack Dort och Tobias. Tack Gunilla. Tack Gunilla. Och då ska vi kicka igång årets program. Idag kommer alla föreläsningar och presentationer att vara på engelska. <hör> Däremot så kommer vi till viss del prata svenska mellan presentationerna. Jag hoppas att ni hänger med i språkväxlingarna under dagen. Vi ska börja med en fråga som sedan några år tillbaka diskuteras. Och det är frågan om planeten har gått in i en ny tidsålder. En ny geologisk epok från den holocena tidsåldern som vi har varit i sedan istiden till den antropocena. Antropocen innebär att den mänskliga aktiviteten nu påverkar planetens både ekosystem, klimat och jordskåpa. För att ge oss en bakgrund och introduktion har vi nu med oss professor Jamie Lorimer från England. Jamie Lorimer är professor i miljögeografi vid Oxford universitet. I sin forskning studerar han allmänhetens syn på naturen och hur dessa påverkar utformandet av regelverk. I now want to welcome our first speaker today on the topic of architecture in the Anthropocene. Jamie Lorimer is professor of environmental geography at Oxford University. His research explores public understandings of nature and how these come to shape environmental governance. Jamie is the author of Wildlife in the Anthropocene, Conservation after Nature, 
as well as the probiotic planet using life to manage life. His current research explores transitions in agriculture in the context of growing concerns about the relationships between farming, biodiversity, loss and global heating. Today, the title of his talk is The Anthropocene and its Implications for Environmentalism. Jamie, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to, to join you for, for your event. Um, I'm going to um, move uh, forward with a, with a presentation, um, and I have some slides. So uh, if we could bring those up, and I'll, uh, I'll get going with, with my talk. Um, so really, what I wanted to do today is just to provide you with an introduction to the concept of the Anthropocene, and then to reflect a little bit upon how it's been picked up in a range of different social uh, and cultural milieu uh, and has come to shape uh, contemporary environmentalism. Some of you may have come across the Anthropocene as a, as a concept, but I, I anticipate that many of you haven't. So I'll start right, right at the beginning. Uh, and the story here really starts with the uh, atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen, a very famous, uh, very distinguished uh, scientist who, who unfortunately died uh, this year. Uh, and Crutzen, in his conversations with scientists, found himself increasingly frustrated with the term the Holocene. And the Holocene is the term that's used to describe the contemporary epoch in, in which we live. So the period of time that geologists use to describe the present, and particularly the last uh, 12,000 years or so since the end of the last ice age. Um, and Crutzen felt that the Holocene didn't really capture the contemporary nature of the, of the planet now. Uh, and in an outburst, he he suggested that it seems to us more appropriate to emphasize the central role of mankind in geology and ecology by proposing to use the term Anthropocene to describe the current geological epoch. And he wrote this up in a, in a paper in 2000, uh, which came to name this, this new term and this new way of thinking about Earth history. So this visualization here shows uh, in a cartoonish fashion the ways in which geologists come to think about um, deep time over the last 4.6 billion years. And it tends to divide time up into these, these slices, if you like, these, these periods of time of which the Holocene shown up there at the top underneath the truck with the fossil in it uh, is the contemporary period. And so Crutzen is suggesting that we need to slice the top layer off the Holocene uh, and really uh, think about a new way of understanding time in, 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 that, in that context. He put out this proposal, and it's been much discussed by, by scientists who've really come to think about where uh, in historical time might we um, pin this start date. So we accept that the magnitude of human impacts on the planet now is so great that we may well be tipping out of the Holocene into the Anthropocene. There's been a great deal of debate in the scientific community about when this might begin. Some would like to take it back well before the Holocene, uh, to the emergence of, of, of humans that controlled fire, uh, that, that hunted, that killed uh, many of the large animals that used to characterize the planet. Others would date the start of the Anthropocene up to the beginning of agriculture, um, all the way through to uh, the Industrial Revolution. But the consensus at the moment seems to be settling in on what's called the Anthropocene Great Acceleration. So the period after the Second World War, in which there were dramatic increases in the use of fossil fuels, in the use of artificial fertilizers and, and pesticides uh, that really pushed um, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, over and above uh, historically precedented uh, levels. And so the, the Anthropocene Working Group, who are the group of scientists who are now charged with deciding whether or not the Anthropocene should exist, have settled in on a date just after the Second World War uh, to try and pin this down as the moment in which the Anthropocene begins. And one of the key elements to this idea of the Anthropocene is to start to think of the planet as a fragile and bounded uh, unit, let's say, and particularly to think about the planet as marked by a series of boundaries or thresholds that shouldn't be exceeded. And in exceeding those boundaries or thresholds, the planet will tip from the conditions of the Holocene that led to the emergence of human civilization 
into this new and dangerous condition of, of the Anthropocene. And so these planetary boundaries are sketched out here on this diagram from, from Johann Jokström and his, and his colleagues. And the ones in red shows the ones that, that have been uh, exceeded or we're getting close to exceeding. So the top one, climate change, we're moving close towards a threshold that uh, would understandably tip us across uh, the planetary boundary. Uh, biodiversity loss shown there, bottom left, we've already exceeded what is understood to be sustainable in terms of uh, the, the loss of species. So we get this new understanding of the planet emerging as one marked by boundaries and thresholds. And alongside that, an understanding of a planet that's marked by particular tipping points or cascades. So you hear a lot of about this in the, in the news at the moment, a sense that the planet would be marked by feedback effects. So one particular change, for example, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet uh, could have ramifications through the global system that could lead to runaway climate change, that could lead to the acceleration of these processes of tipping out of the Holocene uh, into the Anthropocene. So the planet emerges here as a, as a nested system of systems uh, that can be subject to interventions that will ramify across different parts of the world. So the melting of the permafrost in Siberia, for example, can have all sorts of consequences on weather systems in other parts of the world. So we increasingly encourage to think of the world as this uh, system that is uh, very susceptible to, to relatively small changes that can, that can set off processes elsewhere. And this has understandably led to a great deal of alarm among scientists and then amongst the policymakers who are charged with uh, adhering to, to the advice offered by scientists and particularly to try and attend to the contemporary moment in which the future of the Earth system is very much held to be in, in jeopardy uh, at stake. This diagram here from, from Will Steffen uh, usefully captures this idea of the point that we're at at the moment. So if you imagine the Earth is a marble and it's rolling down this uh, landscape on, on the left there, and we've moved from the Holocene at the back of the diagram through to the contemporary present in which the, the Earth is, is perched on a precipice, if you like, and there's the possibility it will cross over this threshold and drop down into the hothouse Earth condition shown at the bottom there. Or if we can develop forms of Earth system stewardship, it will move to the left on the diagram towards a stabilized condition, a stabilized condition that would be conducive to the continuation uh, of life on Earth. And this is the key moment, if you like, we find ourselves at at the moment, where there is this possibility of uh, serious political action to avoid the tipping over that threshold down into hothouse Earth and to bring the planet towards a stabilized condition uh, on, on the left there. The diagram on the right shows how hard it will be to bring it back again. So if, if, we, if we're moving uh, out along that top right arc of the red arrow that heads out towards hot house Earth, um, it becomes harder and harder to bring the Earth back into uh, conditions conducive to, to civilization the further we go uh, over, over that threshold. So that's a short summary of the, of the science, if you like. Uh, and some of that will be familiar. It's very much in the news. It's very much dominating uh, public debate in, in, in many Western countries. And it's produced a series of, of wider cultural responses. So the Anthropocene itself, since it was coined in, in the year 2000, has significantly grown in popularity as a, as a media event uh, and as a search term. So that the diagram at the top of your image there shows the popularity of the Anthropocene as a Google search term over the last 15 years or so, and we see a, a, an increase over that period. The Anthropocene has come to feature on the front cover of The Economist. Uh, it's featured in high profile editorials in English language publications like The, the New York Times uh, and, and, the, uh, and The Guardian. And in some ways, it's come to name a contemporary zeitgeist, a contemporary anxiety about the state of the environment uh, and what we ought to do about it. So beyond these uh, media discussions, there's been a proliferation of, of books and, and publishing with Anthropocene in the title. Uh, these are just a few uh, that, I've, that I've taken off, uh, off, off my shelves here, including one there uh, named Architecture in the Anthropocene. So there is a, a precursor to this conference. But as I say, it's become a useful publishing zeitgeist to, to, to capture the contemporary concerns among scientists, amongst philosophers, amongst people in the humanities, about the relationships between people and the planet in the contemporary present. 
The Anthropocene has also uh, been picked up in, in, in film and, and, and music, a range of documentaries, a range of uh, popular cultural forms that again are using this as a way of trying to open up broader discussions about human environmental relations in, in the present. Uh, and then finally, a set of uh, art exhibitions, these two in, in Germany, one at the Haus der Kultur der Welt in, in, uh, in, in Berlin happened over a period from, from 2013 uh, through through the through the, the subsequent uh, few years, and, and this one at the Deutsche Museum, uh, again using the Anthropocene as a, as a curatorial prompt uh, to think about technology, think about human uh, environment relations. And at the heart of this thinking around the Anthropocene are some quite profound uh, challenges to contemporary Western thought. So quite profound challenges, in particular, to how we think about the relationships between nature and society how we think about the place of people in the world. Uh, and a great deal of, of Western environmentalism has often been based on the idea that we can save nature by drawing lines about it and, and setting it aside, conserving it in national parks, conserving it in nature reserves, conserving it in places that should be held timeless and, and, and untouched. Um, that idea is really brought into, uh, into perspective. It's really challenged by the diagnosis of the Anthropocene. So as Bill McKibben, the popular American science writer, argues, the diagnosis of the Anthropocene really brings to the end an idea of nature which is defined by virtue of it being untouched by human hands. If the planet itself is now shaped by human activities, there is no such thing as nature. There's no pure place that we can point to on the map and say, there's nature, keep it as it is. As long as it doesn't change, our job is done. Uh, instead, we get a very different understanding of the earth as characterized by what Earl Ellis describes as anthromes. So a, a typology of types of natural habitat that are characterized by different degrees of human impact. So there isn't a simple nature society binary. Instead for Earl Ellis and, and other uh, scientists who work on biodiversity and biodiversity conservation, we need to think about this complicated continuum between wild lands and used lands where used lands are marked by um, urban spaces, by agricultural sites, by an, a growing amount of uh, non-native species, uh, in contrast to wilder lands, which are still marked by different climates, different uh, combinations of species, but perhaps have greater degrees of, of ecological resilience uh, and flourishing. And one of the radical proposals of this is that we can find fragments of valuable land in amongst the used land in cities in agricultural spaces, rather than just prioritizing uh, the wild places, the places that are, that are untouched by human hands. So there are some profound uh, consequences of the diagnosis of the Anthropocene for how we think about nature. There are also some profound consequences in the diagnosis of the Anthropocene for how we think about human responsibility. So in this influential paper by two political scientists, Andreas Marm and Alf Homburg, they took issue with the label the Anthropocene. They said the Anthropocene isn't the best label to describe the contemporary present, because it tends to assume that everybody is responsible for this uh, set of contemporary problems. The anthropos, if you like, the species is responsible. And instead, they suggest that we need to think much more carefully about historical responsibility uh, in terms of the uh, levels of, of greenhouse gas emissions. We need to think about uneven patterns of ability to cope with the consequences of climate change and other, other effects. Uh, and we need to think about uh, the unequal benefits of the contemporary way uh, in which the environment is used at the moment. So just to give one graph here to illustrate this, so this is a graph that shows carbon dioxide emissions per capita, and we see stark differences between different uh, nation states uh, in 2015. So this is the amount of carbon dioxide given off by any one citizen in these countries. You know, if you compare Bangladesh at the bottom with the United States at the top, it's a much greater degree of responsibility of citizens in the United States than citizens in Bangladesh. And of course, within the United States, there will be big differences between the wealthy and the poor in the United States itself. So people beginning to question the, the, the use of the label the Anthropocene, suggesting that it perhaps masks important historical differences between uh, environmental uh, damage, but also marks contemporary differences in terms of causation in terms of responsibility. Uh, and they've come to suggest a range of other labels that might describe the present. 
Some, for example, would want to say we live in the capital scene, that it's capitalism that has driven uh, the, 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 the contemporary juncture, let's say. OK, so alongside concerns about the relationship between um, humans and, 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 and the natural world, a set of conceptual, political, theoretical concerns uh, about what the Anthropocene tells us about social justice, about historical justice, about colonialism, about the relationships that we have with each other, which are mediated by contemporary uh, environmental problems. But what I'd like to do for, for the remainder of, of this lecture is really just focus in on how policymakers and practitioners have come to respond to the Anthropocene as a provocation, as a way of uh, thinking differently about our relationships to the environment and how we ought to go forward uh, thinking through what we ought to do with science and technology, what we ought to do with politics uh, in order to, to tackle some of the environmental problems that face us in the present day. And here I have a typology of responses. It's very broad brush and it, it masks a great deal of difference, but it's useful to begin to sketch out some of the different ways in which we might think about what architects and others might do in the face of the Anthropocene. So the first set of responses if we would grant that they were responses at all, are denial. And denial of the science, denial of the problem, a denial that this is happening or that there is anything much that human society can, can do about it. Um, these are sophisticated political uh, activities, often um, with histories in other forms of denial, for example, around um, the ways in which um, tobacco companies mobilized public relations in order to deny the links between uh, smoking smoking and cancer. And so this is shown in this uh, nice book by Naomi Oreskes, who talks about merchants of doubt. So professionals whose job it is to uh, if you like, undermine the credibility of science, undermine the credibility of scientists in order to prevent uh, pressure being applied for political activity. We saw a great deal of, of denial at work under the Trump administration in the US that successfully held up political action on, on climate change uh, for, for, for a substantial period of time. Uh, and that's sketched out in this um, color-coded diagram on the right here that uh, sketches out some of the ways in which denial worked to undermine arguments about, about the science. So whether it's an outright denial of the reality of climate change from, from, from Trump itself, um, mobilization of uncertainty, the strategic mobilization of ignorance as a way of preventing political pressure being applied, or to suggest that um, there are other priorities at stake. It's about jobs, it's about employment, it's about creating an alternative story to, to, to mobilize against uh, activities on, on climate change. But it's also worth saying that denial comes in much softer forms. Denial comes in the ways in which many of us live with a kind of cognitive dissonance. We know that climate change is happening. We know that there are very dark futures on the horizon, um, but we internalize that. We find ways of living with that. We feel that uh, we are unable to act. We're unable to change the status quo. We're caught within lifestyles or forms of employment, forms of infrastructure that make it very hard to, to act in that way. Uh, but we need to recognize denial as one very powerful and, and prevalent response to the scientific stories that we're told uh, on on an everyday on an everyday basis. So that would be the first uh, mode. The second mode, in some ways, the kind of extreme mode that goes in the other direction, um, is what we might describe as catastrophism. Uh, so the ways in which the diagnosis of the Anthropocene has uh, prompted a cultural response deeply concerned about the coming end of of, of civilization, how everything can collapse. And how this has prompted social theorists and others to begin to imagine post-apocalyptic models of society uh, in which society has to rebuild in the aftermath of often a very dramatic and sudden uh, collapse in, in, in civilization. Uh, sometimes that involves a, a retreat to an imagined past, a kind of primitivism, a paleo model in which we are you know, living in, in, in very much pre-modern society. Um, other forms of this are anticipated for us by the proliferation of, of science fiction. Uh, so there is a very rich new genre of science fiction, climate fiction it's called, that helps us imagine some of the ways in which the, 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 the world might end, if you like. Um, from Cormac McCarthy's Road, very high profile uh, 
North American writer that was that was made into a, a very dark uh, Hollywood film, uh, imagines a sort of post-climate uh, apocalyptic scenario. John Lanchester is, is a British writer, imagines um, the UK after sea level rise in which a huge wall has been built around the country. And the question there is all about immigration and the movement of people in and out of the country. Uh, Margaret Atwood, Canadian uh, writer, uh, talks a lot about the consequences of genetic modification and genetic engineering in a world that's been marked by collapse and, and catastrophe. Um, so unlike denialism, this model very much engages with thinking about the Anthropocene, but thinking about the Anthropocene as a radical break, as a radical juncture um, that can go in a number of different directions from very dark Mad Max-esque kind of catastrophe in which civilization comes to an end to some forms of climate fiction which are quite optimistic about the possibilities of reimagining society, reimagining civilization uh, in the aftermath of the of the disaster that is uh, that is coming to us in in the future. So that would be the, the second model. A third model um, comes from within uh, science and engineering, particularly from within a, a form of science engineering that is very optimistic about the possibilities of uh, contemporary science, contemporary technology, contemporary government to rise to the challenge of the Anthropocene uh, and to deliver what uh, a group of, of thinkers uh, from California, uh, the eco-modernist movement, describe as a good Anthropocene. So the idea sketched out here in the, in the eco-modernist manifesto is that in some ways humans can finally achieve their enlightenment destiny as the god species uh, in Mark Linus's terms. Mark Linus is a, is a popular nature writer in, in the UK, popular science writer, um, that wants to double down on the possibilities of science and technology to save us from ourselves. So they would take issue with catastrophism, the negativity of, of much contemporary environmentalism, and say, we just need one final leap, one great leap forward to harness the powers of science and technology to, to, to lift us out of the contemporary present and to, and to save us. Uh, from ourselves. And we could describe that as a very techno-optimist model um, that doesn't see any profound challenges uh, in the diagnosis of the Anthropocene to the status quo model. And then the fourth uh, dimension of my typology, um, actually just, just to give some illustrations of that um, techno-optimism in practice, we, we see this increasingly through uh, discussions, for example, about, about geoengineering. Uh, so the possibility that we could engineer the planetary system uh, in order to stay within planetary boundaries. Uh, so geoengineering comes in comes in different forms, um, either to try and minimize the amounts of energy coming into the atmosphere uh, from, uh, fr from the sun, uh, to store more carbon in the Earth system through tree planting, uh, through uh, various ways of drawing down um, carbon from the atmosphere through through capture and storage techniques, through fertilizing the ocean to, to, to sink more carbon in the ocean, or by changing the reflex the reflectivity of the planet itself to try and reflect more energy back into the into the atmosphere. So lots of proposals, lots of experiments that are being designed and, and imagined, but all of which um, are based, if you like, on this idea of, of the humans as the god species, this idea that we have within our power the ability to, to manage the planet as a, as a system. A slightly softer version of this comes in the form of what are called nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions you might have heard of are, if you like, a slightly greener, slightly more uh, environmentally sensitive model of uh, geoengineering, which are based on restoring ecological systems in ways that would both help biodiversity, uh, but also would help to, to tackle uh, climate change tackle uh, increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, certainly in, in the UK and in many parts of the world, there is this great emphasis now on, on tree planting, the idea that we could plant a huge uh, increased number of trees in order to draw carbon dioxide down out of the atmosphere, create new habitats for, for wildlife, uh, alongside managing peat and managing soils uh, as a way of rebalancing concentrations of, of carbon in the atmosphere by sinking it uh, back into into the soils. Um, so these are some of these are, are very local, very small scale, very practical measures to try and uh, tackle carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in, in the atmosphere that sit alongside some of these much grander schemes for geoengineering that was shown in the in the previous diagram. 
what often drops out of those techno optimistic models um, is a reflection on some of the politics around the Anthropocene. So if we circle back to the critique of uh, the Anthropocene coming from political scientists, that it doesn't recognize historical responsibilities for causing environmental damage, it doesn't recognize uh, contemporary inequalities in terms of exposure to environmental harm and contemporary exposure to the unequal benefits of, of environmental damage. Another approach is much more politically engaged, much more transformative, that sees um, adaptation to climate change, that sees um, the challenge of, of tackling the Anthropocene as a necessary political moment, as a moment in which we need to think seriously about capitalism, we need to think seriously about uh, global inequality, we need to think seriously about social justice, and think about how we could tackle both the environmental problems and the social problems together. So just to give one example, this is, a, this is a book that was published by my colleague Kate Rayworth at Oxford recently. Kate is an economist. And what she tries to do in this diagram, which is quite elaborate, and sorry if you're looking at this on a small screen, is try and take Rockstrom's idea of planetary boundaries, uh, which is a, a natural science concept, but to think about that also as being comprised of a set of social boundaries or social thresholds in which we need to think about not only tackling atmospheric concentrations of climate change. We also need to think about food security. We need to think about water. We need to think about access to housing. We need to think about gender equality and, and, and social equity, which is shown uh, in, the, in the green donut, if you like. So what she wants to allow us to visualize is a future in which we could live within a set of boundaries that are both codified by nature, if you like, by the planetary system, but are also marked by questions of social justice um, that would um, not be exceeded uh, or that we wouldn't drop below uh, in, in different ways. It's, it's a complicated model, but it's certainly one worth looking up if you're interested in how the Anthropocene might enable a more transformative vision of politics rather than the continuation of the status quo, which we get from some forms of, of more techno-optimist models. OK, and really just to conclude at that point, what I've suggested in this talk is the Anthropocene is a, is a very significant scientific moment. It's a very significant moment in terms of how Earth system science understands the planet as a, as a system, a system marked by thresholds and tipping points in which there is a, a great alarm that's been raised about the possibility of moving out of the Holocene, the contemporary epoch in which human civilization emerged, and tipping into the Anthropocene, in which the Anthropocene will be a much less pleasant, much less hospitable set of planetary conditions for human survival. This um, diagnosis of the Anthropocene uh, has created a term that's traveled widely and that has come to name a, a wider cultural zeitgeist, a wider cultural structure of feeling in society uh, based on a deep anxiety that many people around the world have about the relationships between ourselves and the planet, a, a pervasive ecological anxiety, if you like, that many of us feel. Uh, the Anthropocene has come to name that term and has been taken in different ways by different uh, thinkers, different practitioners. Um, it calls into question some profound ideas in Western thought about the relationship between people and nature. And it's also been a provocation for political theorists to think about responsibility, to think about social justice, to push back against a more technologically optimistic model that would say we just need more of the same to save us from ourselves, to think about how tackling environmental problems could also enable new ways of thinking about social relations, new ways of thinking about the economy, new ways of thinking about, about social justice. Uh, and I think I will, I will stop there. Thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, and uh, yep. I wish you all the best for this great workshop. There is a lot to discuss there, Jamie, uh, from your talk. And I, I want to, to start by asking the, the Anthropocene hypothesis that you, that you talk about. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how is this different from earlier models of environmentalism? So I guess one of the most striking things about the Anthropocene story is this idea of a radical break, a radical rupture between the past and the future. So a lot of environmentalism has often been concerned about local, small-scale impacts in particular places. We'd be concerned about 
this forest being cut down, about pollution in this river, uh, about growing amounts of air pollution in, in the city, what the Anthropocene does is, is join those all together into a, into a bigger planetary vision of a system that's on the threshold of shifting from one condition, the Holocene, into into the Anthropocene, um, and 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 in some ways a much much darker version of of of, of environmental harm, that the the places that we thought were disconnected from each other are all joined up, and that there is the possibility then of this radical um, move into into a future that's much less hospitable uh, for for human survival. And uh, and of course today a lot of our in in our audience we have architects mainly. So for the discussion of of architecture and urban planning, what would you say are the, are the implications? How what should architects and urban planners learn from this and and use in in their work? What do you think? It's a great question. I'm always very envious of of architects. I just sit here with a pen and paper and and you know write books, but you get to sit with pens and paper and you get to plan things and make things and 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 make practical differences in the world. And I, I mean, on one level, on a macro level, the idea of planetary boundaries gives us a set of thresholds to 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 think within. So to think about um, carbon dioxide, to think about the use of resources, to think about about the use of water. Um, provide some thresholds around which you know, we can think about design and think about, about limits to the, the visions of what, what we might want to work with. I guess more, more practically, um, there is this possibility of also thinking about building with nature, thinking about nature-based solutions as being central to design, if you like, both in terms of how what we build could help to tackle some of the problems associated with climate change, whether that's buildings that are net zero, if you like, that can you know not use um, more energy than um, than, than, they, than they store, um, but also beginning to think ecologically about how building, how planning, how infrastructure can create spaces for wildlife, how we could begin to think about bringing nature back into cities, about bringing nature back into uh, bits of infrastructure rather than that traditional modernist model, which is often, you know, nature's out there, people are in here, we don't need to worry about nature in the cities and in, in amongst our infrastructure, because there's lots of wild places in which nature is, is fine. If we think about the Anthropocene as, as describing a world that's fundamentally shaped by human activities, there's an obligation to think about creating spaces for wildlife right in the heart of the city, right in the heart of the places that we, we live and work. Uh, and there's all sorts of you know, great work that architects are doing in this, in this space already to begin to think about designing with nature um, and, and creating solutions alongside habitable places for, for people. And, and finally, Jamie, do you see the, um, the discussion about the Anthropocene, do you see it sort of growing within different communities in, in the academic world or in the professional world? Or uh, what, what do you think? Is it being discussed enough? I mean, I'm very close to the term, so I see it everywhere. And it's one of those things when you look for it, you, you see it everywhere. Uh, I, a lot will depend to a certain extent on how the Earth system science and the geological community deal with the Anthropocene hypothesis. So it's yet to be formally codified. Uh, it's, it's, it's still uh, up for discussion and, and there's a quite a, a slow process through which geology decides on whether or not to change uh, its, its history. I think the consensus at the moment seems to be that it's likely that they will change the terminology and that it will become part of the textbooks, it will be taught at schools, it will be taught at universities, and it will become a shorthand term to describe the present. Um, clearly, we, you know, we, we, we have great political momentum around climate change in, in many countries at the moment, um, and in some circles the Anthropocene has become a unifying term to gather uh, what can seem quite different discussions about biodiversity, about climate, about energy, uh, uh, about water. Um, so I'm I'm optimistic that it could work helpfully politically to to gather uh, contemporary concerns uh, t towards uh, tackling environmental problems. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Jamie Lorimer. Thank you.
Det är än så länge mest på universitet som ämnet antropocen diskuteras. I Sverige har Blekinge tekniska högskola som bland annat utbildar fysiska planerare nyligen börjat intressera sig för diskussionen om antropocen. Peter Schlüter är professor i fysisk planering med miljövetenskaplig inriktning på BTH och kommer nu den närmaste dryga timmen tillsammans med inbjudna gäster prata på temat A World of Limits. The topic of the Anthropocene is being discussed internationally, perhaps mostly in academic environments. This next hour, a bit more than an hour, will be led by Peter Schlüter who is Professor of Environmental Spatial Planning at Blekinge Technical University here in Sweden. Peter will make further introductions and also present his guests and experts who are here with him today. And with that, Peter, I hand over to you. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, well, uh, what will Anthropocene entail? Um, I would argue that the Anthropocene um, is going to actually be characterized as a world where we are facing limits, limits of various kinds. And the future has always been different, but the future in many respects will be very different in, uh, um, in the coming years. Um, in the sense that a lot of things that we've seen or regarded as constant will actually change. And the climate has been quasi constant uh, with, with a lot of variability, of course. And, and we're all realizing uh, that climate change is here and it's ongoing. Uh, and as climate changes, we will be faced, and we've seen it this summer, uh, with new challenges. And the challenges are partly an effect of how we actually do planning and building. Because planning and building, they are evolutionary practices. I mean, we are doing the things we are doing uh, because it has worked in the past. And as the climate future will be drastically different in some respects, um, what we are having, the building stocks and the planning practices we are working with, will actually be less fit for the coming future. However, it is not only um, a matter of changing climates. The Anthropocene entails that we are actually facing a number of different limits and we are unused as a society and as individuals actually to think in terms of limits. And this will be with regard to resource availability, natural resources, and it will also be with regard to sinks. The whole discussion about greenhouse gases is actually a discussion about the inability to pollute the atmosphere without limits. Similarly, we are running in some cases out of land. We are facing increased resource constraints. And the interesting thing is that this sustainability transition that we are facing will actually require a lot of increased resource use with regard to, in some cases, some fairly rare unlimited metals and stuff. So we will be moving towards a more circular world and we must improve circularity. So if we actually use a lot of resources, we need in the future actually to be able to um, reuse and repurpose stuff. And currently we have been very poor at closing the circles. And uh, if one look at resource availability for a lot of the, the metals and minerals that we are using, we can see that we are actually facing peak resources within a relatively limited time ahead of us. A lot of the technologies that we are uh, putting a lot of faith in and that are, will be needed uh, for this transition, uh, in many cases will require precious metals, rare earths, uh, and, and other resources that are increasingly constrained and that are also increasingly also facing geopolitical constraints. Uh, similarly, we can see, for example, in, the, in this field of food production, that we are also facing a coming phosphorus crunch. And phosphorus, as we all know, is an important um, 
uh, nutrient for all biological production. So uh, this whole situation of actually using resources more efficiently uh, will be what characterizes the future. And as a profession, we need to improve our handling of complexity and feedbacks. We will also have to be able to handle multiple objectives and not just optimize one factor. And we need to be improve our ability to handle changing context. Context is changing not only climate, but also resources. I would also add that we will need to be able to handle changing values. Values are changing in society, and that will have impact on future planning. And all of this has to go on under increasing biophysical constraints and growing uncertainty. And we have to actually manage this uh, transition if we are to improve our future sustainability. And with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Bertel Malmström from BTH, uh, who will speak about the limits to land availability. Hello, my name is Bertel Malmström, and I will speak to you about a very important limitation in today's world, which is limitation concerning land use. But the theme could also be agriculture versus urbanism. I will focus on the urban issue and the fact that a lot of agricultural land is today threatened because of urban expansion. And we are indeed talking about a global issue here. Uh, we have used the land very extensively in the 20th century and uh, for many multiple uses. For example, big housing areas, roads, industrial areas, railways, parking spaces, infrastructure, and so on. And uh, we have our, our cities have spread a lot because of this extensive land use. The areas uh, that are now urbanized are a lot bigger. And at the same time, we are about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. And uh, sometimes when you read about the world population, you get the impression that this is something that has happened. We had a large growth of population, but it is indeed still happening. So we may very well be 9 billion people in the middle of the century. Or some people even think that we will be 10 billion people quite soon. So this, of course, puts a lot of pressure on the agricultural land. We need to grow a lot of food in order to survive. And these two uh, facts in themselves could be very strong strongly indicating that we need to preserve agricultural land. But still you get the impression that a lot of people think that we can still go on expanding on agricultural land uh, when we grow, our cities grow. And we also have even bigger problems because the agricultural lands is also uh, threatened by degradation of the farmlands, which means that you cannot grow as much food as you used to do on the same land. And I will not go into that more specifically, but that is a big issue in many countries, for example, the United States. And added to that, we have, of course, climate change, which means that a lot of the lands will be either too dry or be flooded not, maybe not all the time, but occasionally. So we have multiple threats uh, to the agricultural lands globally at the same time as we need to uh, grow more food in order to survive and feed the world population. It's also important to remember 
uh, that in the especially the 20th century we uh, many of our projects our urban expansions have really been on cheap land and the cheap land was very often agricultural land and especially especially those housing areas that you see to the left here uh, one of the factors in the economy for making those areas was that you could buy cheap land and then uh, do quite cheap projects which of course meant that the houses and the apartments could be reasonably uh, priced so what it very 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 well may lead to to begin with is that we must do a lot of more expensive projects in the future and as we all know we are in there is a big demand for cheap housing especially apartment uh, blocks Uh, if we look at it historically for a short time, we can see that there is a very strong historical bond between uh, urbanism or maybe rather villages and agriculture. To start with, they were very good at finding the good, the good land to grow crops and also uh, putting their houses on the land that was not good for growing. That was very important um, factor when they choose where to live. But of course they needed the uh, real prerequisites for growing. And that was of course fertile lands and also fresh water. And for example, in the medieval times, there was a very strong connection between agriculture and settlements and uh, people were living in a kind of circular economy with local food production and local food markets. And as you see to the, on the picture to the left, which is Warwick yep. in England, you can see that the entire village was built upon this relation between the urban side and the, the landscape where you were growing things. And idea that was also- Okay, I wonder uh, if I was- Put to new- I'm... Uh, ways in in the garden city which i will come to a little later and also if you go even further back you we knew that for we know that for example in greece they put a lot of effort into finding the right locations for their settlements for example concerning fresh water and not to build on the agricultural lands so there is an historical bond and a pattern that is not used anymore, except, especially not in the rich world. So how, what can we do about it? How can we solve these problems with um, the divide between agriculture and urbanism, but also the fact that we are using too good land to build on? Well, one thing that is very often mentioned today, which is a la mode, you could say, is of course to make the cities themselves a lot denser. More high rise buildings, more dense blocks and so on. And this, and this is very often seen as some kind of ideal for urban planning in our days. And uh, I think there are big possibilities really to do dens densification, but the risk is that we are also creating lots of new problems such as too hard and unfriendly environments and also heat islands for example which uh, we will also talk more about later today so the risk is as as we as we solve one problem we create other problems that is maybe more difficult to solve really because heat islands for example in a very in a warmer climate could be very very difficult to handle Another way of thinking is what has also been thought of for at least the two last, last decades, and that is commuting. And to uh, even commute more than we do today. And we have already built a lot of this infrastructure, especially in the more urbanized areas in the world. And this means that we are not, uh, we are not living it's maybe just working there uh, normally 
And this is, for example, has been discussed a lot in Skåne. Region Skåne has used this as a strategy for the regional development. And then you have to think about more populated dense areas in relation to less populated and dense areas and that you have to have very efficient uh, traveling possibilities uh, to come between the, these different parts of the country. And of course, Skåne is very well uh, adapted for this already. And this is, of course, because we have this huge problem in Skåne with very good agricultural land that is, has been expanded on which the map down to the right from Region Skåne is showing. And this is some of the best uh, agricultural land in Europe, really, and the world. So it's a quite tragic development. And um, this could, of course, be a big problem if we keep on doing this. And if we do, as I have proposed, to really preserve the agricultural lands instead, and to say that they are dedicated for agricultural use, then this would mean that other parts would really have to expand. So if, for example, Malmö, Lund and Helsingborg, the three biggest cities in Skåne, all located to the west in Skåne, cannot really expand anymore, then other uh, small, today small communities must expand. And that's, of course, quite revolutionizing in the history of this part of Sweden. I mean, could places like Eslöv and Hör be uh, quite big cities in the future, as actually proposed by some of my students last year in a project? Um, we maybe have to think these kind of new thoughts about how our region is developed. And this is not just, uh, I take Skåne and Afro as an example since we are here, but this is really something that could be discussed globally, that you could uh, think this way more um, than we do today. Uh, we also have historical patterns that we could go back and study. We have the very famous concept, the Garden City by Ebenezer Howard, which had a quite ex uh, advanced thinking about the relation between town and country. He also discussed the term town country as something in, in between, between town and countryside. And uh, of course, we can also think about models to do these changes. Uh, a third possibility, which is quite a lot debated a lot today, and which is in, in interesting, I think, is what you call agricultural urbanism. You could call that a movement that tries to find different smart ways to establish smaller farming ventures using possibilities inside the cities. For example, uh, growing on roofs or parking spaces. And also, um, uh, it's very often discussed different kind of vertical uh, uh, systems for, for growing food. And of course, this is a possibility. And you must add that there could be big social benefits also from uh, such uh, ideas or such projects. And for example, in New York, I know that there is some uh, urban gardens that are very well used and a kind of mix melting pots for different people and uh, giving these people a, an opportunity to come out and to do positive things together with other people. So there are also social side of this that's very interesting. So these are two words you can uh, use or two expressions, agricultural urbanism and uh, urban gardening, if you want to study this more. But having said that, there is still, uh, of course, the smartest thing is maybe not to be so smart, but to really try to preserve the really fertile agricultural land for agriculture. And it's uh, probably something we, we need to do and um, to educate people also about these issues more than we have done in the years before. And uh, not only planners and architects, but also uh, real estate developers, contractors and so on. 
uh, and and people that are working in um, in authorities to really know how important agricultural land is and that we should go really far to try to avoid building on that land and instead uh, densify or, or create regional patterns for uh, commuting and so on and that this should be really a, a guiding star for the planning in the future to think about that and to have a, a kind of knowledge about these issues. On the other hand, you could very well say also that modern city planning has created, you know, thousands of possibilities really for a greener land use. So you don't have to do either or maybe, but you could have different kind of combinations of preservation, maintaining agricultural land on one hand, and uh, also reusing um, restructuring cities for uh, both to become greener and to have the social advantages I was discussing and to actually grow food in parts of the cities. So this is uh, my conclusion about this very delicate issue. Thank you very much. So many, many of these solutions for, for handling these sustainability challenges and not the least climate change will require nature-based solutions in city planning. And, and there's always a challenge actually to get green structures and biodiversity into the urban environment. And it's my pleasure now to present Annika Kruse, who has been working at the municipality in Malmö the Institute of Sustainable, Sustainable Urban Development and the region with the issue of how actually to introduce and get more green infrastructure into our cities and, and working with the design criteria to achieve this. Annika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Annika Kruse. I am honored uh, to be given this opportunity to talk to you about uh, design criteria for uh, green infrastructure and to be more precise, urban green infrastructure. Jag vet inte hur jag, hur jag byter bild. Okej, okay, men den syns inte där framför mig. Tack. Den är inte den som syns. Precis, men jag är på nästa. Wrong priorities and failure to adopt scientific knowledge has led us to Anthropocene, a world threatened by a climate crisis and biodiversity crisis. We know that we can't go on with business as usual. We need a paradigm shift. In this light, the way we design and manage green infrastructure must be redefined. We must acknowledge that the natural ecosystems are invaluable and we need to realize human civilization's total dependence on nature and green infrastructure. Um, briefly about me, I have a PhD in plant ecology and some 20 years experience in the field of sustainable urban development. Um, although I wish uh, that our society would honor nature and ecosystems in their own right, I think still we need the argumentation of ecosystem services. On a local urban scale, green infrastructure can decrease the urban heat island effects during heat waves and offer cool refuges for citizens. Uh, it can help protect cities from local flooding. It can offer space for many activities during pandemics and for recreation during more normal times. Green infrastructure can offer space for other species as well, for us to enjoy and learn about. Often, the same area can deliver several uh, ecosystem services, thereby being multifunctional. 
I think most of us know all this by now, but how can we make change happen? Before we start talking about uh, design criteria, we must consider uh, the planning process. When, in the planning process for a new development or a redevelopment, um, green infrastructure and topography have to be considered first thing. Wait. When there are conflicting goals, we need to let nature weigh much heavier than we do today. We need to use the right competence to get the right knowledge on the green infrastructure and its values. We need to map existing values of the green infrastructure, but also uh, the potential values and uh, the specific needs in the area. For example, stormwater management, outdoor offices, urban gardening. Every square meter counts. When the function of a surface does not require sealing, it should be left green or blue, no matter how small it is. And here is an example um, of a simple mapping of existing values in a planning process for redevelopment of a former hospital area into a housing area. Simply by visiting the area with specialists, we mapped uh, biodiversity, pollination, temperature regulation, recreation, health and culture, stormwater management, noise reduction. The same method could be used for mapping potentials and needs we used categories from the care of city. There are several tools available for mapping now. For instance, the Boverket has developed the tool Esther. Many of the ecosystems can be mapped by using experts, but when it comes to culture values, uh, the users and the potential future users have to be uh, involved in the process. Old habit and preferences, both with professional and the public, lead to unsustainable design, like black roofs and mowed lawns. But with increased knowledge, that can be changed. The natural areas can also be used for education. Will urban children know which flowers and trees are native, for instance? Management is crucial. We cannot let mowed lawns be the role model for green infrastructure. Their maintenance use enormous amounts of energy and cause a lot of unhealthy noise. If we choose meadows instead, they will be cut once or twice a year and be home for many species. Urban forests need even less management. The pictures show a couple of good examples. A rooftop meadow in the western harbour Malmö, where even a bumblebee queen chose to build her winter's nest and an urban meadow in Augustenborg, Malmö. A starting point for designing green infrastructure with a high biodiversity uh, is always the existing values, potentials and surroundings. The role, models, the role model is always natural ecosystems. The goal is not to create as many vegetation types as possible, but rather aim for large areas of the same type with minor var variation within them. Mostly regional plants should be used. Management, again, is crucial. Natural ecosystems develop over time. Management should therefore aim towards a specific goal uh, with a higher degree of ecolo ecological knowledge. Also, on smaller areas, uh, the role model is natural ecosystems. Uh, but the smaller the scales, uh, the harder it is to establish long-term uh, healthy ecosystem. It takes a lot of knowledge on substrate, for instance. Substrate is soil. Plants, soil and other conditions like light and humidity must make a perfect match. The picture shows an example of a house yard in Western Harbour, Malmö, uh, forest being the role model. The green roofs are biodiversity roofs, not common sedum roofs. 
walls will be covered with climbing plants. There are bird boxes and bat boxes and dead wood. You can see on the picture uh, that the green space covers the whole area uh, and that the garbage house and the walkways have been placed within the green area, not using any unnecessary space. The green should come first and every square meter counts. Thank you. What is the most important factors to actually achieve more green space? Well, um, and if, um, experience that we made during a long and large project in Malmö was that uh, for, for success we, we needed to gather all the expertise around the same table, all kinds of experts like ecologists, architects, landscape architects, developers, uh, economists and, and uh, managers. Um, Maintain, maintenance, uh, for instance, all, all around the same table. And not only once, we need to discuss and learn from each other. And then we can uh, make these really successful projects. And I assume you have to do that early in the planning process as well. Of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Anne. Thank you. So, uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Stoltz, a researcher from the Swedish Agricultural University and uh, Landscape Planning. Uh, and um, Jonathan has worked a lot with green infrastructure, in particular from a perspective of its impact on health and well-being uh, for the citizens in uh, urban areas. And with that, Jonathan, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. So, yes, green infrastructures and well-being. Um, green infrastructures is uh, more or less, we can think of it as anything that is green and uh, that is somehow uh, strategically managed by people. Um, and of course, as we just heard, um, uh, there are many ways, many different cultural uh, ec and uh, regulating and provisioning ecosystem services that are provided by green infrastructures. Um, I'm mostly focusing on cultural ecosystem services. And the main pathways that green infrastructures uh, impact health and well-being uh, within those ecosystem services are uh, through restoration and installation. And restoration is more or less the capacity of green infrastructures to restore um, uh, stress and attention fatigue and different capacities. With installation, we mean cap the capacity to uh, support uh, the growing of capacities, um, such as to uh, the provisioning the capacity of um, uh, areas for physical activity and so on. Mitigating services has more to do with regulating ecosystem services, such as cleaning the air and uh, water, etc. Um, yes. Um, and when we focus on the um, cultural services, we have identified in the research uh, three main factors and distance from dwelling, the size of the green area, and also the perceived qualities of the green area what I refer to as aesthetics. And uh, if we start with those two, the distance from dwelling and the size, we can see something more or less um, like this. Uh, it seems meaningful to um, categorize green areas according to size. And the different sized green areas uh, should be uh, provided at different distances. So the larger green areas are suggested to be um, the recreational areas can be five kilometers away from the home and the smaller green areas should be at, at the maximum 300 meters, but of course it's preferably less than that. Uh, and all this has been shown to impact such uh, health and well-being aspects such as um, physical activity, which in uh, also affects heart disease and so on, stress. And there is uh, quite a lot of um, support for this in the research. And 
if we look at the perceived qualities, which is what I've been looking most of in my research, um, we have developed a model based on eight key factors. And uh, one factor that is the, capa the capacities to support the natural quality of the green area. Opposed to this, we can see a cultural quality. So we can think of it something like this. Uh, a natural quality seems uh, self-made, if you will, and a cultural cultivated quality is the opposite. It's a very heavily managed green area, but both of these are equally important. We also have the, those two factors, a diverse quality, which is the capacity to, um, uh, to support a, a, a perception of diversity in the green area. Um, and opposed to this is a cohesive quality, which is um, a quality that is more has to do with the capacity to support a, uh, uh, an experience of a coherent whole, a world in itself. Um, we also have a sheltered quality and an open quality that are opposed to each other. A sheltered quality provides shelter and can be supported in a smaller space. Uh, an open quality um, is uh, the opposite of this. Often connected with cut loans and such. Um, finally, we have um, mm, uh, a serene quality that is opposed to a social quality. So we can think of the serene quality is, is, a, is a place uh, void of people with more or less no people, no disturbances. And the social quality is a place uh, full of people and uh, happy events and so on. And all those qualities are important. And we can think of them as different colors. Uh, rather than talking about good and bad here, we can see them as different colors that support different needs uh, in the population and also for different individuals. Maybe the same individual in, in different times of the day even. Um, and an important thing here is that this is a human-centered model. So when I say, when I, speak of a natural quality is from the perspective of a human, not in a, an absolute way or anything. Um, and this gives us this model, which supports both, both uh, restorative pathways and instorative pathways. I, I both restorative qualities that help you restore the stress levels and more stimulating qualities. Um, we can see also here that we have a um, difference in terms of which space these qualities occupy normally. So the natural, serene, cohesive, and open qualities, they tend to demand more space, whereas the shelter, diverse social and cultural qualities can be um, achieved more easily in denser planning uh, strategies. And this, of course, has uh, consequences in terms when we think of um, um, uh, densification and so on, that you often hear that you can support high quality green spaces in smaller areas, but for some qualities it seems very difficult because they actually demand more space to be realized. And finally, if we, want, if we try to combine, this is a work in progress where we try to combine uh, the different distances with the different qualities. So to, to make um, uh, analysis of the, um, of the living environment, and then you can divide the, the, the distance from the dwelling in, in different zones. Uh, and then we could analyze the support. And this is just the hypothetical uh, images where you can see the different qualities are supported in a different, to a different degree in different zones from the building. So this, for instance, uh, here we can see that there is a large natural, high natural qualities more far away from the building and also the social quality seems to be stronger, more far away from, from the building here. Whereas uh, this, for instance, is um, more close to the social qualities and the nature area is more far away. And this person seems to live in a forest or something. So, and this is a work in progress. So um, I think that's it. Thank you. Jonathan, um, this is very interesting results and, and work you, you have been engaged in for a long time now. Yeah. But um, uh, do, do you have the feeling that these insights have really been passed on to the actual planners uh, and people responsible for parks and, and green structures in the cities? Uh, I think that's what we're doing right now. 
this work that I just uh, mentioned in the end is uh, like a work in progress, as I said, but the interest is very big uh, among different actors. And uh, we will try to, what often is required is more um, mm, quantified measures. Mm. And we work with qualities, perceived qualities. So it's a, the, the, the difficulty, the main difficulty is to quantify and specify how to achieve those perceived qualities mm. through more uh, specific uh, yeah, measures. And then, of course, it's it's difficult to des- decide who is your end user. I mean, is it is it the planner or the gar- those responsible for the the parks and gardens? Because in the end, of course, it is the population in the exactly. urban areas that are the final end users and beneficiaries of, of this type of work. True. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Karin Nilsson, who is a climatologist researcher from Lund University uh, and who has also worked a lot as a civil servant uh, with the Swedish uh, Meteorological Institute uh, in outreach towards municipalities and regions actually to inform and uh, pass pass around relevant or planning relevant uh, climatological information, not the least with regard to climate change. So it will be very interesting to hear what you have to say now about um, how to handle climate change and climate extremes in cities. And I think this ties very well into the discussion of green infrastructure and perhaps also can provide a little bit of a critical take on, the, I would say, the current fad of uncritically assuming that densification in all situations is something beneficial. Thank you so much. And thank you. Just like uh, Peter said, my name is Karin Nilsson. And um, I work at the moment at the Central Cooperation Office at Lund University with strategic collaboration. But I do have a strong background in climatology, uh, communicating climate science to a lot of different end users. So um, what I want to talk to you today about is that we are facing a lot of challenges and I hope to be able to give you some examples of implemented adaptation measures that are already in place. And I also would like to inspire you a bit. But before that, we need to see what's on the table. Well, to set the mode, how should we construct our new buildings and where? Who should build them and how should they look like? Dams, infrastructure, how can we prevent damage? And how can we adapt the already existing society to climate change? Well, I I see it a little bit like this. You have heard a lot about already about transformation in society. So how do we do that sustainably? And how do we um, do this in balance with everything else that we have in society? This is where we need all of you architects to actually help us think out of the box uh, to be able to create this kind of smart, functional, secure and sustainable buildings, areas and societies for the future. So first, I want to set the tone of what do we mean by adaptation. This is the definition that is often used. Uh, Adaptation is the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate change and its effects. It refers to the changes in processes and practices and structures. And it is there to moderate potential damage and also to benefit from the opportunities associated with climate change. So how can this be done? Well, you've already heard uh, earlier speakers mentioning it. We need to collaborate. We need to collaborate across sectors and across professions. Uh, We need strategies and we need things on the table, such as solutions, ideas. And um, since I talked about that adaptation is a process, there are some nice websites that I would like you to explore further when you when you have the time and here you see first the Swedish website of adaptation measures and then the United Nations uh, FCCC one and also to the right you have um, the um, European Environmental Agency Climate Adapt where you have a lot of cases and interesting things going on. But to start with some examples I will start from a book that we gathered together in uh, 2013. It's called the Adaptation Inspiration Book. It was a big EU project where we were uh, uh, 23 countries gathering 22 
different implemented cases that you can actually touch and see and talk to. There was a contact person. And I will show you two of the examples from this book. Uh, we will start with a small city of, uh, in Belgium called Kröbeke. Uh, and what they did was they had problems when the flooding was coming, uh, when you have high tide together with a storm. Um, the water came up the river and basically flooded the village. So what they did, they actually created more um, land around Kröbeke by, by doing tunnels in the inlet and, and then forcing this water to go out. And they created something like 150 hectares of, of new areas for bird land and then another 300 hectares of, of plains. And that was really interesting also to study how did these areas uh, regenerate after this construction. Another small but interesting example is also the little city of Nijmegen in, in Netherlands. Uh, they, it's a very attractive city for people who want to shop from both Germany and Netherlands. So they wanted to make it nicer, the climate. It was a lot of stone buildings. So what they did was what you have heard about before as well. They started to um, decide that on five streets we will put up climbing rails for, for greenery. And what you see here on the picture is basically the, the main um, city hall where they made a whole garden across up on the building. Uh, but now we have talked about a flooding and, and heat protection. And here we have another example talking about the sea level rise. Um, it's a very interesting example of how you can work. And it was early work that was done by Hamburger, uh, Hamburg, this Hamburg city, Hafen city, uh, where they already, after the wall came down in the 90s, started to think, how can we make this area more attractive to people? Uh, and, and what they did then was they, they uh, put down that they wanted to transform it in a way so, so it was working both with old and new buildings and with the water, but also that the water could rise up. So the first floor is actually being able to be flooded. Do go and visit there if you have the chance. It's really nice to take a boat cruise around there. We have already heard a lot of speakers mentioning nature-based solutions. And right now, I just want to point you to a very interesting report that just came out by the uh, European Environmental Agency this summer. And together with that one, there is a website called opla.eu, where they have gathered almost over 300 examples of nature-based solutions in, that are implemented already around. And one of these examples on opla.eu is the example of Copenhagen, and it's actually an older example. You might remember that in 2011, we had an extreme rainfall. It was pouring down with rain, 150 millimeters in, in um, roughly two hours, and you had Copenhagen standing roughly under one meter of water. And the politicians of Copenhagen didn't want to have that happening again. So what they did was they asked, can you give us a, a, a cloudburst management plan in three months? Now, here is an example of how, um, um, really interesting stuff going on. Lykke Leonardsen, who is uh, on the picture here, uh, has a very nice talk on YouTube that I recommend, uh, where she talks about the whole process of this. And just to show you a few things, what she did together with all of her colleagues at the municipality was that they looked at how do we make the water not coming from the, uh, into the buildings, but how do we drain it? into areas where we can actually um, manage it so we can take control over these uh, very uh, strong rain, heavy rainfalls that come. So what they did was they wanted to keep the water um, staying uphill quite for a long time. So they made retention areas. They used football fields and parks, for example. And then they could direct the, the water down on retention streets, small water outlets, and then also on uh, what they call uh, big um, uh, water boulevards, where, where they actually allowed a lot of the water to come. And they did this together with the people, the citizens of Copenhagen. They said, when we are going to rebuild your street now, what would you like it to look at? We have the opportunity now to make it nice. So people could make suggestions for meeting places and open spaces, parks, etc., and was very much part of this. And they made what they called uh, climate neighborhoods. Now, 
There is a lot of other projects going around in Europe, and some of the outputs of these can also be interesting to look at for architects. Uh, here is just one example of many of those, Climate Fit City, where they have uh, constructed a lot of different uh, smart solutions and services. This one, for example, has made uh, refinement to the models that calculate how much energy a building uses. So they have actually started to use updated climatological information in there and not just the, the, the normal uh, climate information that is around from outside the city. So what will our cities look like in the future? Um, this is just one example here that maybe we need to start looking south. We have a lot of uh, knowledgeable people uh, in the south who have long experience with heat, for example, and flooding. And this is just a hotel in, in Lisboa where totally covered. However, if you ask fire departments, they don't totally like this coverage. So how do we, how do we make these different um, things uh, work together and be safe and secure for us? Another example, uh, images from um, Toulouse in south of France, where you see that you totally need this canopy to be able to, to sell your fruit along the street when it's 38 degrees outside. But they also take care of the old um, uh, trees. Uh, you see the little tree here to the left that's been standing there longer than the buildings, which is very interesting. They try to, to work with that. And also in the parks, you have roads where you, where you are covered where you walk in the summer and roads which are uncovered where you can walk in the nice sun in the winter. Winter, we mustn't forget that we Sweden still will have strong winters or we will have winters where there will happen things like storms, like Gudrun that we had 2005, and we might end up with electricity failure. How do we also take height for that so we are not standing there with being without electricity for, for three, four weeks, but still have safe and secure and adapted uh, to the climate buildings around us? And how do we make it not only work in the cities, but also in the countryside and in the open fields? Well, just to finish off, I will show you a building that I haven't seen yet. I've only seen it on TV that I find extremely interesting, having a background in wind. And that is the Marina One, Singapore, uh, where they have actually created a building where they use um, the design to create a flow of, of uh, wind through the building to make the climate much nicer inside for the people who come and visit, together with green, together with waterfalls. So, to summarize, um, we really need you all and your thinking, thinking out of the box to make a secure society for the future. And I so much look forward to see all these new ideas springing out of this uh, summer where we've had a lot of things happening around in the world. And I hope that you all want to be part of creating the new and the transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karin. Uh, quick question. I mean, you, you worked as, as a um, climate communicator, uh, and uh, one gets sometimes the feeling that um, it's hard to get pass these ideas along until you've had the catastrophe. I mean, nothing happened in Copenhagen really before they had this flooding. And, and you've been working as a communicator. I mean, how do you communicate uh, the things that hasn't happened? that may happen and that where both the consequences may be costly, but also the action, the mitigating action, so to speak, or that options may in themselves be pretty costly. Yeah. That, that is a really interesting question. And I think many people who are dealing with this are thinking about it. I, I strongly believe in continuing to communicate these things and uh, work with the ones who get it first, and then others will follow. Uh, but it is an urgency now, so we need to step up the game. I don't believe in threatening people to, to act, but we are at the point where we need to encourage people to bring everyone around the table to act together, because this is not a one-man's job either. It's, yeah. it's really a collective work. So, yeah. And to pass along the good examples. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you very much, Karin. And... Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Kristina Skarvik, who is a building antiquarian uh, who has a long experience of working and repurposing buildings and, and finding use for them. And as I said in my introduction, um, handling these sustainability challenges 
in the Anthropocene and in, and in a world of limits uh, will also entail that we have to work within those limits. And that is, of course, things like emission of greenhouse gases. That is the mitigation thing. But it's also, of course, the whole issue of actually being more resource efficient. Um, and we all know that the building and construction sector is actually one of the major emitters. So actually to handle these challenges in the future uh, will require us, I would say, increasingly to be able to repurpose and reuse buildings and structures. And with that, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I work as a consultant um, and the question of keeping things or throwing them, repurposing, reusing, um, is always a question on the table. Um, and it's been like that throughout the ages, I'd say. Um, so um, let's take a bit of a practical look. What did people do centuries ago when it came to these matters? Did it change the picture? No. Aha, thank you. <laughs> um, so, what were the keepers of old ages? And what were the goners? What did people keep in their buildings when they restored them? And what did they decide to throw away or repurpose? Uh, let's take a look at this building. This is uh, Rosendal, a castle just outside of Helsingborg. And uh, we've been working there with restorations for the past six years now. Um, and it was built in 1615 by uh, Anders Bille. He was uh, one of the king's best friends. And um, so this was a really huge manor in, in its days. And if we look at the foundation pieces here, by, uh, made of stone, these were actually repurposed. They've been somewhere else before. Uh, we don't know in what building, uh, but they're quite heavy. So I reckon it should come from somewhere quite nearby. Perhaps a monastery, perhaps another mansion, who knows? Uh, this lovely house is uh, situated in the park, just close to the castle. And uh, this was actually there when the castle started being built in 1615. Uh, so it was a lovely dwelling at the time. But Anders Billet changed all that. He made it into a storage house instead. Uh, so the only things he kept were the brick walls. This is a strange goner. <laughs> uh, this is um, from 1615 as well. Uh, it's actually a wooden barrel filled with lime uh, used for mortar. And um, nobody was bothered to, to remove it when uh, they wasn't going to use the lime anymore when the building was finished. So they just left it there. And it eventually was covered with dirt and became part of a cobbled floor. And when we excavated it, we could actually still use the lime, which we did. Um, um, timber houses, um, they were hardly ever reused. Um, always preferred to, to uh, replace them with brick buildings. Uh, and in 1750, um, this castle underwent a major restoration. And uh, as you can see, the red um, was um, where you approach the castle from the beginning. And the blue uh, was what they did in 1750 when they wanted a central perspective for the landscape instead. Um, they also used um, the central perspective to change all the floor plans in the buildings. Um, they changed the complete layout of the castle uh, com completed it, and uh, also they took away all the sculptures that used to be uh, in the, on the roof exterior. So they changed a lot of things, both landscape buildings and interiors. They also kept some things, um, for example, the windows. Um, that was a huge investment, so uh, instead they rebuilt the ones they had changed them so that they could become more stylish and also allowed um, more modern and bigger window panes. 
another thing they reused was actually wallpaper um, made from textile linen. And uh, they were taken down, cut to pieces, sewn back together, turned around and reused uh, in a different room. This is the main entrance. It was uh, put there in the 1750s, but uh, it's uh, completely made out of pieces of old Renaissance stone taken from somewhere else within the castle. And on the stone's back sides, you could see uh, the Renaissance carvings. In the 19th century, uh, these uh, lovely tiled stoves, um, they, uh, they just came out of style. But since there was such a huge investment and since they were so much put to use, uh, they had to keep them, even though they sort of ruined the interior. But if they couldn't change the stoves, then they would, would change everything else. Uh, like in this room, uh, in the 1880s, someone uh, thought it was a really good idea to take away that lovely Rococo pattern with blue, pink and mahogany and instead paint it with a mustardy yellow oil paint. And it, it did look quite horrible, actually. And this is a lovely thing uh, we found in the attic. Um, it is a piece of leather, gilded or silver plated. Um, and um, it was frequently used uh, in the interiors from the Renaissance and through the Baroque. But then in the uh, late 19th century, uh, they didn't want any of that, so they just threw it out. But please note the lovely tulip uh, in the middle. It's a Turkish tulip. And these were probably imports uh, in the early 17th century by Anders Bille, because he went to Holland, where tulips were just about to become famous and uh, desirable. Uh, and he went there to study the art of war. And his cousin, um, the sister of Tycho Brahe, she was actually the first one to import tulip bulbs to Scandinavia. Uh, in the 20th century, um, strangely enough, um, people reused every material they could in this particular place. And uh, this timber-framed wall here looks very old, but it was actually made in the 1940s. Um, everything was reused old wood beams and uh, bricks from the Renaissance. Everything was kept and reused. Uh, the same with every door, every door in the interiors. This floor looks really old, but it's also from uh, the 1960s, just made of reused stone. And this uh, magnificent coat of armor was found uh, in the kitchen just near the stove. Uh, and the oven, and it was put upside down and used as a piece of flooring. So we were quite lucky to find it. This wonderful ceiling um, was treated pretty badly uh, in the 20th century. Um, it was completely covered with masonite, so you couldn't see it. And uh, I suppose it was because of energy demands. Uh, a lot of the rooms were made a lot smaller ceilings were coming down and walls were, were moved, so a lot more smaller spacious, spaces. So the grandiosity of the place, well, it, it was pretty bad, badly hurt in the nine, uh, 20th century. Uh, and also the moat that uh, used to surround the whole castle uh, was in to about 50% filled with garbage and dirt and soil. A uh, strange thing, <laughs> I think, because it's a lovely feature, isn't it? Um, so uh, we've actually restored it now, so, and it looks great again. Now, all these practical things, there's a pattern to it, of course. And I think these drivers are occurring throughout the ages. And um, the question is, are we very different today? No, I don't think so at all. These are exactly the same factors that we handle every time we have a meeting, every time. And everyone has different agendas. Thank you. So uh, based on your experience, and you, you've worked uh, several years uh, in, in the municipalities as well on, mm. on, on, on these issues, 
what are the factors that you need to take into account if you are going to facilitate reuse and repurposing of buildings um, as a planning process? Yeah, I think it is that people will be people, no matter what. I mean, planning and uh, architecture are of evolutionary practices, like you said, but, uh, but I think the drivers are still the same. People will be people. And I think we need to look to the complexity of these drivers to, to push people to actually make a change. Because if they don't see a reason for doing it, a reason that apl applies to themselves, then it's not going to happen. <laughs> and that, of course, applies also to, to building owners and, and uh, businesses as well. Of Absolutely. Course. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. And um, summing up, uh, what have we really seen here today? I think, I think there's a couple of things that we've highlighted. And one of the things is actually that we need uh, to think and handle many different aspects at the same time. We have to embrace complexity and realize that we cannot single-mindedly focus only on stormwater mitigation or improved energy efficiency. We have to handle many aspects at the same time. And it's not either or, it's in most situations both and. Uh, and I think this is particularly true if we look at, at the somewhat of a, a dogma that it's good from a sustainability perspective to, dens to densify cities. To some extent, that is, I would say, a trope taken from North America, where cities and suburbia is much more car-based than in Sweden or Europe. And quite clearly, if we're going to take into account biodiversity, our ability to handle climate change, both climate extremes and, and precipitation extremes, uh, we need to think about green structures in new and innovative ways. Uh, and in the same manner, we need to, from a human health perspective and from a cultural heritage perspective, think about how we actually handle the urban fabric in a wise manner in the future. And I would say, not the least, we probably need to be more considerate about how to, we, how to repurpose and reuse a lot of our building structures. That is, so to speak, um, important from an energy efficiency point of view, from a life cycle point of view, but also from a mitigation point of view when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas footprints and so on. And if there's any take-home message, I would say, from uh, today's presentation, it is that we... We need to think a little bit more about that we are actually increasingly going to operate in a world of limits. And the limits will be both with regard to sinks, the atmosphere's ability to handle emissions, uh, coastal waters and inland waters' ability to handle pollution and nutrients. It will also cover things like actually what is a long-term wise use of land. And a long-term wise use of land also have to take into account what is happening in the countryside. If we're going to achieve sustainability in our urban areas, that will, to a large extent, be dependent on um, increasing functional ties between the countryside and the urban areas. We will be dependent on, let's say, biomass and bioenergy. We will have a more bio-based economy in the future if we're going to decarbonize ourselves. So handling complexity, and I would say in the short term, actually think a little bit more about the urban green infrastructures and how that can help us handling the ongoing and increasing climate change challenge will be important for the future for planners and architects. Thank you very much. you to your guest speakers today. Stort tack! This morning we are focusing on the Anthropocene, the era when human activity is affecting the planet's entire geological systems. We will now switch over to, to Swedish briefly before our next speaker on this topic. 
Den här förmiddagen diskuterar vi den antropocena tidsåldern. Jag hoppas att ni har börjat få en uppfattning om vad antropocen är och vi ska fortsätta att fördjupa oss ytterligare. Innan vi fortsätter så vill jag berätta att delar av inredningen här i studion står två av våra sponsorer för. Amorim Kåk Flooring tillverkar golv och andra byggmaterial i kork och vi ser exempel på deras material på väggen här i studion. Och Nola är producent av de stolar vi har möblerat med. Och nu har jag med mig här i studion Åsa Harems, inredningsarkitekt på White. Åsa, du är här i egenskap av att du är ordförande i Sveriges arkitekters akademi för inredningsarkitektur. Och ni i akademin har bjudit in nästa föreläsare. Men för det första, vad är det med antropocen som du och ni i akademin tycker är intressant? Ja, det är väl så att när vi pratar om de här otroligt stora frågorna som påverkar oss alla så tror vi att vi behöver se lite bortom våra olika professioner. Att vi behöver mycket mer tänka tillsammans. För att vi gemensamt ska kunna skapa och forma den framtid, möjliga framtid som vi vill ha här på vår planet. Så därför så tänker vi att vi behöver uppmärksamma oss på att allt vi egentligen gör i våra professioner. Jag pratar inte bara om inredningsarkitekter men det är ju med och forma den, vår gemensamma framtid. Därför är det så otroligt viktigt. Och det är också så att vi alla förstår att detta kan vi ju inte börja med imorgon utan det handlar ju verkligen om nu, nu, nu för att vi ska, ja, vi ska, det ska gå så bra. Eller Exakt, några. vi kan ah. inte vänta helt enkelt. Vi kan inte vänta. Nej. Eh, och då har ni bjudit in en föreläsare nu och vem är det vi ska lyssna på? Jag tänker att du får berätta vem det är och sen får du även introducera er gäst. Ja, jo men vi har bjudit in Sverker Sörlin som vi tycker är en väldigt intressant talare och som har väldigt spännande infallsvinklar eh, och det är väl också så att vi tänker att vi kanske alla behöver en liten spark i baken eller åtminstone att vi får någonting som sätter igång lite mer tankeverksamhet i våra hjärnor. Eh, så och Sverker är med oss på länk idag eh, men innan vi släpper in dig Sverker så tänker jag bara ge en liten kort introduktion. Och Sverker Sörlin är idéhistoriker, professor i miljöhistoria, författare och essayist, kritiker, ledamot av Klimatpolitiska rådet och tidigare ledamot av Stadsmiljörådet. Och Sverker skrev 2017 en bok om antropocen och arbetar dagligen med frågor frågor om hur ett mer hållbart samhälle kan åstadkommas. Så vi är väldigt, väldigt glada att Sverker, att du vill vara med oss idag. Så då säger jag välkommen Sverker. Och då säger jag tack och hoppas att jag hörs där. När ni, där ni sitter. Jag tror att min, poäng, min uppgift nu är att byta till engelska, så då, så då gör jag det. I will now switch to English, um, because there might be people here tuning in who, who are uh, not uh, Swedish speaking. And um, uh, those of you who understand Swedish heard a little bit about me. I can just repeat that I'm a professor of environmental history at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, and basically an historian, trained as an historian of ideas. Uh, but I work very much also with contemporary challenges like the climate issue. I'm a member of the Swedish Climate Policy Council, um, charged with evaluating the work of the government actually to reach the Swedish um, in, um, climate targets, net, net, zero, net zero emissions by 2045. Um, uh, and I'm also an author and you will see some of my books later on in this talk. Uh, my, um, that's not me on that picture, by the way. It's it's uh, it's like a cover image that I use from a project we ran in my unit at the, at KTH uh, some years ago on waste in Naples, actually, which is not a very easy thing, as you might imagine. 
Um, I will actually uh, talk to you uh, in the beginning here from a manuscript or a sort of a, an organized line of of writing and thought, uh, but then I will sort of gradually move into more of, of an open uh, presentation mode. Um, so everything has a design, as we know, uh, and many of you are designers in in various ways, and and. Um, now that is, I think, an important point for me for this talk. And in Western uh, culture, uh, most people thought and still do that the great designer, actually the greatest designer, was God. What humans added was only a tiny bit, a kind of a final touch on God's creation. Now, this idea was often elevated into a very lofty language. Humans could take creation further perhaps here and there fulfill it. And in fact, it can be read in Genesis that humans should, as we, as it says in the Swedish Bible, bruka och bevara, use and preserve creation, if you use today's English. But, but many theologians and thinkers over the years advanced the idea that humans could improve on creation and that it was a divine mission to actually take up where God has left us and improve and perfect the world. Uh, so um, we are, in a sense, in, you could say, a Lutheran part of the world, aren't we, when we are in Malmö or in Sweden? And it may be useful to recall Luther's words on this, and I think these are just uh, quite wonderful words. He pictured us in a workshop where we are surrounded by our tools, uh, and they can all speak. Uh, the, the tools call on us, Luther says. They whisper and shout, use me, use me. The thimble, finger, bori, and the hammer or the needle uh, and the plane, hyvel uh, in Swedish. The, these these uh, tools all say, come and use me to perfect the world. So that's kind of an image that... Um, that Luther um, used. So what we hear in our workshops, and of course, any kind, this could be any kind of workshop, is the voice of God. And we hear it also from inside our hearts and souls. We say, uh, when we hear this voice, we say, yes, yes, I hear you. I will use you. So, um, Luther linked this idea about work, because this is actually about work, isn't it? He linked this very closely to the profession, or more modestly perhaps, trade or walk of life. But today we can say profession. He claimed that everyone had a mission in their particular work or craft. And in German he called this Beruf. The word itself, Beruf, comes from the German word for calling. God calls on us to do what we are supposed to do. And the tools in our workshop call on us as professionals uh, to use them. This may seem an odd introduction to a talk on architecture in the Anthropocene, uh, but these kinds of things are always good to know. Today, I think they are more important than ever because the professional work that we do is more important than ever. Uh, and I think that the Lutheran no notion of calling has something really significant to tell us. If we, um, if we go back to the idea of the improvement, the improvement of the world, as Western has often said, it was interpreted in different ways. It was used to legitimize colonization. Britain, France and other colonizing powers had what they themselves called civilizing missions and should improve the world uh, with scientific knowledge, but also with slavery. It was all part of the same package for hundreds of years. Later on, improvement meant to spread modern agriculture and industrial modernity and civic rights. Many ideas and practices we can really defend. They are good ideas. We always knew this, that we what we did in the world had pros and cons, and we developed our own Western and European societies to to improve uh, improve them as well. I mean, improve our own societies. But one thing we really never questioned, um, 
namely that the ultimate design was given and whatever we did, we just worked on top of what God had once created. And in fact, so deep was this conviction, conviction that some even thought that it was impossible for humans to alter his creation in any fundamental way. And um, what you see here is a quote from Nobel laureate physicist Robert Millikan, who insisted, still in 1930, that God had created a world that was so perfect that nobody could destroy it. He had installed what Millikan, God had installed what Millikan called foolproof mechanisms to prevent the world from being destroyed. Uh, perhaps a strange idea to come from a physicist, but so he thought. But today we all know, even school children know, that that was plain wrong. And you could say that that was a long time ago. But seen in the long life of humanity, it was actually quite recently. It was only the previous century. Everything we learned about improvement must be rethought from new angles. And I think that's one of the basic messages of what I have to say here today, that, that we really re need to relearn what is improvement. Um, now, if we look a little bit at what the imagery of um, the Anthropocene um, offers us, it's in a sense um, often a, as a kind of design, a, a design not always intended. It's it's a, a kind of work with the scales. If you to scale up, you see patterns on the face of the earth that perhaps nobody thought about being created precisely like that. And this imagery, you may have seen it before, it's, um, it's growing in, 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 in numbers. This, this is a design on a scale we, which we understand, but there are some geological features on that too. Um, and I'll show you a few more of, of, of the same kind. Um, and it's often also images that are taken from some distance. Um, I think this kind of images have been more frequent in recent years because they somehow signal to us that we um, design collectively. It's not just the professions that do this. It's somehow patterns that emerge. And they do have some aesthetics that is not uh, uninteresting. Um, these were the books I, I mentioned, the Anthropocene book, uh, unfortunately only available in Swedish, is in the middle here. Uh, but to me, they are linked to one book that I also wrote the following year, uh, the following couple of years, which was about the role of uh, education or bildning, as we say in Swedish, general education, um, which has been much discussed in, in recent years, and also the concept of crisis, which was a book that I published last year which really was a year of profound crisis. And I think these concepts are linked uh, in, in profound ways. Um, and also what we heard this morning from Jamie Lorimer, it's about cha a change of Weltanschauung. It's about the Anthropocene is not just a geological concept. It's something about how to reconceive our understanding of the world and our own place in it, a kind of narrative that is emerging. And one outcome of it might be actually crisis. Uh, it doesn't need to be. We still have ways to uh, um, get out of the challenges and problems, uh, unscathed, so to speak. But it's really a daunting tasks ahead of us. And to this, of course, we need education. We need building. We need, we need to know more, and we need to know how to apply that. So I think in some sense, these co concepts actually uh, go together very, uh, very well. You already saw um, several instances of, of of the kind of iconography, and you heard about Paul Crutzen, so I shouldn't repeat that. But maybe you would like to know that Paul Crutzen's first job after his degree back in the Netherlands, uh, when he was married to his Finnish wife, they moved to Jävle, a Swedish town uh, somewhat to the north of Stockholm, where he started working for a design company, uh, a small design company because he was a bridge builder. 
he was trained as a designer actually uh, and I think that perhaps no coincidence he had a sense of of what it meant when you ch started changing things <laughs> on, on at least on a small scale but then uh, one of those days he read in the Dagens Nyheter he quickly picked up some Swedish that they needed a programmer at the University of Stockholm uh, he had never did any, done any programming but he applied for the job and he got it and uh, uh, then he got as a supervisor the climate scientist uh, Bert Bolin who was his employer so to speak uh, and Bert Bolin became um, was very much engaged in climate change research so he became also the founding father of the IPCC now a household word that was founded in 1988 and with under Bert Bolin in the 60s and 70s he became a research student and uh, you could say the rest is history then he became very creative himself too they were two very creative people and they have been very important uh, founding fathers in a sense for our, our understanding of the modern world such things can happen when you are employed by a construction firm in Gävle um, and um, as we could also see there are movies made uh, for example this pretty wonderful movie actually um, called the Anthropocene by with Alicia Vikander the Swedish actress as, a, as, as the narrator uh, showing from around the world uh, very concretely how the the um, Anthropocene is so to speak manifested on the face of the earth and this is of course the mountain of Carrara in Italy again a design reference uh, what can we not do with with marble from Carrara but also it is an imprint it, a demonstrable imprint um, of this kind of um, surface earth um, aesthetic in a sense some would even say it of course destruction uh, one dimension of this uh, that I think is quite important to note is that it's no um, it's no uh, uh, tea party. It, 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 it's it's not it's not a, a kind of a uh, cozy thing. What goes on? It links very much to geopolitics, to resource um, conflicts, how we divide up and share the opportunities. Uh, in this world uh, uh, is is a crucial explanation to some of the conflicts that we also see for example ar around rare earth metals around um, uh, fossil fuels around minerals more generally and people either like or dislike these uh, uh, resources and they have very different ideas of how to use them so it's not just aesthetics or design underlying this is very profound political issues that cut across countries and even cut across world regions and divide different parts of the world from each other uh, and um, some politicians um, take various stands on this uh, but they are it's not very easy to be a politician in this regard many many of them I'd suggest these two uh, pretty clever young men uh, uh, leading of their countries Canada and France would understand the kind of Anthropocene logic that they operate uh, with and through and in but at the same time uh, satisfying their electorate and satisfying the businesses and industries of their nations they have they're caught up constantly in dilemmas so in a sense it's all our mission to help them <laughs> to, to somehow assist them in moving out of these dilemmas to find the right way forward in their fighting uh, for the for the good and the right and I don't think we can just delegate that issue to them we need to co collaborate um, just some some figures here and some some imagery that would go with this in, in the form of diagrams uh, and I was happy to note that I don't repeat uh, Jamie's uh, diagrams that were very beautiful I think but here are some 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 more but, but we'll also note the cover of the science magazine nature from some years ago which is you could say not about the Anthropocene it's about the Anthropos the human itself and it's just there is a little bit of an icon because I think at the same time as we change the image of how we see the earth and the human earth relationship we also are changing the way we see ourselves as human beings 
uh, you see cabbage sprouting <laughs> out of this body. We are biological, organic uh, creatures. We are not only, or not even primarily, I think, in, in our current view of Anthropos, we are no longer the um, simply the sapiens, homo sapiens, sapiens, meaning that we are the rational thinking uh, kind of creature we're also very much caught up in our sentiments we are we are profoundly biological and um, we are run or overrun even by our own desires and passions I think we are we are also seeing an increasing complexity in 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 what the human is and I could add here also a third dimension that, that I sort of develop in my the books that you see here is, is to me sort of a tripartition you have the, the, the earth, the changing view of the earth, you have the changing view of the human, and you have the changing view of history, the changing view of time. This very much related to the Anthropocene thinking. So what I see is not just the Anthropocene as a kind of a geological discussion, it's very much a profound discussion about our existential situation. And mind you, I think this, uh, and I think I agree with Jamie Lorimer here, we, we see this as a concept that is just in, in the emerging phase, it will really, really grow. Uh, it is, is an essential change underway. And if you look uh, in some detail at, at those images um, uh, that were on the, on the previous picture, um, we, we can start by looking at these trends, uh, the, the Earth system trends. And I think it's very important here to, to and, and you, you will recognize these, that they're, not, they're nothing sensational. It's, it's domesticated land, it's tropical forest loss, it's methane, this dangerous greenhouse gas, it's ocean acidification, it's various uh, compounds, including of course carbon dioxide, famously in the atmosphere, that, that are affecting the planet. This is in a sense the graphic representation of the Anthropocene as it is read through the instruments by the scientists. Uh, but it says also um, in, 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 in the title there that it's Earth system trends. And uh, that is part of this new version of the planet, that it's, it's a system of systems. Uh, and the Earth system understanding is a pretty recent understanding. It's really the, the breakthrough of that concept, the Earth system, is from the 1980s. It's a 30, 40 years old idea that is now being growing really tremendously. And if we then look at the drivers of this, where do they come from? Well, these are human. So the human and the Earth are profoundly linked world population growth growth of gdp growth of direct foreign investments growth of uses of fertilizers growth of paper productions telecommunications transportation tourism all these things that we usually connect when we hear the prime ministers or the even more the ministers of finance speaking to you about the progress of their countries these are the things they want to happen they want these curves to go up that's a healthy economy people get employment and so on and so forth that's what we like we or we used to like but Clearly, if you re remember the previous picture, these are these give the effects that we see on, so on the on the previous one. So here we are somehow caught, and um, you could also you have already now started thinking about what's behind these curves, what's behind the humans. Well, bad design. <laughs> these things are not designed. We we don't we like to travel, don't we? We like to use certain. Uh, we like to consume we need to consume but how do we do this it should all be changed let's also remember how we can arrive to these conclusions how can i say this uh, and how can jamie lorimer say, say, say what he did this morning how can we how can we think like this well we are re very much dependent on those that produce the understanding the knowledge and it's a range of, of people and institutions that have done that for quite some time actually but very much of this breakthrough new understanding is from the previous handful of decades actually 30 40 years these are the satellites 
Here, um, uh, you, you could see this perhaps most clearly if you look at the polar areas with the melting ice in Antarctica and, and the Arctic and the constantly new record lows of sea ice, uh, for example, it's about this time of the year soon, but we'll know how far uh, it has shrunk this year. Um, but it's also worth remembering that this is also, in a sense, you could say that this is actually a scientific design work, if you like. You, you, you create new understandings, and the satellites produce their, not only their aesthetics, but also their information about the world we are living on. We are so small as individuals that we don't see uh, ourselves on images like this. But it's all us. It's us behind these curves. Us as a collectivity. As, as humanity, as a, as a co co collective, although with the important distinction that we contribute very differently. Some of us, most of us, you who listen and I who speak, we contribute very much because it's part of our lifestyle, it's part of the design of our societies that we need to. We are tra trapped in this. We are forced to contribute. But go to Bangladesh uh, and you find very little of this contribution. So that's another reason to understand that it's a divided world. It's a unified, in a sense, a colossal effect we create as humanity, but the individual contribution, the individual benefits are very much different. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I happen to be pretty fond of these <laughs> ice pictures, but, but uh, I couldn't dwell on it for too long. But since you're in Malmö, it's close to Copenhagen, that was actually and very much of an important city in this regard. And Willy Danskort, who was a, was a scientist developing, the, or developing or creating these first um, ice um, cores that now provide much of the temporalities, the understandings. Actually, that was where the first quantum jumps in drastic change of the planet were discovered through these ice cores back in the 60s and 70s. Um, so that so much for understanding. Now, if we look a little bit at the um, the um, implications of this, we can we can see a long historical pattern uh, where the, the West or Europe actually played a significant role. So this great acceleration, starting in the middle of the 20th century, has a long prehistory of Western expansion. Uh, what has sometimes been called ecological imperialism, a profound change of ecosystems and, and geographies uh, in the different parts of the world, which was primarily um, installed or in, sort of inspired by uh, or made possible through Western intervention. So again, this is not just some state we happen to be in. It, is, it has a creation history, so to speak. And when you see this, these kinds of moments, uh, this is a moment of hope, of course, and progress at the Paris uh, Climate Agreement meeting in 20, December 2015. We should remember that it's not just a, a, a moment uh, of happiness created by a group of diplomats and, and, and specialists meeting for, for a few weeks or, or the IPCC dating back as 90, at 1988. It is actually a, a deeper history behind this that is much more political than we usually think about. It's much more nested into other fields of work again. We should think us as all the way back to the Lutheran workshop. I think that we are all part of creating this. So now the challenge is how, we, how we're going to be part of working ourselves out of it or at least change the effects. And here I think it's important to note also that there is a great deal of division between uh, understandings of where to go from here. And um, um, so, well, here's some notions that you meet around this. For example, there, uh, there is no plan B. Uh, how, how do you define progress? Uh, people really have divided opinions on this. And as we heard from Jamie also, it's also about denial. Some just don't believe in this. And he also showed you this um, Im image of, uh, of, of um, the very dense, super modern uh, city a, a product of design, you could say, uh, and the eco-modernists and their manifesto. Uh, and if you take the critical stance here, you can say that it's a, uh, the picture just above it. You could say it's just the, the same old forms of exploitation, just dressed up in a new, in a new fashion. You could probably debate this. Uh, uh, we certainly do debate this. 
what, what, we, um, what we have in mind here. You could say that the modernists want to keep arguing for uh, continued improvement of the, of the world according to a formula that we have known for a long time. And they argue the case for technology as the way forward. Uh, drastically expanded use of energy, more fertilizers, um, more nuclear power, for example, uh, more use of concrete, uh, only an improved concrete, uh, increased mobility, uh, more motorways, more cars. So that's an old paradigm of, of progress, but being softened by technology that can decouple the effects from, so, so that we can actually create what they call the good Anthropocene. Um, so in a sense, thinking about perfecting God's creation in a high-tech version, it's worth remembering that these kinds of notions are very profound and very deep. And I, perhaps also being an historian, but I, I think actually these kinds of notions run very deep in societies. It's enormously difficult. It's a friction to get out of them. Uh, I don't think ideas run the world, but I think we are somehow... They, are, they build big, big narratives in which we are caught. So it's not easy to change. Um, and maybe then just another historical reference for you. In, this, in the 17th century, Francis Bacon, the very influential um, thinker and politician, you could also say, in, uh, in, in, uh, in England, uh, he, he wrote this book that the frontispiece is shown in the middle there, very much a biblical understanding. We had started in paradise at a very primitive level. We were in balance with nature then. And then we were thrown out of paradise. And, and, and that's the history of humanity, our quest to, to change that and return to paradise, but on a higher technological level. And that's an enormously powerful driver of human energy and human quest. Uh, but it's not necessarily uh, a, a useful one. We may want to rethink this. And I think the Anthropocene invites us to do that. Um, now, just a few uh, slides at the end here before I will preach a little bit at the, ver at the very end uh, to, to just invite you also to, to think about how, how old are these notions. Well, this is a late, uh, late 17th century uh, notion of when pe people in this part of the world thought about the, the, the start of the world and how it would run through a, a number of very set, clear, seven, in this case, stages um, so Thomas Burnett is not so famous today, but his best friend was, was Newton, the famous physicist, and Newton loved this idea. And, and it, would, it would have this big, big fire at the end of, uh, to, to, at the, end of the world. But it's, it's all about starting in, in this big flood and ending in apocalypse. Again, powerful images. Uh, and if you look at, the, at today's um, uh, understanding of the Anthropocene, it's again very much how the design has uh, come into the picture. Um, the uh, concept of techno-fossil uh, has been used, the, the technosphere. Some have suggested that we live now in the technosphere, um, the ultimate stage of of humanity where we actually have a greater variety of objects like these than the, uh, than the, the total biological diversity, the species density of these kinds of gadgets is now far, far higher. So humanity appears in a fashion um, where we somehow are a kind of a human earth superpower, not just perfecting God's creation anymore, but actually um, superseding it uh, a footnote to Crutzen, though, when he wanted to date this epoch, he, he, he went to the Industrial Revolution in the late, um, uh, uh, late 18th century and um, thought about the steam engine and things like that. But as, as, as we now think, ra rather, we would like to have it start after the Second World War. Uh, and another of the 18, I love this image, the uh, 18th, thinker, thinkers, uh, 18th century thinkers, Buffon, uh, actually laid out very much the blueprint for, for what is current thinking about the Anthropocene. He's been kind of a super saint, uh, arch saint of, of the Anthropocene, because he, he also um, it was clear that 
humans could change climate. And he actually liked it. He thought, we, we, we can run the world through heat, he said. We can, we can color the, the skies red. And he was in love with it because he, he had no idea about the dangers behind it. He only thought about it, this as culture. Uh, he, so my message here is a little bit also to have you think about the profound um, um, resistance or friction that comes from these super big narratives that we have behind us here. Now, um, I promised you the sermon at the end, um, and I will actually um, speak to you as a, as a profession. Uh, also, we all have, we have pr professions. And I think the, um, all professionals in this kind of state we're in, in the Anthropocene, need to go back to the very roots and core of their work and ask the question that Luther asked us to, <laughs> to, 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 to listen to, namely, what are your calling? What is your calling? And I think this is very important for the design professions. Uh, and uh, this will be a good place to stop in a sense because the, the answers to this is something that every profession must find out itself. But since I am here and have some time left, I will tell you about things I have thought about uh, over quite some time. You could say a lifelong career. Um, uh, and um, not least my work in the Stadsmiljö Rådet, the urban uh, council uh, that was back then in the 90s and the early years of this century. And increasingly now, I think, as we face this demand of immediate transformation that we must go through to avoid dangerous climate risks. And my first observation in this regard is that the design profession's voice is too weak. You do fantastic work, but your voice is too weak and is heard too rarely. We miss you. We know that you sit at the real nexus of influence where visions of how to build the future meets questions of form, function, energy, materials, and subsequently of environmental impact and carbon footprint. So um, it's... We often say industry and we think about big factories, but also involved in all that is ideas and practices of how to do it and what the vision is to that we want to create. And that's very much a design issue. And this is probably hard for you, I think. You compete for commissions, you must satisfy contractors and those who ultimately would pay for your products. And it is, of course, hard to tell those that you are dependent on, that they should not do what they want if they are allowed. And especially because if you do, someone else will always come along and say, okay, I will do it instead. I, I, I'm not so moralistic. <laughs> so I think it's very important to think about what we may want to call Anthropocene standards. So think about standards in, in ways that Around, within boundaries that are set by the Anthropocene and by the planetary boundaries concept that we also heard about before. And I think actually one shouldn't accept solutions or work with solutions that continue to propel the climate emergency. To cite Greta Thunberg, the house is burning. And I think in a sense, this can be said to be, and thinking again about Luther, a new calling. Uh, and, and what it means to perfect God's creation in the Agenda 2030 decade. And I think particularly this decade is when we need to do a lot of work on this. So in a sense, that is what we hope to get from people like you. I shouldn't say we demand it from you, but we, we, we hope to get it uh, because we know about your fantastic capacity. And to ease off your anxiety, I can tell you that this is what actually I would say to any profession. Uh, we do it ourselves actually in academia. I'm just now a member of a working group in the Alliance for the Academies of Europe. ALEA is the acronym. We are commissioned to just now to write a report on how the academic, the entire academic sector in society can decarbonize. Because that is what we have found out in our own research. Our own research tells us this is the only way forward. And this is what we teach in the classrooms. So we must do it ourselves. 20 years ago, it would have seemed an almost utopian proposition, but it is no longer, it is possible. 
And what does it take? First of all, it takes insight and commitment. We must know the Anthropocene predicament. We must know the true story of biodiversity loss. And if you want to know that story, you should actually read Partha Desgupta's very recent report to the British government, a fantastic but very tragic overview of the state of biodiversity in the world right now. We must know the story of overheating, to cite the um, Norwegian um, social anthropologist Thomas Hylland Eriksson, who is the title by, uh, a book by that title, Overheating and its consequences. We must realize that it is no way we can continue to do wrong things. So we must take the ethical stance and it must stay above the short-term economic and personal concerns, which is of course always very difficult. Most professional organizations already have ethical standards and I assume architects uh, of Scandinavia have too, and they should. But in a sense, I think they must be revised. And that is the obvious place to start as a profession. Start precisely where you are, to rethink your standards, and the ethical standards, and think about them as Anthropocene standards. And there is not a moment to lose. Rework the ethical code and other policy documents and make it clear what is your top priority. And if I may continue my little idea here for this presentation, the, the top priority is to perfect God's creation and explain what that means in our time. Um, because I think there is a relationship here uh, between the, the small environment, the, one, the kind of environment we thought about before, that also Jamie Lorimer talked about, the local air in the particular city, the end of pipe run, running out into the river, things like that. Now we think about the planetary scale. So in a sense, I think this challenges one of the um, very profound, as I take it at least, um, ideas of, of, of design or the design professions, namely the, what we, we call the human scale. I always learned from designers that it's very important to think about the human scale. And it is still important, of course. We, we want to be surrounded by things we can use. We want them to, to, to fit in our hands. We, we, we want uh, clothes I wear are clothes for my body, aren't they? But, but they always have an effect beyond myself. Everything we do, everything we design, although small, has something that reaches beyond. So the golden rule of um, design, in a sense, ha has an inbuilt deception into it. It doesn't speak to the entire world as it must do. So if you want to perfect God's creation, it's not just to improve this little thing I wear. It's to improve its consequences for the entire world creation. I think that is the Lutheran idea. That is what the calling uh, of design is, is about. Um, so rework the ethical code and other policy documents uh, with some deep thinking around these, along these lines to perfect God's creation and explain what it means. Then work yourselves down to the practicalities, which nobody can do as well as you can yourselves how you handle misconduct, how you name and shame those who don't observe the ethical standards, how you hail and praise those who do the good things, uh, and um, these kinds of practicalities that, that uh, I don't need to dwell on very much more. Let me just finish off by, by saying also, thinking about your voice that I think should be heard more. Go public. Tell the rest of us how you will change. Let the big harana, the, uh, those who commission your work, know that you will meet them as a new common voice and that they should be prepared to conduct the conversation on your terms because you design the future and they will build it. It is no longer, um, um, well, it is on the longer term, a win-win kind of situation actually. And just move ahead, write more open articles in the big newspapers, Sydsvenskan and Dagens Nyheter, things like that. Tell the politicians. And like all abusers on a correction program, tell everyone you know that you are changing so that they will applaud your success and let you know when you deviate. Give us the good examples, show that it is possible, set targets and goals, ask for support from the public sphere and from politics, and tell Macron and uh, and the other world leaders that you are actually helping them out of their dilemma. Well, um, 
I like to preach, <laughs> and uh, maybe it's no uh, no coincidence. I started with Luther here, uh, uh, but this is the end of it, and I'd be happy to um, uh, to hear if there is any comments or question from from the studio. So back over to you. Thanks. Wow, säger jag då. <laughs> Tack för detta. Jätte jättespännande inspel verkligen. Och fantastisk, vi switchar nu över till svenska. Eh, och fantastiska... Ja, jag hör det. Jag kan också svenska. Ja, jag vet. <laughs> Mycket bra. Fantastiska bilder. <laughs> Lite grann. Eh, och nu känner jag att man vill bara lära sig mer och veta mer om detta, helt enkelt. Superspännande. Eh, jag tänker ändå, även om du har svarat på en del, så tänker jag ändå, eh, om vi kan förtydliga lite, varför... Mm. inredningsarkitekter och arkitekter överhuvudtaget ska eh, bry oss om det här begreppet antropocen. Och som sagt, du har ju svarat det, men jag skulle ändå vilja att du liksom säger några ord om det för tydliga. Ja, alltså, jag tycker den frågan är väldigt viktig, för man kan ju eh, förstås fråga sig varför ska vi liksom... Eh, vi känner trots att igen en del inslag i det här från tidigare tänkande också. Det är liksom, allt är inte nytt, även om varför ska vi ha ett nytt ord? Är det inte bara liksom en sorts koketteri med nya begrepp? Och så där? Ska ständigt vetenskapen komma hit och anmäla sig liksom först? Men jag tror att det är en poäng i just det här fallet att, att adoptera begreppet och börja använda det. Därför att, och jag, som jag skriver i min bok, jag, den som kom ut 2017, där pocket ett par år senare, det, där brottas jag lite grann med det där och jag, är ganska, jag bekänner att det tog flera år innan jag tyckte att det var en så bra idé egentligen att, att adoptera det begreppet. Vi hörde ju också om kritiken här alltså från, från eh, Alf Honborg och, och eh, eh, Andreas Malm och, och inte bara dem, det över hela världen finns det en, har funnits under ett mer ett årtionde en kritisk debatt om just det att man tvångskollektiviserar liksom mänskligheten fast de i själva verket halva mänskligheten har inget ont gjort de använder inte atmosfären för att släppa ut saker i och sådär. De, de bidrar väldigt lite. Så då, det finns en massa invändningar och, 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 och det finns alternativa begrepp. Men jag tror att nu har det blivit antropocen och jag tror att det finns en, det, det dialogsamhället som, som har sin arbetsgrupp för att försöka föra den här frågan vidare. Jag tror att det vore väldigt bra om geologsamhället accepterade det här och att det blev ett etablerat begrepp. Och det är det väldigt mycket för att det kommer att liksom klara, klara luften åt oss allihopa. Det kommer att vara så att då kommer skolbarnen hem i 11-årsåldern och berättar för sina föräldrar att de lever i en tropp och sen så kommer föräldrarna att alltså liksom så här, vad menar du, vad säger du, vad är det för någonting? Och så får de förklara för föräldrarna då som framsteg alltid har gått till det som yngre får lära dem äldre hur det ligger till och så kanske föräldrar kanske bråkar lite och tycker att det var korkat men efter ett tag så kommer det att bli etablerat och då kommer det att sätta sig som ett sorts narrativ, ett nytt supernarrativ tror jag för hur vi har det här på jorden och så. Det kommer därmed att kunna bidra, det narrativet gör att man sänker trösklar och då tror jag att det är väldigt bra om professionerna gör det tidigt att de liksom tar över begreppet för att när man tar över ett så, så, så overarching begrepp som, som antropocen då, då påverkar det tänkandet i detaljer. Och det är ju egentligen mitt budskap till er att det som ni gör till, till vardags det kan, tänk, det, 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 gör ni, men det kan tänkas om och göras så att säga, större. Eh, sista fråga. Ett lite kort svar då, men hur, det här är ju så himla intressant, men hur undviker vi att det inte blir en väldigt akademisk fråga? Du svarar ju lite på tidigare svar här, men om vi nu vill sprida det bredare liksom, hur undviker vi att det blir det här liksom, oj, jätteakademiskt begrepp? Har du kort svar på det? Jag tror att... Eh... Ja, jag tror att det viktiga svaret är ni själva där alltså att, och, alla, och andra professioner och andra praktiker av olika slag. Att, eh, akademin producerar liksom ramarna för det här tänkandet och liksom har producerat en kunskapsbas som det vilar på. Det är ju jättebra att det görs och det kommer att fortsätta. Men, men eh, sen, nu, nu blir det liksom mer tillämpat. Man kan säga att nu blir det verkstad för att prata med Luther. Att nu måste vi göra det och vi måste känna att det är nya redskap där. Det är inte bara fingerborgar och hyvlar, det är liksom annat som kallar på oss. Och det här begreppet är liksom en förutsättning för att vi ska förstå vilka de nya redskapen är. 
Eh, det är inte akademiskt alls tycker jag. Eh, människor tänker ju hela tiden och arbetar hela tiden, är praktiska hela tiden. Det är, eh, sen finns det liksom en, en viss variant av det som vi kallar det akademiska. Men det, i den verkliga världen sker ju, gör vi saker tillsammans. Och det tänkte nog Luther också att det här är, verkstaden är för honom en metafor för hur vi alla har det oavsett var vi finns. Men vi måste, vi måste, vi måste göra det där vi är. Tack för det, Sverker. Eh, tack för din medverkan. Det var fantastiskt spännande. Och eh, jag tror att alla vi som har lyssnat nu har fått upp ögonen för detta och vill veta mer egentligen. Så mm. återigen, tusen tack för din medverkan. Jättebra. Och det kändes lite positivt här nu på slutet också. Det var jättebra. Tack. Ja, verkligen. Tack så mycket för att ni bjöd in mig. Lycka till med ert arbete. Hej. Och med det så tackar vi även dig Åsa och vi tackar Akademin för inredningsarkitektur. Så stort tack till er. Det har varit en bredd i diskussionen om antropocen den här förmiddagen. Jag hoppas att det har väckt tankar och att det har gett ny kunskap till alla er som tittar. I eftermiddag är temat arkitektur i en global värld och där möter vi föreläsare som arbetar i olika kontexter med olika framtidsfrågor inom arkitektur. Vi kommer att ha föreläsare från Melbourne, Los Angeles, Berlin, Shenzhen, London och Köpenhamn. Så välkomna tillbaka klockan ett fast vi är inte riktigt klara för eftersom vi ligger före i schemat. Så har vi tid nu att visa en förinspelad film av Jamie Lorimer som vi hörde i morse. Och han kommer att berätta om sin bok The Probiotic Planet. And for our English audience. Welcome back at one o'clock when, when the theme is architecture in a globalized world. We look forward to seeing you then. And before lunch we finish this morning session with a filmed talk by Jem Jamie Lorimer who we met this morning and he will speak about his book The Probiotic Planet. See you at one. In this talk I want to pick up on some of the ideas I developed in my keynote uh, speech uh, this morning around the Anthropocene and particularly to offer a new approach to thinking about the Anthropocene as a way of managing uh, life in, in the present. So the book starts from uh, a way of thinking about the Anthropocene as an antibiotic age. Uh, and by this, I'm developing an expansive idea of antibiotic beyond just particular drugs that are used to kill specific organisms, to think instead as the Anthropocene as the consequence of systematic efforts to control, rationalize and simplify the dynamics of ecological and planetary systems. And we can think about this across a, a range of scales from specific chemicals targeted at insects or, or bacteria, but right the way up to landscape scale interventions associated with the rise of industrial farming or industrial forestry that are based on this simplification, control, rationalization of, of ecological systems to produce uh, surplus food. Uh, and likewise, efforts to control natural processes associated with flood management, uh, fire suppression, uh, even uh, disease control, all of which have successfully domesticated and, and, and um, tamed uh, the challenging elements of the non-human world that, that you know, frustrated human flourishing in, in the past. And there's much to be celebrated from this antibiotic model. It's raised life expectancy, it's increased health, it's left led to, to economic growth. But we also see a growing concern about what might be described as Anthropocene blowback. So a set of unforeseen consequences that have come about because of the excessive application of antibiotic modes of managing life. So just to provide a few examples, we could think about blowback on the, on the microbial scale, uh, growing concerns that the rise of intensive globalized agriculture leads to uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, H5N1, SARS, and, and, and potentially, potentially COVID are all associated with this concern about the excesses of uh, intensive agriculture. Likewise, concerns about antimicrobial resistance, that antibiotics are ceasing to work well because of their overuse in, in agriculture. So that would be one manifestation of, 
of blowback. Uh, a second one more associated with humans and human health is a growing sense that the human microbiome, so the microbial composition of the human body, is fundamentally degraded uh, and reconfigured by modern hygiene and health practices. So particularly in this case, the uh, use of, of antibiotics is led by some microbiologists to lead to a widespread condition of, of dysbiosis, of ecological uh, dysfunction within the human body associated with the rise of a set of allergic autoimmune uh, non-communicative diseases, allergies, obesity, uh, various cognitive uh, dysfunctions. So another manifestation of blowback on the, on the microbial scale. But arguably comparable developments are taking place on a landscape scale. So a sense that the uh, excesses of agriculture, the excesses of, of forestry, uh, the excesses of flood control and fire suppression have created uh, dysfunctional conditions on a landscape scale that lead to extreme weather events, whether that's extreme flooding, types of extreme fires that we increasingly see around at the world at the moment, the loss of biodiversity, the rise of plant diseases, all are indexed to the over application of antibiotic modes of managing life. And this can arguably be scaled up to growing concerns expressed by climate scientists that I talked about in my, in my talk this morning, um, that the planet itself is tipping out of the conditions of the Holocene that led to the flourishing of human life, and that we're moving fast into new planetary conditions associated with the Anthropocene as a consequence of the excesses associated with the great acceleration with the overuse of resources and the exceeding of planetary boundaries. So the book takes this as its starting point, and it's interested in a particular set of responses that I describe as probiotic. Uh, and here probiotic again means much more than specific organisms that you might take, particular live bacteria you might take to, 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 to address uh, gut problems, towards a much more holistic way of thinking about efforts to use life to manage life. So efforts by scientists and policymakers to intervene into the dynamics of ecological systems in order to reset their circulation uh, to deliver desired functions and services necessary for human survival. And the book works through a range of different manifestations of this, um, a range of examples on the microbial scale, people trying to uh, reset gut ecologies through dietary practices, through various forms of fecal microbiota transplant, uh, the replacement of unhealthy gut ecologies with more healthy gut ecologies, new frameworks of hygiene that try and uh, recalibrate our relationships to dirt, to try and differentiate between good and bad germs, in order that um, children can be exposed to the right sorts of microbes at the right point uh, in, in, in the life course, uh, various shifting gardening agricultural practices to do with integrated pest management, for example, which are about using the predators of particular uh, undesired pests in order to uh, minimize the use of, of, of herbicides and, and insecticides. So a range of uh, deliberate interventions done in the context of Anthropocene blowback to try and reset ecologies to make them function. But the example that features most prominently in, in the book and that I'd like to focus on uh, in the talk today uh, happens at a landscape scale uh, and is associated with a new approach to conservation, to, to land management, uh, and even to agriculture uh, that is described as rewilding. Uh, the flagship story of rewilding is around the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone in, in, in North America, Wolves went extinct from Yellowstone uh, in the middle of the 20th century. They were reintroduced as a species conservation effort. But ecologists studying Yellowstone found that wolves exerted this uh, effect on the food system captured in this diagram here, such that they changed the grazing behavior of, of the large herbivores, the deer, the elk, the moose that lived in Yellowstone, which had these uh, significant effects upon vegetation patterns. So the animals were eating differently, not so much because there were fewer of them because they were getting eaten by the wolves, but they were living in what ecologists describe as, a, a, as an ecology of fear. So the fear of predation by the wolf meant that the large herbivores grazed differently and a small number of wolves uh, had this landscape scale transformation of Yellowstone that led to the resurgence of desired forms of, of vegetation. So there's lots of interest in wolves in the rewilding movement and other 
what are called keystone predators, so predators that sit at the top of the food chain that exert this disproportionate influence over uh, the ecologies that they're part of. There's also a lot of interest in, in the UK and, and, and in Europe uh, in beavers. Uh, so beavers, once common across all of, all of Europe, uh, have gone extinct in many parts of Europe, but are now being actively reintroduced uh, as uh, what Jim Crumley, the nature writer, describes as nature's architects. So a sense that beavers, by virtue of the way in which they build dams, end up controlling uh, the flow of water through river catchments, and in so doing, deliver all sorts of desirable benefits for land managers. So in building dams, they can slow the flow of water, preventing extreme uh, flooding events. They also retain water in the landscape so they can help to mitigate drought. Uh, beaver dams are understood to, to help improve water quality, as well as to deliver wetland habitats that are very good for, for biodiversity. So there's this interest in restoring beavers as engineers, as ecological engineers that will deliver desired uh, landscapes. And perhaps the most bizarre but uh, high profile version of rewilding is, is, a, is a proposal by two Russian zoologists, uh, Sergei and Nikita Zimov, to de-extinct, to bring back from extinction, the mammoth. Um, and they argue that the mammoth is required in order to manage the tundra landscapes of Siberia, uh, which are fast melting uh, and in their melting, they risk releasing a huge amount of stored methane into the atmosphere, which will accelerate uh, climate change, accelerate the transition from the, from the Holocene into the Anthropocene. And that to bring back the mammoths, the mammoths will trample the snow, they'll create this insulating blanket, makes the mammoth the proper tool to fight global warming, they propose. So just another example of this way of thinking probiotically, that you could use life to manage life to deliver desired systems and, and services. In this case, planetary stabilization, but we could think of it right down to the micro scale and the use of particular beneficial microbes to reset gut ecologies. And rewilding has captured the imagination of policymakers. There are great visions here expressed by the organization Rewilding Europe that uh, policymakers could make use of land abandonment, the cessation of agriculture in many marginal parts of Europe to restore charismatic a megafauna uh, to create much more biodiverse, much more functional landscapes. So it's a very compelling vision, it's a very optimistic vision, but it's also a vision that tells us interesting things about the place of people in nature, in the Anthropocene. So the first of which, it's a vision which very much sees humans as engineers. There's a version here of the human as the archetypal hyper keystone species, the architect that can plan planetary survival through an ecological lens uh, that humans equipped with technology can manage uh, the behaviors, the activities of keystone species like wolves and beavers, uh, that they can use uh, heavy machinery to uh, remove invasive undesired species to reset ecologies so that natural processes can flourish, but also that humans may be involved in lethal control of overabundant herbivores in places where it's hard to restore wolves, let's say. So this is very much uh, an anthropogenic vision in which humans will control the planet to enable planetary survival. Secondly, it very much values a subset of species that are held to be useful, hardworking uh, engineers. Um, in this picture here, which was to promote a documentary from, from Nature, from the Public Broadcasting Service in the US, we get this nice caricature of the beaver as the ultimate keystone species. It turns up on time, it works hard, it doesn't need to get paid, it doesn't take a holiday, it doesn't join a union. It is, if you like, you know, from a, from a particular capitalist vision, uh, it is the ideal type of, of nature, nature worker. Um, so this is a tool that will deliver ecosystem services. And you know, that's great for beavers, it's great for wolves, but of course there's a range of species that aren't especially useful, uh, that are perhaps functionally redundant, uh, and hence may well drop out of a probiotic vision in which life is optimized to deliver things that are useful for people. So we need to think about the ethics of this in terms of which forms of life are valued and which forms of life are, are discarded. And then of course, there are a range of interesting geographies as to where in the world the probiotic turn is, is happening and who are exposed to some of the risks associated with 
the return of of charismatic megafauna in, in this case. So, so just to give an example of of, of tigers in the, in the Sundarbans in, in Bangladesh, tigers are globally rare, but they are locally abundant in places in the in the in the deltas of, of Bangladesh, in which they threaten the lives of of fishers shown here wearing masks on the back of their heads as a way of trying to deter tigers from from attacking them. So there are quite unequal geographies of where in the world uh, the probiotic turn happens and, and the distribution of benefits to, to different people. We could think about that in the case of, uh, of rewilding uh, closer to home in, in Europe. So we hear a lot of optimistic stories about the resurgence of wildlife in parts of uh, Scandinavia, in, in, in parts of, of Central Europe, as a consequence of the globalization of agriculture. So we increasingly grow our food in the tropics. Um, and as a consequence, we're seeing large scale deforestation uh, of, of, of parts of, 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 of the tropical world, which is allowing the resurgence of wildlife in, in, in temperate climes. So there's a, there's a bigger question about the distribution, the de geographical distribution of the benefits of, of this shift in, in land management that, that need thinking through. But just to conclude, where I'm going in the book is, is really to try and explain how this probiotic thinking does offer us an optimistic, transformative vision of how life might be conceived and managed in the Anthropocene, in which across a range of scales, uh, from the microbial interventions around human health and environmental health, right up to the landscape scale, planetary scale interventions associated with, with rewilding, there is a vision here in which ecological science uh, could inform new models of policy and new forms of governance uh, to help address some of the challenges associated with uh, surviving in, in, in the Anthropocene in the present.
Välkomna till arkitekturdagarna i Malmö och till den här eftermiddagen där vi blickar ut i världen och välkomnar föreläsare från olika länder. Våra gäster arbetar alla med arkitektur i varierad skala och de är alla engagerade i att diskutera samhällets utveckling och hur samhället och den byggda miljön samverkar. And for our English speaking audience, we will begin with a general introduction to this afternoon in Swedish and then in a few minutes introduce our first speaker in English. The lectures today are in English, however some of the discussion between the talks will be in Swedish and some in English. This afternoon we will listen to speakers from different parts of the world talking about different aspects of architecture and the role of the architect. Jag som är moderator under arkitekturdagarna heter Gunilla Kronvall och med mig under eftermiddagen har jag två gäster i en panel som tillsammans med mig kommer diskutera mellan prestationerna. Eva Westermark, partner på GL Architects i Köpenhamn och med erfarenhet från projekt i olika skalor runt om i världen. Välkommen Eva! Och Christian Pagg, direktör för Oslo Architecture Triennale arbetat med projekt inom stadsutveckling och strategisk design och är utbildad inom filosofi och modern kultur. Välkommen Christian. Och först och främst, vi ska ju blicka ut i världen under den här eftermiddagen och lyssna på arkitekter med olika erfarenheter och som arbetar i olika kontexter. Och ni har ju båda erfarenheter av just internationellt arbete. Om jag börjar med dig Eva, ni har ju ett kontor också som arbetar mycket internationellt. Vad ger det tycker du, jag tänker till diskussionen på kontoret eller det, vad hämtar ni hem från det internationella? Ja, det är ju, känns ju enormt viktigt att ha den där globala plattformen när vi pratar om globala utmaningar. Så vi delar ju det allihopa och sen så har ju varje olika länder, olika städer har olika förutsättningar och burning platforms eller sense of urgency. Så att det blir ju någonstans att man hittar lösningar som är kontextuella. Och det kan man ju bygga vidare på. Så man har massa olika svar på samma svåra fråga. Och lägger man ihop det så kan man ju liksom ta några kliv upp um, och, och prova att implementera de bra lösningar man har hittat och lära sig av alla misstag man gör. Mm. Och hur lika eller olika arbetar man i olika delar av världen tycker du? Ja, jag tycker att det handlar väldigt mycket om just vad man har för lokala utmaningar. Och det kan ju vara, eh, det kan ju vara rätt stora skillnader i vad, också vad man har för resurser och vad man har för system. Alltså eftersom städer är så olika i sina olika system så måste man också hitta lösningar som är anpassade till vilka förutsättningar som finns och vilka drivkrafter som finns. Um, så det blir ju rätt olika, men jag tycker att det som är intressant är just att vi, att vi delar de där utmaningarna. Och, och att vi är människor med liknande förutsättningar. Så vi kan ju verkligen lära oss av alla olikheter. Mm. Och Christian, i din erfarenhet av att just så att säga, vara i olika kontexter i olika delar av världen eller att, att lära av erfarenheter, hur, hur ser du på det? Nei, det är intressant i alla fall det är helt enig och och beveger jag mig själv mellan uh, Danmark och Norge. Ehm um, och sedan mellan de två uh, länderna som egentligen är så lika då tänker man så är det bara stora skillnader. Och 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 egentligen för bås den stora skillnaden och det är ju nettop en stor, rätt stor kille till inspiration. Alltså att man förstår att någon gör ting på en, en rätt annorlunda måte än dem lige om hjörnet. Uh, så så jag tänker att det är en enorm potential i på något sätt att vara bättre till att og se den anden vej på en måde. Fordi alle, nu taler du om systemer, og det hele er jo på en måde systemer, og der er jo alligevel i, i de fleste systemer en tendens til ligesom at gøre, som man plejer. Og hvis der er en ting, vi ved med tanke på verdens udfordringer, så er det, at vi skal prøve at gøre ting på andre måder. Og det er, der er jo altid en genstridighed i systemer. Så hvordan får man løsnet op i den? Der er det ofte utrolig stærkt at sige, jamen se, hvad de har gjort i Holland eller Singapore. Eller, altså, der kan ligge en... en en makt til forandring i det gode eksempel fra andre steder. Og det glæder mig til eftermiddag, tænker jeg, at jeg skulle se nogle af de gode eksempler. 
Och jag ska precis fråga som en följdfråga då. Gör vi det tillräckligt detta med att lära av andra? Nej, andra nej, gör? Slet ikke. Altså, nej. Altså. <laughs> Men det er også, det er, det er vildt svært. Det er vanskeligt, det vi skal. Altså det at lave gode byer for eksempel, og finde nye måder at bygge på. Altså det er jo vildt svært. Men jeg oplever også en stor konservatisme, og, og stadigvæk en frustrerende mangel på erkendelse af, A sense of urgency eller en burning platform, som du siger. Ja, der er for mange, som bare stadigvæk bygger et eller andet helt meningsløst hus. Uh, altså, ja. Og er det ikke også så, at jo snabbere vi behøver hitta løsninger, så, er, så oplever jeg, at da glemmer vi bort at lære os. Og så bare går vi videre, og så har vi egentlig provat en masse saker. Um, mm. Og har en masse, forstår jeg så historisk, en masse olika løsninger, men vi använder dem ikke, for at vi er så himla fokuserade på at være rusa, liksom. Så stanna upp, lyssna, vad händer i andra delar av världen, se vad vi kan lära och utbyta. Vad vi ska göra idag det är att vi ska som sagt ut och möta olika talare. Och vår första gäst är Liam Young. Han är baserad på SciArc i Los Angeles och arbetar med spekulativa världar och fiktiva framtider för att utforska bland annat lokal och global påverkan av ny teknologi. Liam har förutspelat sin presentation idag men han kommer sen vara med på länk för en stund, en frågestund efter den här filmen. And our first speaker this afternoon is Liam Young. Liam Young is a speculative architect and director who operates in the spaces between, the, between design, fiction and futures. He is, among many other things, co-founder of Tomorrow's Thoughts Today, an urban futures think tank. Liam has published several books, including the recent Machine Landscapes, Architectures of the Post-Anthropocene, as well as the book Planet City, a story of a fictional city for the entire population of the Earth. He has been guest professor at MIT, Princeton and Cambridge, and now runs the groundbreaking Masters in Fiction and Entertainment at SciArc in Los Angeles. Welcome Liam Young on the topic Worlds Less Traveled. evangelist and entrepreneur proclaims his vision for a green energy future, a world where everything will be solar in 20 years. And like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting to us a seductive future, a hopeful future, but at the same time it's a decidedly uncomplicated one. The future less traveled, however, is here. These are some shots from our film in the Lithium Triangle, called From the Breast Milk of Volcanoes. It's an area in Chile and Bolivia that contains almost all of the world's lithium resources, the key ingredient in all of our batteries. This massive mining landscape, carved out of one of the rarest and most precious ecosystems on the planet, is an icon of the world's less traveled. It's a world that doesn't get talked about in keynote speeches or in the latest ad for the Apple I whatever. Here our film tells another story of a future buried beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. It's a story told through illegal drone footage that we've secretly captured. It's a story of Elon Musk literally buying Bolivia and evolving it as the new Dubai. Following centuries of colonization, globalization and never-ending economic extraction, we have remade the world from the scale of the cell to the tectonic plate. Urban development has forever changed the composition of the atmosphere, the oceans and the earth. 
There is no city and country anymore, no nature or technology. Instead, we have engineered a continuous urban construct that stretches across the entirety of the earth. It is an unevenly distributed megastructure that hides in plain sight. It wasn't master planned by a single imperial power or a cyberpunk mega corporation. It was slowly stitched together from stolen lands by planetary logistics, where landscapes have become resource fields, countries have become factory floors, the countryside has become industrialized agriculture, and the oceans have become conveyor belts. less travel we now visit another kind of planet city. In this city we are radically reversing this endless sprawl. Set against the consistent failure of nation states to act in any meaningful way against climate change. Planet City emerges from a global citizen consensus, a voluntary and multi-generational retreat from the world we once knew. A deafening roar sometimes begins with just the softest whisper. hyperdense metropolis housing the entire population of the earth where 10 billion people would surrender the rest of the planet to a global wilderness and the return of stolen lands to build our new city we mined the old ones rather than virgin ground we dismantled the fabric of our lives to recast them in new constellations. The world's shipping fleet that used to scatter matter ripped from the earth across the storefronts of global streets has now been reversed to bring the material back together again as scenes of planetary culture and architecture performed through the geological strata of the sea. Sheer cliff walls now mark the edge of our new, concentrated city, and everything beyond is rewilding in our wake. The invisible lines that once divided up the world have faded beneath the trees. Planet City is after geography, beyond jurisdiction. The ghosts of nation-states give way to neighborhoods formed around shared cultural practices as we perform new stories and myths of care, belonging, and recreation. Before dawn, thousands of autonomous cleaning blades squeak along the solar fields. Waves of mirrors ripple as they rotate to chase the changing light. 
a billion panels collected from all over the world. The batteries of Planet City are alive with fish and algae as excess wind and solar power pumps water through the canals to high altitude holding lakes in the city's upper floors. When needed, the dams open and turbines turn. Tides rise and fall as lights glow. Televisions blare and hard drives spin. In the lower reaches, nature hums and crackles with the sound of flickering LEDs. It's a sunrise over a new kind of wild. This is a fiction shaped like a city, both utopian and dystopian at the same time, simultaneously an extraordinary image of tomorrow and an urgent examination of the environmental questions that are facing us today. And now we measure our age in apocalypses. When the dystopias of science fiction were previously read as speculative cautionary tales and now the stage sets of the everyday, as we live out our lives in a disaster film playing in real time. The future is broken, and we are left stranded in the long now, doom scrolling idly, waiting for the end of the end of the world. In this context, the utopian urban dreaming of science fiction can seem decidedly naive. Such optimism requires us to ignore all the evidence at hand. Such visions typically reinforce the assumptions of industrialization. The density is dirty and congested, always a tragic encounter removed from the natural life in the idyllic countryside. If it is not the colonialist dystopian skylines of cyberpunk, then we either retreat into a western-centric pastoral nostalgia or a gleaming techno-fetishism. Normally when we talk about the future in film, we see images like this one from Minota Report, Blade Runner, Ghost in the Shell, and everything where the city is filled with the digital confetti of our desired world projected just for us. This is the city that the future promises us. But in our worlds less travelled, we visit the renderlands. These are the data farms and outsourcing shops where our digital imaginaries are actually produced. Here in India, a massive anonymous workforce breathes life into the high-fidelity digital architectures of developer renderings, video games, and Hollywood blockbusters. We meet Prakash, a render farm worker who has fallen in love with the digital model of a beautiful Hollywood actress after spending his 14 hours a day endlessly rotoscoping, rendering and compositing her into blockbuster films. By night, when the fluorescents are switched off and everyone else has gone home, he straps on his VR goggles and they walk hand in hand through the streets of a city that he's collaged together for them from scavenged VFX movie models and the leftover 3D assets that remain on Indian studio hard drives after a project is cancelled. Our future is a utopia that exists in the thickness of a screen. In reality, we live out our lives in a virtual city that stretches from Los Angeles to Bangalore. It's a world of outsourced, pixel-projected dreams. The worlds less travelled that lie behind the clicks and swipes are vast and sprawling. Through the aisles of everything, we're promised automated ease and a sky that is dense with intelligent things. The drones will become as ubiquitous as pigeons. Our packages rain down in an Amazon hailstorm. They will deliver our pizzas. They will walk all of our dogs. Set in the world's less travelled is our film in the robot skies. The first narrative film shot entirely through pre-programmed drones. 
this story, a flock of drones are used to monitor our behaviour from above, tracking our every move. They control the wayward youth of a London council estate. And we watch as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone. And like kids in an old-fashioned classroom, she scribbles notes on the drones and sends it back and forth to her boyfriend, trapped under surveillance in the tower opposite. near-future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teenagers might fall in love. Another drone, armed with a dildo, disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. Another zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. We are being sold a future of smart gadgets, of living objects that listen, watch, and talk back. In this bizarre Samsung commercial, a smart home creepily brings back to life a woman's dead husband. What are the most appropriate means through which we can have an interaction with a home? Or a warehouse filled with a million objects? Or a city? Set in the world's less travelled is our short film Soul City Machine. And we hear the voice of a real chatbot that we've trained on city data sets and urban management protocols. It's an autonomous city of machines where the sky is filled with drones, its cars are driverless, the street is draped in augmented reality and everyone is connected to everything. I'm Seoul. I'm happy to I'm a I'm Our future worlds are typically presented to us through the rhetoric of efficiency and problem solving through technology, and they're marketed to us through cute icons and graphics of the smart city. The management of the city that was once publicly elected is now outsourced to proprietary software systems and public services has disappeared into the fog of the cloud. Are we a customer or a citizen in this future world? We are endlessly scanned by countless sensors, lasers, cameras and satellites feeding the city operating system. This, for example, is how certain models of driverless cars see and understand the city as these 3D point clouds.
These are scenes from a science fiction film we have made called Where the City Can't See. One of the first narrative films shot entirely using this same laser scanning technology. Across a single night, a group of young factory workers drift through the future smart city in a driverless taxi. They are part of an underground rave community that work on the production lines by day, but at night they adorn themselves in machine vision camouflage textiles and the masks of anti-facial recognition makeup, and they dance in the hidden spaces of the city. They hack the city, and their iridescent clothes reflect the light of CCTV laser scanners to create exuberant glitches, distortions, and disturbances in the data set, all the while searching for the wilds that lie beyond the machines. These are all stories that we describe as productive dystopias. Stories that we think are critical in visualizing a future that is complex and nuanced. The future does not rush over us like water. It is something we all must actively shape and define, and these types of stories can help us to start asking more questions of the technologies that are going to define our lives, spaces, and cities. But ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology, and that is one of the roles of the world builder, to prototype the cultural implications of all possible worlds. And now we have you with us, Liam. Welcome to the Swedish Architecture Dagarna. We can't hear you. Can you? Are you with us, Liam? I'm here. Can you hear me? Fantastic. We hear you really well. Hi. So I'm here in the studio together with two guests, um, Eva Westermark and and Christian Pag, and they have some questions for you. First of all, Eva, would you like to start? Yes, hi Liam. I, I hear you just woke up in, in the middle of the night. It's 4 a.m. here. I'm actually still up. Uh, I took the opportunity <laughs> okay. to, to, to keep on working through the night, so I'm going to go to bed after this. Um, I'm, I'm happy you, you're taking the effort. But um, So we just saw your film, World Less Traveled, um, and I'm fascinated by the way you sort of criticize or um, the way you treat um, uh, Elon Musk uh, trying to paint this bright future uh, and also a simplified future. And I'm thinking that that's a way to maybe think that we can bring people along <laughs> to create change. Um, but then you paint a completely different future in your films. So my question is really how would you, how would you like your work to affect other people working with cities with architecture what are your hopes that your film with will, will uh, achieve yeah i mean i guess what we're trying to do with our work is talk about uh complexity really uh, you know the future is not utopian or dystopian it's uh, inevitably going to e be equal parts of both um and both you know dystopian views of of, of the cities to come as well as like just wildly unbelievable utopian vistas uh, are, are equally unproductive. Um, so what we're trying to do is just think about ways that we can enact kind of hopeful and preferable futures. And the idea with our work is to try and talk about all the sorts of different narratives that might start to play out when we engage with emerging technologies. You know, if the future is this sort of unknown landscape unrolling in front of us, then speculative projects, um, the world's less traveled, um, uh, the act of the speculative architect is a process of shining a torchlight onto that landscape. You know, every project is a beam of light that illuminates the ground before us. And the more projects like this, the more narratives, the more stories about our future we can tell, positive or negative, aspirational or cautionary tales, the more of that territory gets illuminated. And the easier it is then to start to map a course through it and to start to you know, 
plan and idea about where we want to get to. Um, so really, it's a call to arms to for all of us to collectively and actively imagine what our futures could be and the futures that we want to have, um, not as an act of prediction, but uh, as a process of um, trying to you know, scaffold the sorts of decisions that we need to make today in order to get there. So do you, do you think that we can steer the digital um, future uh, in order to make us more human, more inclusive? Um, yeah, I don't know if more human is, is something that is necessary. Like I, I, I think that, that suggests that, that the digital is dehumanizing ourselves, which I, I, I wouldn't subscribe to. Um, but certainly uh, what we're seeing is that a lot of the technologies that have come into our world have been um, very good at uh, um, polarizing us. Um, you know, the, you know, I have aspirations that um, the ubiquitous network can allow us to act collectively at scales never before possible. You know, we, we, we saw that happen with things like the global climate strike or the Global Climate March or the Women's March. You know, these are gatherings of people in urban spaces of scales never before seen. And they've been enabled through a network, through a hashtag, through a Facebook page. And that's extraordinary and to think that beyond the, the, the structures of nation states, people can organize themselves um, at a scale that may be able to tackle some of the problems of scales that we face today. At the same time, that network can be used to elect an idiot in the US. Um, it can be used to spread total lies and untruths about vaccinations. Um, and as we're seeing in, in America, the country where I'm currently based, um, it, it, it is used to, to do the absolute opposite of bringing us together and polarize us. So um, uh, I do think that you know, there is hope for our digital futures. Uh, the the critique of Musk and, and people like him is just to say that it's not simple, that, that we don't need a new technology to, to dig us out of the holes that we've created for ourselves. The, the, the front line of our future and the front line of climate change is a cultural debate. Um, and what we need to understand is that these technologies are just extensions of ourselves. Um, therefore, they're, they're equal parts fear and wonder because so are we. So they just kind of, they exaggerate the problems that exist rather than solve problems. So I guess what I'm trying to argue for is, um, you know, uh, thinking about how these technologies can actually um, uh, reinforce the best of us. Okay, great. Christian. Nice to meet you, Liam, and uh, thank you for a really uh, beautiful and strange and captivating uh, movie. Uh, many things to, to, uh, to discuss. Um, I think the whole, also the title, uh, World's Less Traveled, and I think this kind of interest that you uh, demonstrate for the, the, let's say, the backstage of the slick, uh, seamless future that Elon Musk and others kind of pretend that is a, you know, uh, possible and maybe is possible to some extent, at least in Oslo where I'm based. It's kind of, let's say, the, the whole kind of, uh, yeah, the backstage where things are actually being produced and the supply chains and the, you know, the uh, ships and, you know, the, the sort of infrastructure behind the scenes. I think it's really great you kind of bring that to life. And, and, and I, I think in a sense that's really missing in many of the main narratives we are we're talking about in like this kind of like bubble of western uh, you know uh, talks about urbanity for example and uh, street life etc that i work with <laughs> so for, for, thumbs up for that and i think it's it's um, in terms of let's say placemaking or urban planning i think it's uh, probably one of the next big things to actually discuss the the places of that's not the the first places that we tend to discuss a lot now, I want to dive into a passion of mine, which is then, which you also suggest in your uh, answer to Ava's question here is like, so where do we, where do we do, uh, where do we do uh, with our aspirations, our hopes, so to say, how do we, how do we act? Um, and you present these kind of dystopian, but also open-ended uh, questions in your, in your film. 
And I wonder, and this might be a question of scale, actually. So I'm, I'm obsessing increasing, increasingly with, with neighborhoods or, or, let's say, a scale between uh, whatever, 10,000 people on Facebook and, uh, and just me, a Christian, at home. Or what is like the, a medium scale or a neighborhood scale or, or the scale of, a, of a operational bureaucracy in a, in a city, for example. And I, I tend to see that in all these kind of predictions of the future, it's, it's, it's me alone in something that resembles a, a scene from Blade Runner, right? It's this kind of atomized view. And, and I, I personally, <laughs> if I put my hopes any, anywhere, it, it is in this kind of, let's say, semi-local, maybe not necessarily related to place, but somehow a, a tribal or medium-scaled sense of pos possible action. So maybe that was a little bit long-haired question, but that, that makes sense to you, uh, Liam? Yeah, yeah, let me riff on that. Um, uh, and I, I understand what you, what you are getting at when you introduce the idea of the local. Um, I think, though, in architecture and urban terms, often the local is an alibi. It's, um, it's a mythology for something that's decidedly impossible and doesn't exist anymore. Um, I mean, I, I think we, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, in, and it's great that you introduced this question of scale, because I think we all are operating at a planetary scale, whether we think we do or not. Um, the thing is that even the smallest thing that we do, the the smallest thing that we buy or make, you know, sets in motion this extraordinary planetary supply chains. Um, we have urbanized the Earth from the scale of the cell to the tectonic plate. Um, and even though we, you know, we might look at a site of wilderness or some forest or some empty landscape and think of it as being natural or empty, it is still a function of the urban, or it in turn produces the urban. Um, uh, and I think any any idea that we can still in this day and age act locally um, is really problematic. I think what we need to get really good at is understanding the complex web of connections that we all find ourselves nested within, and we need to design that as a project. Um, so, you know, if, if to work on the medium scale we actually need to work on the planetary scale at the same time. Um, and, and the very notion of scales is, is, is kind of, um, I don't know, being in, put into question, I would hope, by the sorts of imagery and, and um, uh, you know, supply chains that I'm talking about. Because really what we're trying to say is that just decisions you might make at the scale of a, of a phone, at the scale of your pocket, um, are actually uh, decisions that echo at the scale of a landscape or at the scale of a, a city um, or at the scale of a nation. Um, so we, we're in this position where, you know, product design and urban design have actually collapsed together and have become almost the same thing because in, they, they, they have the same kind of consequences. So. To design, I guess what we need to do is reimagine and question this idea of site, even at the medium scale, even at the local scale. Architects are used to, you know, taking a site, an empty plot of land, um, and looking at its edges, maybe understanding the, the wind paths and the sun paths that flow through it and around it and the circulation um, that moves through it, um, and, and to make a project. And I guess this is a call to arms to say, you know, we need to rethink that idea of sight and we need to start to understand the supply chains of the materials that we specify. Um, they're a part of the site that we need to be considering as well. Um, and, and make choices that might play out on this very local site. But those choices might be designed and, and made in order to affect something that happens across the other side of the world. Um, so to see what we do and to expand the remit of an architect or an urbanist to, in, to include these planetary relationships, um, I think is really important because ultimately you know, that's what's already happening. We're just unwittingly doing it. Um, so we need to be you know, redesigning this new notion of site. Thanks a lot, um, Liam. I, I, I totally buy into your, let's say, more holistic uh, and planet-centered uh, vision of what an architectural practice should be. 
And I guess at another point we can discuss more whether it still makes sense to to reconnect with wherever you are located because you still have this kind of physical place where your kid can or cannot play. Or, and I guess my my feeling is that if we uh, only operate, let's say, on this planetary individual level, we kind of also lose a sense of agency. And I think maybe that's the last thing we can allow ourselves to use to lose is a sense of agency. And that's what I feel with the experience of climate change, for example, is that people just feel that this is just just too much. You know, I'm just gonna go on Facebook. You know, it's just so this kind of a how to get a, a, a possibility of action. But um, it was really nice meeting you. Thanks for a great uh, conversation and a really good movie. Uh, I hope you'll keep in touch. And, yeah, uh, that does it. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, and and a, a brief question before we let you go, Liam. Um, you work, you teach, you work with students at SciArc. You work with the, the ideas of possible futures and scenario building. Uh, in terms of teaching and the next generation of architects who are coming out into the professional world, I'm thinking, what what is your take? What is the situation now? If you look historically, architects have been producing visions or uh, dystopian images of where we're going. What is that professional situation like now, and where do you think we are heading? Yeah, so I, I run a master's program at SIAC called um, Fiction Entertainment. And what we do is is we create a space where people with various design backgrounds, you know, landscape architects, architects, urban designers, product designers, graphic designers, and so on, um, and they spend a year with us in order to transition their practice into um, spaces of the entertainment industry and popular media to, to kind of become world builders and storytellers. And I guess that's to say that you know, the, the, the world still certainly has a place for the traditional architect, um, but the scope and the remit that uh, and, and the sphere of influence that, that an architect once has, has radically shifted across the last generation. Um, the forces that shape cities are no longer the domain of such architects and designers. Um, uh, it's now about software engineers and AI governance. It's, it's, it's um, uh, network engineers and um, uh, politicians and mobile technologies. And, you know, the, the idea that our urban experience was once shaped by um, the physical fabric of, of buildings and the physical um, scales and, and infrastructure of public space has radically shifted with the public spaces of social media and so on. Um, so if architects are to continue to remain relevant, and to not disappear into a boutique craft industry for the rich, then we need to find new ways of operating as a discipline, as a profession um, that engages with the, yeah, the new forms that actually define our experiences. Um, so yeah. we oh, uh, support students moving into, um, you know, uh, working in popular media because they can encode within those mediums um, critical ideas about our urban futures. Um, and they can reach audiences at, at a scale that um, traditional architects could only dream of. Um, you know, if we um, have published many architecture books in my time and, you know, a good print run for an architecture book is maybe 3,000 copies, you know, most are 1,000 copies at best. Um, I can make a music video, uh, our most recent music video is on YouTube, I think has more than 10 million views. Um, uh, both the book and the music video, I would say, have been encoded with um, what I think are important ideas about what our future city might look like. Um, but the reach I have by moving outside of the architect uh, and the architecture discipline in a traditional sense um, uh, enables me to just to connect to a much wider audience. And ultimately, it's that scale of audience that's that is critical in shaping our futures. It's not just going to happen in dark lecture halls with architects talking to other architects. It's not just going to. It's not going to happen <laughs> in boutique art and architecture bookshops. Um, uh, you know, we need to bring so many people along with us on this journey, and that's kind of what I think the profession needs to get better at: um, is not to be content to be niche, 
to scream into the void or the echo chamber, um, to pat ourselves on the back. We need to find forms of practice that are about engaging with the world as it is now and engaging with audiences um, outside of our own uh, bubbles. That's great. Thank you, Liam. I think that concludes very well after your, your fantastic presentation. Thank you for taking the time in the middle of the night to be with us. Thank you, Liam. Uh, a pleasure. A pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I wish uh, maybe next year we can all uh, be in the same room together again. Och nu är det Eva Westermark, partner på GL Architects i Köpenhamn och också deltagare i vår panel idag som ska hålla sin presentation på temat Urban Design and Global Challenges. Eva Westermark is a partner and director at GL Architects in Copenhagen with 20 years of international experience as an architect and urban designer. At GL she works with the vision of making cities for people and Eva takes a holistic view of urban planning. At the core of her work is a strong focus on public spaces and public life as vital keys to solving global challenges, as well as increasing quality of life in cities. And she will now speak about urban design and global challenges. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, yeah, so today I will be speaking about how we can address these global challenges through having a specific focus on people and how we can use urban design to shift and invite for new human behavior to live healthier and more sustainable lifestyles. And uh, I'm thinking now we have just seen Liam Young's uh, amazing film and what I'm going to talk about is probably on the very, very other side of the spectrum. Um, because this is more about the everyday life, the everyday spaces, um, the existing neighborhoods that we all live in, trying to find local solutions to these global challenges. And we just had a long discussion about scale, and I would really like to come back to that because I think scale is, is a very interesting topic when we talk about the global. But I work um, in Copenhagen, uh, the Gales office there. We also have an office in New York and in San Francisco. And we work uh, across uh, the world trying to understand better how the physical environment affects people's behavior and affects people's uh, quality of life. And uh, one thing that we have learned is that people really respond well to invitations from the physical environment. And of course, this presents us with a challenge, um, but also an opportunity that we can use spaces, we can use physical interventions and urban design to help people live healthier lives and more sustainable lifestyles. Because we're not only facing a climate crisis, we also see that they, we have a crisis, a health crisis. Uh, with increasing number of lifestyle-related diseases like diabetes and obesity. And in order to solve these global challenges, I think we need to address both at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and we know uh, if we talk about health, that cities really affects how we choose to move uh, around. And that this, of course, has a great impact on individual health. Today, we can see that there's even as much as 5 million annual deaths per year um, associated to inactivity, physical inactivity. And to give an example of a concrete example of how urban design has really shifted uh, human behavior, we can look at Copenhagen. And for the last 40 years, Copenhagen has developed this system of bicycle lanes and bicycle infrastructure and along that transformation of the physical space we have also seen a growth of a strong bicycle culture people are changing behavior according to change of physical space and and today 63 percent of copenhageners 
bicycle to and from work or education, which is a massive impact both on people's health, but also, of course, reducing the carbon footprint. And uh, this case, Copenhagen, um, I think that one of the learnings we should bring with us from, from this example is that when we ask people today why they bicycle, they, very few people say they do it because they want to save the planet or that they do it because they want to be healthier. They just do it because it's the most simplest, quickest and most comfortable way to move around. So here we have a change of behavior that is completely integrated with the everyday life. People do not have to make a conscious choice of making the world better. It just happens by itself. And another really important thing that we have to be aware of, um, whoever we are, uh, whoever we are working with uh, design solutions uh, and physical space, is the health inequality uh, of people. We know that today health is a really important indicator to, um, to be able to define if a community, a city, a country is socially resilient or socially sustainable, and especially looking at the inequality of health. And as the Marmot Commission so wisely put, that we have to close this gap in a generation in order to address our global challenges. And today, with there are so many good solutions, there are so many good initiatives that we can we can uh, use if we're interested and if we have the capabilities of of changing our lifestyles. But in order to really address these global challenges, I think that everyone needs to be part of the solution. And, and from my um, experience, that's also bringing in the everyday as part of the solution. So going back to the example of Copenhagen, just making it the most natural uh, choice to, be, to live a more healthy and more sustainable lifestyle. So addressing this, questions at Gill, we have uh, a focus on three things. Um, one is to use technology to speed up our learnings and understanding of this relationship between the physical environment and people's behavior. And we can also use new technology to really expand the engagement with people, communities, global or local, and to have a really strong focus on partnership uh, with other fields in order to innovate and find new solutions. And interestingly enough, we, we brought up the question about the neighborhood because we have to have a very strong focus on who we're, we're designing for, but also where we are working. Um, and from our experience, the neighborhood is really crucial in order to, I would say that the neighborhood is where these complex systems actually meet the everyday life, meet people in their daily routines. And that's where we can actually test out some new, new solutions on the local scale. So finding these local uh, solutions, but addressing the global challenges and also bridging this gap. So not only thinking about the individual behavioral change or the policy level on city scale and natural scale, but, but actually bridging and coming close to people to where they are, meeting them at eye level and bringing them part of the solution. So the third uh, thing that, uh, that we have a focus on is how we can implement a learning way, um, implement uh, new solutions as quick and simple as possible in order to actually have some uh, impact as soon as possible. But then thinking of these local initiatives, how we can scale them up and what it is that we should scale up. Maybe it's not the solution, but maybe it's a process, maybe it's a methodology. But of course, we have to scale it up in order to have more impact. So I would like to give you some project examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. So the first one um, is a project where we have uh, in Copenhagen, where we have been uh, trying to add air quality as a theme to urban planning. Uh, and then this project, we also addressed the most vulnerable, uh, which being the small children, because they are so much more affected by air pollution than we as adults. 
And this is a project where we collaborated across different fields. So we had Google Airview together with Utrecht University and Copenhagen Solution Lab measuring air quality locally in Copenhagen. So this car was driving around in the city uh, really on a, on a very local level, finding huge differences between these ultrafine particles and carbon uh, and black carbon. And then we looked at the use of the city. So where are small children actually spending time? Where are they moving and when are they there? And when we pair these two informations um, on top of each other, we can actually see and target our initiatives to where we think that they have the most impact. So some places small children were present and we also had high levels of uh, pollution. But in other places, we saw that there was better air quality where we could actually use uh, urban design initiatives to invite people to spend longer time. So that having this tool, pairing up physical uh, situation with the use of the city, we were able to be much more targeted in our design uh, propositions. So as an example, we have Istegade. Um, this is the place where we find this combination of higher um, pollution rates and a lot of young children, toddlers staying. So we wanted to illustrate some physical changes that could help to reduce the exposure in this local context to the people being present there. So introducing a green buffer, uh, removing parking, working with traffic calming initiatives, and also inviting people to, to be a little bit further away from the sources of emission. And this is, of course, important to to think if we work on a neighborhood scale, we have to be super aware that we're not just moving the problem elsewhere. Um, so that easy solution would be to just cut off traffic from this street, but then of course we wouldn't solve the problem. So this is an example of how we can think of initiatives at the local level, try it out, learning what the actual impact is, by measuring before and after, and then seeing if we can scale it up and doing it while we're waiting for the whole um, car fleet to become electrified, for instance. We developed some design principles uh, on a more strategic level that we want to test now in real life. And we just put up the first physical prototype uh, in another place now in Copenhagen in Örestad where we saw that the bus stop had high level of pollution and people were also spending a lot of time. So now we have uh, introduced an alternative waiting place where people can both be protected from pollution, but also addressing some of the local issues at this place where wind is really hauling down and there's no attractive places to sit or meet. So trying to have a lot of wins with every initiative that we do. And now we're going to measure and see how people are using it, but also how it, if this is an effective way and if we can scale it up. So the other project that I want to, um, to talk about uh, is how we have worked with food in cities. So the same way as we can invite for a different use in the city by changing the physical environment, can we also um, make people eat healthier by changing the city uh, physics? So in London, uh, we can see that we have some pressing challenges with increasing childhood obesity and also that the gap between the most wealthy areas and the most deprived areas is just increasing. So we were working in South London where uh, childhood obesity uh, age between 10 and 12, it's over 50%. And just trying to see, is there a, rela a relationship with the city and the physical space and uh, the food choices that these uh, young people make? And we found by interviews and observations, both of the physical spaces and, and how people live their lives, that there was not really about food, the choices that young people made. It was about being social. And because the way the world looks now, and especially in this neighborhood, there were very few places where they could go. So they were actually sitting and spending time at the bus stops. And what was interesting was that we could see that fast food, 
followed transit lines. So McDonald's was really very smartly placing themselves really close to the bus stop. So we had this, what we call the Bermuda Triangle of Health. So people were, uh, young people were spending a lot of time at the bus stop because that's how they moved around, meeting friends and then using McDonald's as their meeting place. And when we know this, when we know how the physical space and the city, the system of the city actually influence what we eat, then we can start working with it. So we're trying now to find a way to change the foodscape, which is basically initiatives that uh, combine public life, public space and food options in the city. In Copenhagen, when we addressed this topic, we added another layer. We said that, is it possible to change and work with the physical environment and not only increase people's health, but also meet Copenhagen's sustainability targets by shifting urban diets? Because we can see that it's not only affecting people's health. We know the food is industry actually has is it one third um, uh, taking up one third of all the carbon emissions. So if we can change this, the food production through the behavior of people, we can also make significant changes to the carbon footprint. So in Copenhagen, we worked with two schools, one in Vesterbro and one in Nørrebro, uh, and schools that were in close proximity to um, supermarkets. And we found that the kids, uh, and the, these were children or youth, sorry, um, between 12 and 14, uh, 12 and 17, which is also the age where we know that the new behavior is easiest adopted. So we saw that they were like going back and forth to the supermarket on a daily basis, not because they were hungry uh, at all times, but because that's an environment, a physical environment that they were seeking. They wanted to have a comfortable place where they can meet and chat. Um, so thinking about the possibility of ad giving these uh, young children or youth, um, young people, an opportunity to have the same uh, qualities in another place and, and at the same time addressing and giving options of eating a different way. Um, so what we did was that we prototype a public space on the route to the supermarkets where these qualities um, that they were asking for was present. So we could see that people were really using the space. And since we knew when the, the young people were there, we could also make sure to offer different food options. So having a food truck that did not only serve healthy food, but a planetary diet. Uh, so that it was a sustainable food option. We also partnered up with uh, the supermarket so they could change their food offerings to make it easier, accessible, the more healthy options. And this, um, this installation, this local prototype, uh, if we looked at the use of it and calculated um, if this would stay for a year, we could we could basically say that it could save up to over 1,000 tons of CO2. Um, over 45% of the youth, ac youth actually ate these meals. And what does that mean? Uh, 1,260 tons, uh, does it matter? Well, this is how we have to think of these local initiatives and prototypes, is that what if we could scale it up? Could we put this into a system? So what if we had a thousand schools uh, and, and, and prototyping around uh, Denmark, then we could actually see a reduction of between 8 to 20% of Denmark's agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. And suddenly we have impact. If, but if we can start small and then scale up. So the last project uh, I would like to uh, talk about as an example of this scaling up is a project in New York that uh, I was a part of, which was about shifting mobility habits, uh, inviting for new mobility behavior, but also giving more equal access to open space. And I think uh, a lot of people maybe have visited the place. This was a project that started 2008, where we introduced new metrics that was 
human beings. Uh, the city didn't actually have any data on who was using their spaces and who was walking on the street. We could illustrate that on Times Square, um, even though 90% of the space was allocated for car, uh, the use was 90% pedestrians and people. And um, in this case, closing off Broadway, making it pedestrian, that wasn't the big news. I mean, this has been around these thoughts since the 60s. 60s. The big thing was how we could overcome the barriers of change. So using the temporar temporary project um, in order to say that, well, let's try this. And if it doesn't work, we can actually go back. Within 48 hours, everything could reverse into the way it was. And because it was temporary and we had measured before, we could also illustrate and see the impact these physical changes had on people's behavior. Um, and we could see it, but we could also produce some information and data, more people, people walking and biking and less injuries for pedestrians and people actually enjoying the space. We could also, because it was temporary, adjust and refine because it was far from perfect. It was a lot of conflict between pedestrians and bicyclists, for instance. But then we can see the human behavior. We could adapt the physical environment in order to invite another behavior to solve these issues. So scaling up. The Broadway and Times Square project was never intended to be the only project. It was intended to be this catalyst project for more change. So the Department of Transportation um, that we worked for, they created this New York City Plaza program. So basically saying that we, they said, we will fund a limited amount of plazas, interim, interim plazas in all of New York, um, but um, encouraging NGOs and local communities to apply for this funding. And by implying and receiving the funds, they also committed to maintain and operate the plazas, private partnerships. And, and this, during the last seven years, we, can, we actually can see 17 new plazas being created. And now the effect is visible on a city scale level in terms of new mobility behavior, but also uh, a new social infrastructure. Um, we were able to uh, analyze the social impact that these plazas have, not only the mobility impact, and we could, for instance, as an example, see that over 75% of the people that use these plazas, they responded that they had, since the plaza opened, they have known new people and they, have, they recognized new people in their neighborhoods. So now we had a situation where these could also act on the social sustainability um, scale and, and improve the city. So this was my uh, last example. I'm <coughs> hoping that these cases will illustrate that we as designers, whether we are engineers or planners or architects, that we do not only address the climate issues when we do our design solutions, we can also invite for new behavior and, and really improve the quality of life for people. Thank you, Eva. And now we will switch to Swedish for a brief Q&A with you, Eva. Uh, och jag börjar då på svenska att, uh, att fråga lite kort. Jag funderar på det här du säger med att skala upp, men också att testa saker. Handlar det om att skala upp eller handlar det om att inspirera andra? Alltså är det samma process eller är det andra som tar över och gör sin version? Eller vad, vad tror du? Så jag tror att om man verkligen ska få effekt så måste man skala upp. Med ett, man måste sätta det i ett system. <laughs> För det är klart att det kan inspirera, men om man tittar på den här Plaza Program till exempel, så, så var det ju liksom själva programmet som initierade att de här platserna blev till. Det hade ju aldrig hänt om man bara hade inspirerats. Sen finns det ju andra städer som kanske har inspirerats av både pilotprojektet på Broadway för att det blev väldigt liksom globalt synligt. Men förhoppningsvis också att man kan då ta metoden eh, som man då har utvecklat i det här Plaza Program och applicera på en ny stad eh, och i en ny kontext. Men själva liksom resultaten blir ju annorlunda då. Jag tror vi ska vara försiktiga med att skalera upp 
en färdig form eller liksom en, ett, ett projekt utan mer titta på vilka metoder kan vi återanvända och hur kan de appliceras på en ny kontext i ett nytt system. Mm. Jättebra. Christian, du har en fråga vet jag. Tusen tack Eva. Jag är ju meget kendt med og glad for Agils arbejde i almindelighed og, og, og jeres interesse for, for nabolag og øh, byens processer i, i særdeleshed. Så tak for det, og det er jo spændende, at I har fået det her øget fokus på, øh, på fysisk aktivitet og, og egentlig sundhed, som også, jeg synes, giver, giver vildt god mening. Et, et sted, jeg er nysgerrig. Det handler om øh, det, I berørte så vidt med, med McDonalds-eksemplet her. Altså, at du har øh, en by, som i stigende grad, eller øh, ja, i hvert fald også i dag, er, er styret af, af kommersielle interesser, som gerne vil sælge os alt muligt, øh, og man kan diskutere, hvor meget det, vi har brug for. Men i hvert fald sag, et faktum, at når man snakker om nabolag, og det, som øh, offentligheden ofte tager ansvar for, det er udrum. Men rigtig meget af byens liv sker jo netop, som du også viser, inde på McDonald's eller inde på et supermarkedets private område. Og jeg har en tanke om, at hvis vi skal have gode byer, hvor vi ikke bare er konsumenter og forbrugere og øh, ligesom kaster i os kaffe og kører ind burger, så har vi brug for, at vi som nabolag eller som by eller der som samfund skal kunne tænke over fælles steder, som også er indenfor. Og der har man jo måske traditionelt et bibliotek for eksempel, eller en kirke, men den har også en særlig tone. Men det ikke, om I har nogen tanker om det her med programmeringen af fællesskabssteder, eller det at, at skabe den type aktivitet, der I viser så fint udenfor. Men altså, hvor, hvor er ansvaret for at, at tænke de der fællesskabssteder måske også indenfor, eller er det er det hinsides uh, gels eller en, en arkitekts opgave? Nej, men jeg tror, at det er, jo, det er det der, at det måske bliver allas ansvar at hitta fælles løsninger. Problemet er, at vi, det er inte bara i kommuner som man er liksom i silos, där man tittar på olika aspekter och har olika ansvar, vilket gör att det är jättesvårt att få ihop byn um, och, och hitta de där lösningarna där man vinner på flera olika plan. Och precis som det du beskriver så... Det, Ja, men McDonalds måste också vara med på den här resan och göra förändringar. Precis som byn som kanske äger gatan utanför eller trottoaren utanför. Eh, Transport of London som har ansvar för själva buss och platsen. Vi måste ju hitta sätt där vi kan samarbeta om det där ansvaret och hitta gemensamma lösningar. Och det som jag upplever att den här skalan, eh, grannskapsskalan kan ge, det är att Geografiskt så samsas man då om vissa platser och alla har intresse av den geografin eller den fysiska situationen så borde det kunna vara med till att skapa incitament för alla olika parter att faktiskt ta ansvar, hoppas jag. Jag har en fråga till till dig, för just det här du pratar om med komplexiteten då när ni tittar på till exempel luftkvalitet och, och unga barn till exempel den. Är det, är det här då projekt som ni har initierat själva från, från GEL eller är det uppdrag ni har fått? För jag tänker det är lite mer än ett vanligt uppdrag. Ja, precis hur det projektet kom till det vet jag inte. Men, men det vi kan se det är att våra kunder ser mer och mer olika ut. Som nu så jobbar vi mycket mer med foundations eller stiftelser eh, som en part. Men sen är det ju ofta då en ganska brokig samling av olika aktörer. Och det tror jag att vi måste göra för att skapa innovation eller hitta precis. Vi måste ju också vara mer i det där ansvaret att hitta nya lösningar eh, och, och samarbeta. Sen måste man ju säga att, att det kräver ju mer av alla parter. Det tar längre tid. Eh, alla har olika intressen och så vidare. Men jag känner ju fortfarande att, att resultatet hade vi aldrig någonsin kunnat uppnå om det hade varit färre parter. Så det tror jag bara är något vi ska vänja oss vid, att den där processen, det är inte projekt, vi jobbar inte med projekt, vi jobbar med process och vi jobbar med system. Och hitta sätt som skapar incitament till att alla bidrar med den tid och den, liksom kliver in i den där komplexiteten som också Liam Yang pratade om, som vi måste adressera och, och liksom inkorporera i det vi gör. Och kanske att man kan säga att att det här med att förankra det i något fysiskt eller i en, ett grannskap, en fysisk plats. 
det ger oss lite trygghet för att världen är så himla stor och kaotiskt och problemen är så otroligt stora. Så jag tror att vi måste liksom balansera det där med att tänka globalt, agera lokalt och känna att det finns kraft i det för att förhålla det här momentet upp. Stort tack Eva. Vi rör oss mellan olika världsdelar den här eftermiddagen och nu ska vi göra ett nedslag i södra Kina. Med oss på länk har vi Barry Wilson. Barry är baserad i Shenzhen, en stad nära Hongkong vid Pärlflodens delta. En region som har utvecklats nästan explosionsartat de senaste 40 åren. Our next speaker, Barry Wilson is an award-winning visionary with 30 years experience across four continents, working as a landscape and urban designer, as well as an expert advisor on sustainable solutions. He was honored in 2012 for outstanding achievements in relation to urbanization in China. Barry is adjunct assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Architecture. He is also Vice President of the Hong Kong Institute of Urban Design, a founding director of Barry Wilson Project in Initiatives, and author of a forthcoming book, Future Proof City, 10 Immediate Paths to Urban Resilience, among other things. Barry, with that, I hand over to you. Thank you, Gunilla. Uh, hello, world. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. I've watched the whole morning session uh, and, uh, and most of the, this afternoon session and I've been so inspired that I've got to, I want to talk about so many other things now apart from uh, what I was going to share today. But what I'm sharing today is all about what's going on here in China. And many of you, of course, haven't been able to travel for a couple of years now. Uh, and I've been stuck here in China. So I'm going to be your overseas correspondent and tell you kind of what's going on. Um, now, as, as Gunilla's hinted there, um, I, uh, this morning we had lots of experts and I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm a generalist. I hesitate to call myself a polymath. A jack of all trades, and I, I've dabbled in this and dabbled in that. So I'm going to give you a kind of overview of all sorts of different aspects. Um, we're going to start big in China, but China is really big, and we're going to end up down in in little Shenzhen, which is where I'm I'm based now. I'm hoping through that you'll get a feel of what's been going on um, this side of the Great China Firewall. Um, and for those of you who have never been, it might give you some, some insight. I know a lot of you have probably actually been working on projects here. Um, and this hopefully will give you an idea of where you might be working in the coming five years. Um, now, a few people have plugged their books today. Uh, you can see my books behind me. And my book, um, I'm not going to, to talk about it now. I'll, I'll hope you'll feel some of the, the passion from that and, and have a look at it at the end. Um, but what what really came to me, um, some of the, the things this morning, was, was Professor Surin. And he was talking about um, needing to preach. And he preached to us. And I, and I felt great emotion from this, the need, this need to preach. And it's something that, that came to me uh, about five or six years ago, that, yes, within our profession, we're often talking to, um, to those that we don't need to talk to. Um, a lot of us here watching today are very conversant with a lot of the ideas that are being shared, but we've got to get our message out bigger. And so how refreshing was it to, to hear about Liam Young showing the power of movies? So I'm, I now feel humbled and, and I need to make a movie rather than a book. But I think this all came from, from Al Gore. And I did a training session with him in Shenzhen when he came in 2016 um, to talk about his climate reality project which was the fact that you know everything was reaching tipping points and everybody was ignoring it um and i tend to think that you know that that florida vote if we'd seen gore in 
in presidency, we'd be living in a, a different world now. Um, but he um, is trying to enable people to go out and preach and share the, the climate experience. And he's been doing that now for you know 10 years. Um, so I've been doing that for five or six years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been going on then during this time. Um, I pressed a slide. There are three areas then we, we're going to focus on. I'm going to bore you a little bit with China's five-year plan. And to me, that sounds sounded boring when I first got involved, you know, but it's, it's more than 25 years I've been operating in China now, and I realize just how important this five-year plan is. We're then going to focus down into some urbanization trends. I'm picking on one in particular that um, actually leads to this idea of Greater Bay Area. And we're talking about the Hong Kong, Macau, Guangdong, Greater Bay Area. We may have a, a look at some others and touch upon them and, and compare. Um, so bear with me, three areas we're going to have a look at. So let's kick off with this idea of the five-year plan. Now, um, I realize that there's a lot of words in there and it's kind of a word cloud, but what I'm trying to do is take you back five years on the left-hand side to the last five-year plan and on the right-hand side go to the coming five-year plan and this really gives us an idea of what the trends have just been and what the likely trends are going to be. Being a planned economy, these five-year plans are fundamental in China. The metrics, the targets, um, you know, they are fundamental in what uh, government and developer and, and everybody has to achieve. Um, so that, let's have a little look at, at just some of those things. From 2016, I would say was the first time that the idea of some sort of concepts of sustainability started to really permeate um, into the mentality of government and development. Um, they had started lots of initiatives, but I have to tell you that you know, China is a place where sustainability and awareness of, of climate issues is extremely low. I think it ranks bottom of the sustainability or the World Gallup poll, I think, on sustainable awareness. So people have no concepts. Um, so the government is really putting concepts out there and then it's very hard for local government or provincial government officers to really understand what some of these things mean. Certainly developers are not thinking about it. They're, they're following the buck. Um, it's been a Con consumption-led development, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, but now what we're seeing is this clear statement of a change from quantity to quality. And really, I, I, I so hope so, because things have been built very fast here and very big. Um, but I'm hoping now that they can be built um, very well as well, um, because we've had a lot of waste. We've had a lot of um, overdevelopment in the wrong place. For instance, it's estimated there are 3.1 billion homes available in China. 3.1 billion. The population is huge, but it's only 1.4 billion. So that means you know, there's more than two houses to every person or two, two apartments, yet we have housing crises. Why is this? Housing in the wrong places because Development has taken place all over China. Every village, every town, every city has created a new town, new village, new development area. Um, and there has been a glut. It's been completely uncoordinated. And I, I'm sure some of you have heard about ghost towns and um, have visited a lot of these developments that have, have been bought, perhaps, but never actually have anybody um, living in them. So we, we've got a poor use of resources. We've got waste of resources. Is this about to change with the new five-year plan? This is kind of what I'm hoping. Um, so a lot of this has been trying to avoid this, this middle income trap that's so typical for developing e economies. And Hence the idea that there's been um, a movement now to higher quality tertiary services that you can start to see about the quality in this five-year plan. I'm scrolling back to some of the things here. So that we're going back five years 
we're looking at the, the awakening of the idea that some things needed protecting in China, be it zones, be it focusing development in certain area, be it protecting floodplains or agricultural resources. These are off my website. These were news stories I picked up five years ago to try and get a feeling on what was going on. Um, but targets were already being set. Renewable energy, as a lot of you know, is actually quite advanced in China. It's a leader in solar. It's a leader in um, wind. However, a lot of those resources at the moment are not where you need them. And, and I think that's what we're going to see in the next five years as smart grids come online and decentralization. Um, so there's a lot of advanced thinking about energy and about recycling and about sustainability, but it's been very disjointed in terms of, of putting all those dots together. Um, this one talks about the fact that we've lost so many um, valuable resources, be they um, agricultural land in particular, because development has happened a lot on, on flat land, developable land, which was also often the best um, agriculture. We've also seen huge um, changes in, in water resources. Lots of dams have been built. There are now lots of obsolete dams. Um, so, so lots of building, lots of consumption, lots of energy, lots of GDP, very little quality development. Um, and really the first inklings of, of this came from the air pollution that happened, uh, became more and more aware in Beijing. Um, and then a, a famous media star brought it up and, and it went kind of viral and people started to be aware of, of air quality um, and the big smogs only recently. So we've come from this, this really um, bad scenario to now seeing things like this 13 year, uh, 14th year plan, giving very strict ideas of pollution free days, um, monitoring and metrics that are agreeable globally, not just in, in China. Um, and, and there's an idea of electric vehicles. So electric taxis were actually starting to be introduced in towns um, you know, a long time ago, from, from 2016. Um, and Shenzhen already has its whole fleet of taxis are electric. So, so things have been happened, but in a very disjointed way. Um, Nature has been sidelined completely. It, it barely came into thinking. Um, let's assume now through our targets and the, the clear uh, driver of this new plan that, that nature and protection and green infrastructure, some things that were being discussed this morning, will become more and more resonant here. So there are three things in this 14 to five year plan that are going to kind of um, control everything, I think, uh, to give you an overview. And particularly those of you that want to work or do business here, this is where we see the future. China believes it is um, going to be the world leader in innovation and digital technology. It's already rolling out um, 5G all across towns and cities. Um, whereas everybody else is still thinking about it, talking about it, um, you know, there's, there's, there's nobody arguing here, it's just happened. Um, so that's happening fast. Um, R&D spending in these technology areas is very, very high and is being changed away from the older industries, the more polluting industries. Um, and it really does, we, we, we know Shenzhen is a the kind of Silicon Valley of the China, but it, it it wants to go further. It wants to be the leader in the world. Um, and you know, who, who's to stop China? Um, we, we'll see, but certainly they, they, this is their target. Now, coupled with that is this important idea of dual circulation. Now, as happens in five-year plans, there's always some new concept. Um, dual circulation is the one we didn't really know what it meant. Effectively, what I think it, it comes together with is this um, global movement towards more nationalism, towards closed borders that we've seen through the COVID epidemic as well, 
um, that China, which has been um, importing and exporting, is now looking again at how it can become more self-sufficient. So for those of you wanting to export to China, I can see that becoming more difficult. For those that want to export your services, your consultancy, that may become more difficult. There's a lot more experience now within design professions and certainly within technology professions that uh, makes China feel strong and it can, can stand on its own. Um, so that may have uh, very interesting implications on supply chains, which was something I think was alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, are we having global supply chains still or are we going to become more local? I mean, it's a big local in China, but it's still local. So this third main concept is the heavy emphasis now on meeting these goals, this particularly this 2060 goal for climate neutrality um, and the short term goals for 2030. Now, I have every confidence that if China says it will meet targets, it will meet targets because it can can make it happen. I think there are concerns about are these targets ambitious enough? Um, this is something happening all over the world, but uh, particularly China, 2060, being such a big polluter consumer, um, what happens here really matters. So um, my, my, my biggest concern is that whilst we can meet these targets, often they're, they're not um, going to be ambitious enough. And a lot of that, again, is because of this low baseline that we're working from for awareness of, of what's going on in the planet, um, what's going on in sustainable issues. There is very much a, a bubble here, not enough going on in schools to educate young people. Um, so I think there is there is every good intention from, from government, but you know it's a it's a big wheel to start rolling. Um, and, and it really needs to start spinning fast. Let's let's hope so. A little a quick little brief about buildings for the architects here. So we have two main areas um, with green building. One is lead, which you're all familiar with. Um, uh, Brianna also here. Um, but the other one is China's own certificate, which is three star, which has been going for a long, long time, actually. I think since about 2006. Um, now, what we've seen was lead trickling along, starting again about this, this 2015, 2016 period. Um, and since then, there really has been a, a good growth in the sector. Where that growth of this kind of green building is, though, is very much in the tier one cities, the, the Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin type cities, the, the big ones with the, the knowledge resource and, and the big bucks. Of course, we've got development of the rest of the billion people. Um, and you know, lead is not something that's really permeated into to those smaller development areas, which are really extensive. Um, here's an idea of some of the buildings that have been going on in Guangzhou um, since that period, Pearl River Tower, which has got wind turbines and chiller beams and photovoltaics on different um, surfaces. I think it's an SOM project and, and fantastic as a kind of experimental building for Guangzhou and really to, to get that message out um, as well. Um, uh, there's a, a cooperation with Singapore buildings, uh, the Sino-Singapore uh, new knowledge city. Um, again, as you'd expect from Singapore, bringing in their ideas of sustainability and how they can build that in. So we're seeing here in Guangzhou, in, in this Pearl River Delta, these, these ideas have been here for a little while. And the same in Shenzhen. Um, things happen very fast here because the city wasn't even here 40 years ago. So, you know, from, from the kind of first building in 2016, now it's almost standard to, um, if, you, if you're a quality developer, to be looking for certification. Um, so at much as we used to have uh, T TVs and then along came color TVs, we had buildings and then we've got green buildings. Now I think we're going to see green buildings um, as standard. We, we have to see green buildings as standard. Um, so what, what can go beyond that. If a green building is now just a standard building, how can we raise the thresholds of, of some of the ambition of, of building is quite interesting to me. Three star has a really, really um, low threshold. I think if you put 
LED bulbs in, in your building, you'll probably get a one star, um, three star rating. Now, it's designed to be that way. It's designed to try and raise awareness, be very low cost, get a, a high threshold of usage and knowledge um, right across the board. Um, I'm not sure it's really getting there. I'm hoping that this is something that the government will really now start to push to the fore with through this new five-year plan. And we can see three-star starting to be rolled out as standard so that every building is a, is a, is a three-star building. Um, and some key buildings like the Amping Tower in Shenzhen, uh, and, uh, Amping Insurance, this is now the tallest building in Shenzhen and one of the tallest in the world. You know, they chose a three-star rating. I think that's a very good way of them preaching also about um, the access to these kind of sustainability certifications. So that's a little bit about general trends. Uh, I'll, I'll focus in now on one particular urbanization trend that I think is critical behind all of this. Um, and that is, of course, we've got population explosion generally, but not in China. We've got population stagnation. We're about to reach the peak, and then there is a panic about depopulation, which we've seen in Japan, we're seeing in Korea, we've seen in Europe. Um, we have trouble from the legacy of the one child policy and China now actually has a three child policy to try and reverse that. But it's, it's not being considered very seriously at this stage, um, whether it ever will be. Along with that has been this huge change from urbanization, from rural population, which was something like 50% in 2010, to 70%, which is standard with most you know, Western urbanized countries. Um, and they want to do that by 2025. That has meant moving 300 million people, 300 million people from rural economies with rural skills, rural knowledge um, to the cities. And what do you do with these people when they arrive in the cities? 300 million. Um, not surprisingly, there were talks about density. So China's cities are generally dense. They have to be. Um, but are there also opportunities? And there certainly has been huge discussions about the opportunities and benefits of dense development and how you can take these migrant labor forces and um, enhance city services. Now, this isn't just a China issue, actually. This is a global issue because you know, we're at seven or eight billion people at the moment. We're talking about 10 billion people very soon, 20, 30 years, um, if, if the planet stays in one piece. But where are those people going to be? They're going to be in Asia. They're going to be in Africa. You know, the European cities are population stagnant. So we can expect to see um, huge development, not just in the Asian region, but I think the African region is going to be really critical. And what China, as a big influencer, can learn from its own experience and the Asian experience and convey into African cities is actually going to be fascinating. I'm hoping some of the lessons that are learned are really going to be transferable. So with this depopulation of the rural areas, this 300 million, we've seen all the little towns, all the little villages, and, and even small cities depopulate, and we're seeing these mega cities of 10 plus million. So, you know, Shenzhen, it's 40 years old, it's now 10.4 million or something, which is about the same size as Sweden. So we're squeezing all of Sweden into to that little pocket. Um, and to give you another comparison there, the economy is of a similar scale, um, about 500 billion US dollars, Shenzhen, um, similar to Sweden. Uh, so they're, they're quite similar to give you some context there. Now, you know, should we should we take then um, all of Sweden and stuff it all into Malmo or Stockholm, and that might give you a feel for for what perhaps life might be like here. Um, there are concerns then about what the rural areas will be like as they become depopulated. Are we going to see cities of um, one million people um, you know, cease to exist? This has, of course, happened throughout histories. 
cities have come, they've gone. Um, but China already has over 100 cities of 1 million people. Its plan is to have 20, around 20 cities of 50 billion people. And here they, they are kind of dotted on this plan. I've, I've highlighted some of the, the city groups there. So this main plan is an towards urban agglomeration. It's an economic theory that is being acted out real time as everybody comes from the countryside and builds these huge megalopolis. Um, it's probably one of the great experiments of, of humor, humanity, I would say. Um, these cities um, are, are structured right around China, as you can see. And I, I, I drew this little map with, with a cross on it to try and explain that, you know, China is not China. When I think of China, it's really for, for economies, for cultures, for, um, for completely almost different countries, but, you know, one country, but, but for isolate, not isolated, but integrated economies, regions. Um, and we're going to focus a little bit today on the southern one, which is this, this bottom of the apex there, um, the, the Guangzhou, the south one, which forms pretty much where the main um, urban agglomeration is at this greater Bay Area. You can see the other two big ones, the Shanghai agglomeration and the Beijing agglomeration. These are already you know, 50 million people living in these places. Let's zoom in then. That's the, the same one. And we start to see, there's a, there's a picture of Guangdong and we get all those cities. They've all got at least a million people. Um, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Foshan, the core of it is, is a 50 million group already. It used to be called Pearl River Delta. Um, and, and in this rebranding, it's now Greater Bay Area. Now, why do we need it? And why do we need these urban agglomerations at all, apart from you know, places to put people? And I think what came out, I was trying to say earlier, was the lack of coordination, the, the sprawl of, of development, lack of experience, lack of overall planning at a scale of, of China that it has been so difficult. Um, so there is now a real um, urgency to start to coordinate these agglomeration areas to, to conserve resources, to get the best out of the different facets that these cities have, um, to stop duplication, to stop waste. Uh, so this becomes really attuned perhaps with this 14th four year, uh, 14th five year plan. It's split in, we, it's called the nine plus two. So it's nine big city areas, or they, they are administrative zones, plus the special administrative zones of Hong Kong and Macau. And Hong Kong has been very much up until you know, 2015, 2016, really planning on its own. <laughs> so has Macau. They've they've been talking to China, but but it, it, it's been a, a, a difficult conversation. Um, it's not been um, at the scales needed at this area to facilitate the kind of regional thinking that's being thought about at, at Beijing's level. So this idea of bringing the nine plus two together gives you this 50 million person city. Now, now what is it? Does it look like um, uh, Ryan's uh, dystopian city? Um, now, people in Shenzhen will tell you no, it keeps winning world greenest city, um, certainly China's greenest city. The air quality now is very high, relatively high, improving. Um, there are trees, there are green, there is space. So it's dense. But uh, I think there is opportunity for balance. And this is something where, where we as architects and designers are certainly going to, to have a major role in the future. So that, that blue circle kind of gives you a diameter of about 200 kilometers. That's, that's the scale we're looking at here. A 200 kilometer area. Now you can think about that where you are and, and try and 
think about that. You know, is that Malmo, Copenhagen? Um, how far how far does it really go? That zone of influence to put 50 million people. I think there's lots of different exercises you can do in your mind there. Um, but the interesting thing is that that Macau and Hong Kong are not only are they um, have they not been coordinating well up to now. You know, they're right at the bottom of this zone. They're right at the edge of of the hub. Um, which pretty much, I mean, I focused it on, on Humun here, um, which kind of then covers all the main developed area, um, which is, of course, where it all started um, with the opium wars, with, with the, the British um, sending gunboats up the Pearl River. So, you know, the, the, the cradle of a, a, of a lot of Western influence right at the center of my, my circles here. Um, and Hong Kong and Macau, you know, they're, they're at the edge of that. Gives you, gives you a scale idea. Let's put this into different terms. I've just lost connection to my pointer. Could you change the slide for me, please? I seem to, I seem to be struggling with the connection. Thank you very much. Um, here's a different way, perhaps, of thinking about the spatial structure. Um, here you can see this this idea of looking at it based on putting together kind of economic ideas plus density ideas plus infrastructure um, as, a, as a research project and then you know, putting that into a graphic that shows you where the, the balance is. And the, the big blob there is, is where I showed you, not quite the center of the circle, that's Guangzhou, the big one with Foshan next to it. Um, and at the bottom or bottom right is, is Hong Kong. Um, and it's two, two economies which are given as, uh, as the new territory areas. And then it's Twin City just across the border. There really is just a line there to Shenzhen. So we've got, we've got two main hubs, that southern one and the Foshan Guangzhou hub. Now, what had always been considered was that there was a huge wealth of opportunity in, in the West, which um, on this diagram is right down in the, the bottom left-hand corner, where there are actually um, a lot of cities that have been focused on oil and gas, a lot of cheap labor, um, and a lot of potential to develop that kind of hinterland. And what happened from that was that the the Hong Kong government took a view some time ago to try and connect to there and build the, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau bridge to tap into that, that labor pool. Um, now things have changed, you know, uh, China redeveloped this, this area is no longer about manufacturing. This area as we, as I've talked about is now about tertiary services and, and high tech. Um, and in fact, that area is being repurposed now for, um, amenity, leisure and recreation, entertainment. So this huge amount of infrastructure, this bridge, Great Long Bridge, 31 kilometers from Hong Kong across the, the delta there, um, today is a bit of a white elephant. It, it was only finished in 2018 or so. I think I'm gonna come on to this maybe in, in the next slide. Maybe we can move on a bit. Thank you. Still can't get my, my cue back, thank you. We'll come on. We'll come on to this idea of the the connectivity. I just stay on scale for a minute to give you a another concept of uh, the scale of, of this area we're talking about. So there are three other bays there, and this is by far the biggest in terms of of its area. We've seen those nine million cities, fifty million people. Um, its density is high, but not as high as Tokyo, interestingly. Um, and the main thing that I would, would pick out here is this tertiary as a percent of total GDP. So yes, it's not got many tertiary sector capability at the moment. So it's been manufacturing, it's been making your plastic pens and shoes and widgets and seams. Um, and it's been exporting them through shipping containers. But this new five-year plan really does push this region to go into to tertiary sector, miss out the um, chance of the middle income gap, and raise that statistic to something like 
the other major leading economies. So this is this is the great ambition. So we're going to see huge change in use of a lot of um, land and a lot of buildings and a, for for different purposes, repurposing these. Next, please, sir. Yes. Thank you. Can I can I get on to the next one? Thank you. So here's these bridges. There are four bridges. The bottom one built from Hong Kong, but now China's gone ahead and built two new bridges all by itself that um, illustrate this kind of lack of connected thinking. So we've now got four bridges. We've got a fifth bridge coming soon, which is going to be a rail only bridge. OK, we'll we'll have the next slide. At the same time, OK, at the same time, we've got these um, airports, nine airports, uh, nine potential runways, hugely on top of each other, no coordination about how to do this. So if we can skip through to to the next one, I'm, I'm being told I'm a bit short of time. I'm reading 1450 on my screen, but but it's it's not quite. Next one, please. So this is the rail development. It's networked, it's structured now. This is where we're going. And this has grown, you can see, from Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and the outlying cities, all networked at three or four or five levels from metro, regional rail, high-speed rail, all networking this area. And if you go to the next slide, that's what it's looking like, this 2035 plan um, in real terms. And, and keep moving, please. And here it is showing how that might actually look with Metro and as, as a dense formulation. Now, why is railway so important? Because railway gets built first. We can go to the next slide, please. Railway gets built first here. It's a TOD type development. Where the railway station is, development comes next. And you can see the Shenzhen growth through its Metro system um, from 20, um, 2020, we're coming now for the, for the new plan there on the, the left-hand side, which is showing how this Shenzhen one becomes completely integrated. Um, and Shenzhen and Guangzhou, therefore, are almost going to become seamless. They're, they're fairly seamless already, but once the transport comes together, I think that's what we're going to see. Perhaps we can, we can skip to the next. I still can't get my queue working. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll skip this one because I know that we're short of time, but I'm talking about a Shenzhen explosion. And I'm talking about the fact that at the moment we've got, for instance, shipping, where Guangzhou and Shenzhen make up the together, you know, the, along with uh, Hong Kong, easily the biggest shipping destination in the world. Now, if we see huge movements in use, we're going to see changes in land, we're going to see new potentials, we're going to see, again, new um, chains, supply chains, and land change, which is going to be fascinating coming up. Please, the next one. Three main areas for you guys to be working in. They're all free trade zones. They're all developed on reclaimed land next to the sea. They're very high risk, therefore. Um, Swiss Reinsurance reckons that, the, that this Greater Bay Area is the highest development area risk in the world. It's subject to flood, reclamation, typhoon. Um, this is a, a, a big worry um, when we talk about right development in the right place. Next, please. So this is what's happened in one of them. Uh, uh, James Corner Field Operations Master Plan there showing how this area that was, uh, was port um, was ancillary services has been completely redesigned now into um, a new city area, which we, we so often see when we're planning. Um, so this kind of came around in 2015, and what does it look like now? We, we see the image, we see the image of what it was visionary to be in 2015. If we could change the slide, um, these slides are taken this year. And that city has arrived in five years. The amount of building in this area has been mind boggling. Um, again, I would say the quality is not great. There's not enough uh, green building. Um, there, there's not enough sustainability. But we do have a master plan with green infrastructure. 
Um, we've got a core that's only service sector. There's no residential in here, so that it's dead. It's dead in the evenings. So there's a lot of problems still going on. And uh, what we're seeing is these, these experiments, these pilots, but on a scale that is absolutely extraordinary. And I hope these pilots are going to be an example of what will happen um, in development around the world in the future. We can learn from them. I think one more slide, maybe. It's expensive here, and that's because, um, because of course, it, housing has been used for speculation, not um, actually to, to put people in homes. So I talked about all those billions of homes that were available, yet here in the cities, there is a real housing shortage. Next slide, please. I think maybe we'll finish on the next one. One more, yes. So what's happening when I go out on the street? Um, I see really only electric vehicles now. Um, so from that's from dumper trucks, so big heavy industrial vehicles, street cleaners, buses, automated buses, Uber fleets, um, delivery cars, you name it, um, down to people on scooters. Shenzhen already is pretty much electrified. Um, it's fully 5G connected. It's a cashless society. I haven't seen a, a money note now for three years. This is where we are. Um, and I'm told I should probably wrap up here. So I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> Barry, thank you very much. Yes, time runs really quickly. And, and so we're going to have to skip the Q&A this time. But we enjoy listening to your talk. There's a lot of information. There is so much going on, of course, in the context where you are operating. And I believe that there is a lot to learn from the context where you are. Even if we have different scale, we have different speed of change. But there are a lot of issues that are similar. And we do need to exchange how we operate in different parts of the world. So, Barry, I say thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your experiences from the Chinese context. Thank you, Barry. Och vår näste talare har spelat in sin presentation i förväg eftersom hon är på resande fot. Jenny Gretve är arkitekt och strategisk designer på kontoret Dark Matters Lab i London. Idag talar hon på temat New Balance. Our next speaker is Jenny Gretve, architect and strategic designer at Dark Matters Lab in London. Jenny is based in Malmö, Sweden and has several interests in her work. She has made exhibitions on art and architecture uh, and she studies the interrelationships between, for example, sustainability and joy, urban transformation and philosophy, and beauty and magic. Today, the title of her talk is Architecture of New Balance. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's late August when I record this and the mornings are beautifully crisp. Malmo is still in a summer haze. People walk by my window slightly slower than usual. Yet in this quiet stillness, the mad world violently hits my consciousness as soon as I open my computer. Over the last year, our lives have dramatically changed. A majority of my beliefs do not feel as clear or reasonable as before. Crisis and fear has a great impact on how we feel and how we think. I spend most of my time trying to be creative and find ideas for how to befriend the current status of climate change. As part of the first generation who will have to deeply address the issue I feel both responsibilities and hope, but also stress and despair. What gives me hope is the beauty of humans, interconnectedness and the poetry of being alive. However, there is a belief that technology and innovation is what will save us. And I would like to invite you to a short journey where that idea may not be the saviors we're looking for. I think we need a different urban harmony, an architecture of a new balance. But before getting to some provisional answers to this hypothesis, I want to start to, de to develop the argument by a recent anecdote. Earlier this summer, I went to have a glass of wine with my old friend who devoted her life to saving people. She's a doctor. 
She told me she had just been to a conference where highly regarded companies presented their latest technological innovations. One of these innovations made my friend wonder whether she was at a real conference or in a film. The product is made for patients who want to lose weight, but for some reason or another cannot do that. Instead, they get a plastic button implanted in their stomach and within 15 minutes after having had a meal, they can withdraw and pump out 30% of the food they just ate. I walked home that evening full of thoughts. Why eat those extra 30% in the first place? How much would that save the planet? But I was also thinking about society as a whole. Why is it so hard for us to change minor issues? Why do we always look for the easy way out? And what other plastic button implants do we have all around us that we don't see until we take a step back and get a better overview? Current policies to address a sustainable future are threefold. Decarbonization, energy efficiency and behavioural change. The first two are currently solved with technology, economic models and other concrete actions. Yet they seem to not be effective enough, which means we need to look into the much more complex world of how we behave as human beings, our social structures and actions. We need to look beyond the tools we feel safe to use, like technology, science, statistics or digital tools and curiously walk into territories that traditionally aren't seen as powerful and guaranteed. That could be art, philosophy, old wisdom or spirituality. Is there a connection between these two toolboxes that is a force much needed for an extraordinary and caring world to thrive? If, as many argue, the global emergency demands systemic change to dominant economic models, social structures and behaviours, then what are the implications of these changes for the architectural profession? For a long time, architecture has boomed and flourished hand in hand with global capitalism and growth. Amazing architecture with glossy facades or sculpture-like features have been the goal to reach status as a successful architectural firm. Now we see that a constant societal growth with the economy as its epicenter is neither a good idea nor workable at all. It is not through economic growth and materialistic consumption that we will find a balance within climate change. I'm saying this is not any news at all. We know this too well by now. Still, we're looking for plastic buttons to save us. We're looking for new innovative materials. We're looking for new arguments to keep pushing cheap constructions forward. We're looking for political decision-making to keep our mandates when designing new but non-sustainable airports, shopping malls or data centers. We're blaming engineers, construction companies and municipalities for our own inability to be extraordinarily creative when the world demands us to. Now, what possibilities do we have? Architects have a broad education and a creative understanding of built and constructed environments. Many of us work in multidisciplinary fields and with forward thinking crossovers. When, if not now, are we to push boundaries and use our wide knowledge and be brave? I propose we change our ideas of value in society. What architecture looks like is irrelevant here. The importance is how we are all connected and what roles we have as space creators to help people see this, feel this and be inspired to live together differently. There are around 2,150 billionaires in the world worth a combined and mind-blowing $10 trillion. Their wealth is greater than that of 60% of the world's population. At the same time, land values have created a global housing crisis and people can no longer afford a home. We need to fundamentally change and rethink our economic foundations. For architects, it is time to be radical and possibly not always collaborative with dominating developers. 
we could instead develop new innovative business models where projects are funded by complex investment chains via companies, citizens and municipalities and thereby skip the growing market of unethical property owners. To work closer with economists and invent our own business models would benefit not only the end user, but also our freedom to create beautiful buildings and cities. What if architecture schools collaborated with economy schools, just like the Stockholm School of Economics, Economics is doing right now with the Royal School of Art, where they explore and develop knowledge at the intersection between economy and the arts and humanities. The future of architecture needs to move beyond aesthetics and become a deeply rooted science of built human societies. Architecture could be a holistic science of urban growth, where it's not the physical space growing, but human minds and their lives. We all live and work with the aim to make the brief moment we have on this earth a beautiful experiment, experience. That is a nice reminder on why we work with climate change. It's not only about sustainable materials, flights or meat. It's about the fundamental right to live and feel. And that right is heavily threatened. While the focus for most sustainable change often rests at the scale of governments and industry, changes at the level of individuals, households and communities are of profoundly greater importance than most people appreciate. Nearly two thirds of global emissions are linked to both direct and indirect forms of human consumption. How can architects create spaces that inspire a mental shift? Can we design cities based on life and not consumption? The major change from traditional ideas of constantly growing cities through erasing and replacing with large-scale urban developments would be the idea of the center as a place not based on product consumption, but rather a place where humans meet and interact. Could we use all of our forces to create something with possibly less physical constructions, but with an enormous societal architecture that could massively change our shared urban lives? We like to make decisions based on facts and proofs to be sure that we're doing the right thing. But how do we make decisions about uncertain futures when there are no proofs? It's time for everyone to be brave. There is an extreme focus on zero carbon when building and transitioning cities, which is fantastic. But we're back at the plastic button solution way of thinking. We need to dare to jointly regroup and rethink, and we need to do it right now. To create the atmosphere, I imagine, will require a balanced state of mind. To open up for emotional and possibly vulnerable communication needs bravery. To shift from strict information-based platforms to creativity and culture-driven ambitions needs us all to stand grounded and see the magnificent world with all its complex fragments that together create something truly beautiful and worth fighting for. I would like to invite you all to a collaborative dialogue and wide collective thinking of what roles architects could have in a different world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tack, Jenny. Och nu ska vi röra oss ut på en annan resa i världen. Eva och Christian, vad tänker ni på när jag säger Arup? Christian? Nej, Arup har väl liksom manifesterat sig som en av de mest uh, intressanta och uh, innovationsdrivande uh, ingenjörverksamheter, tänker jag. Så min, min association är sån extremt stærke analytiske kompetencer, ingeniørkraft øh, og et, måske i stigende grad sådan et, et human touch. Så jeg glæder mig til øh, Nilles øh, foredrag. Eva, hvad siger du? Hvad tænker du på? Jeg tænker stort, stort företag, mange mennesker, store infrastruktur, projekt, broer, ingeniørkunst, øh, men kanskje nogle steder det der med at 
kunna skapa verklighet av en galen idé. Förankra det och göra det fysiskt. Det låter bra. Arup arbetar med både ingenjörskonst och med arkitektur. Och vår nästa talare är företagets globala chef för Arup Arkitektur. Our next speaker is Nille Jul Sörensen. Nille is the director and global business leader of Arup Architecture, where he has been working since 2004. He is an award-winning architect working on design projects all over the world and received the Swedish Casper Salin Prize in 2011 for Malmö City Tunnel project. Nilla has previously, among other prominent positions, been the CEO of Danish Design Center. He has been the vice chair at Aarhus School of Architecture, and he is a regular jury member for international competitions and reviews, as well as an international speaker. His talk today is Towards Regenerative Design. Welcome, Nilla. Thanks for being here. Uh, I think I'll just uh, get my slide going. So um, this is just to pinpoint that I, I've been to Malmö before. I, I've done this fantastic station working in a Swedish environment, which is actually very different from a Danish environment, um, both more positive in a way. Uh, but there's also bumps, cultural bumps, even that you just uh, cross a piece of water, then there is a cultural thing. And we have to remember that when we do whatever design, that there is a cultural thing. Uh, the other thing I've just done in this area is the new city ring in Copenhagen that's just open with 17 stations. So it is, as as we told before, Arab do big projects and, um, and we like to do them. But we actually also like to do not only the big thing, but actually the small thing, the things that people touch and how we actually do that. And, and how we're working is that we have this... Uh, we are independent company, so we don't have to, you know, pay money to any shareholder. So we can do what we feel is right, and this is what um, this lecture about today is: what we feel is the right thing to do, and a right thing to change our family, uh, as we call them. You know, it's a company, but we also almost like a family because we own the company. We don't have any shareholders; it's owned by the members, and that means that we have a freedom to work crisscross uh, the globe. And you can see that we have, you know, we're 16,000 people. We have offices uh, almost scattered around the world. And when we do project, it's not that Melbourne is doing a project. No, it's Arab doing a project. That means that most projects have a complete international integrated team working together. And what we've done, um, I think it's two years ago, we said, actually, we call it our new strategy is a sustainable future. So this is about, you know, creating that better world, you know, who's a sustainable future. And, you know, not just for us, but actually it doesn't matter. It's, it's for our clients, it's for the communities, it's for people. It's actually to try to see how can we actually save this planet from what we're doing today and how can we strive to get a balance, you know, about a growing population, you know, uh, the capacity of actually accommodating all of us with a life that we would really like to do and make that canvas for people to actually explore their life and not the life that we think we can predict to them. The way we do that is what we call it total architecture. And, it, and we know that everybody's saying they are integrated and I don't believe it. I think we have a culture of 60, of 75 years where we really sit in groups with all kinds of people who are working on a project even though you think this is a bridge, but there will be people who are, have nothing to do with bridge, who are philosophers, because we have to actually talk about these things as a more holistic view to things. And that means that we can hopefully get to a better outcome when we are, you know, um, different kind of people looking at these things. <clears throat> so what I want to talk to you about today is that, you know, uh, this famous uh, quote, you know, uh, regarding the Apollo 13 mission, you know, Houston, we have a problem. And we really have a problem the way we are treating the planet we're living on, and we have to do something different. And when I see, you know, uh, Skåne, Malmö, it's a nice city, you know, we're all good, you know, we are having, you know, uh, health care, we're nice to each other, you know, we actually get paid every day, you know, we have a, a quite a nice life. And sometimes when I'm in Scandinavia, I think, you know, 
are they living in a complete bubble? I could have shown two images from Denmark, you know, same, or from Norway. And I think there is this thing that, you know, we have to raise, you know, the, the horizon and look out because the world is actually looking completely different. So sometimes when we're talking about, you know, sustainability, it's sort of, it's very, very Scandinavian. And I think there is actually a world out there who needs something different. And this is a typical image of uh, Mexico City. This is how people live. They don't live in the nice little cottage or they don't have the boat. They don't have the access to nature as we have. They have a completely different life. And that is where if we can change this, if we can start looking at this Hong Kong image, <clears throat> you know, how can we change their lives to a more positive life? And at the same time, it's a sustainable life. Sometimes, you know, things happen around here and suddenly we wake up. Um, I'm based in Berlin right now. And we had the floodings um, in the western part of Germany. And everybody in Germany woke up and said, whoa, who, whoa, what was that? You know, where did that come from? Yeah, you know, it was actually predicted. And the reason is that, you know, things are changing. But we are, as human beings, and especially in nations, and as architects, are not changing, not changing fast enough. So I think most people have agreed to the 17 tiles here that, you know, we need to do something. And the good thing about them is that they're very open and we can all see ourselves in them. And when I look at them, you know, I think, you know, you can say, you know, there's outcomes for society, there's outcomes for the planet. And then we stack the ones in the middle saying, you know, that's actually where architects and, you know, with the infrastructure, cities and products actually can, can change something. <clears throat> and then we're looking at, you know, so an Arab, because we, you know, where are we today? So you can say that we are sort of, are we in the green thing, you know, best practice today? That's sort of where we operate in the projects we have. But what we have to do is actually be in a regenerative mode. And that means that if we, it's not coming overnight, you know, it's not like a quick fix, you know, and then it happens. No, we have to start now to think, how are we going to do a regenerative design in the future, in five years, in 10 years, whenever we can get there. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we think that we are really doing, you know, green things. We're fantastic. We, you know, we're even sustainable. We're talking about net zero, that this is the goal. Net zero is just a path on the way to regenerative design. And if we don't get to regenerative design, then we have the problem that, you know, Houston, we really have a problem. And it seems that a lot of architects right now, a lot of engineers and a lot of politicians just look at the net zero thing, but that's not enough. We have to go further. And in Arab, we've started that journey because if we don't start looking out there, how the hell are we going to get there? You know, then it will come as a surprise. So we have what we call sustainable thing, you know, that's able to maintain, uh, you know, at, at a certain rate or level to upheld and defend, you know, what we have. And then we go to restorative, which is the next thing, you know, that's bring back and, uh, and reestablish what was there before. And then we have to move into regenerative where we actually uh, grow after loss of damage, you know, and, and you, you could say that you, when you've done something, you add more to nature than when you actually started on the place. And that means that we're talking about outcomes. And that means that we're talking about, it's, it's so complex that, you know, when I'm sitting there with my little building saying, you know, oh, I, I love my open kitchen for this plan. Isn't it beautiful? It doesn't matter. You know, it has no relevance in this. So what I would like to do is to take you on a trip uh, from, you know, out in the open land where we've done projects and none of them are regenerative, but some of them have elements that could be. And it's also talking to you about the challenges we have and that, you know, what we as architects is, you know, is a little tiny thing at the end. And if we don't get the first, you know, we were talking a lot about resilient cities, right? You know, water, what do we do with it? But where do the water come from, right? So we just put into that, we look at the city and then we don't look at anything else. But the thing is, it's so complex, it's so holistic that we actually have to start out there. And this is a natural river. Rivers change, you know. It's not like a building that would stand there for 50 years. No, rivers change their path all the time. It's a very natural thing. And that means that when we start building on the flood beds and then 20 years later, it's all flooded, we get a surprise? No. If you actually start looking at it, there shouldn't be a surprise because it's done that for the last couple of hundred years. But we just forgot. We just completely, you know, oh, well, I never thought about that thing, you know. But 
If you talk to the locals, they know exactly what's going on. So we actually have to start to work with nature and not against nature. And that means there's things we can't do. There's things we can do because we actually have technology to do it so we can live places where we couldn't live a hundred years ago. But there is actually nature and nature is stronger than this. And we also need to have to make nature be nature and, and build with it, you know, be a part of it, you know, instead of trying to fight against it. And I'll just show some projects going through what we're doing. And, you know, this, this next thing is all down at the bottom of this uh, uh, map is London. So that's where the Olympic was. This is Lee River, and it's a huge uh, river system. The problem is that there is enormous floodings. And what happened is that we're working with the Lee Valley you know, regeneration and, and trying to find all the stakeholders. So even the ones who's living at the top of that image is actually helping the ones at the bottom because it's all connected. So no one can fix it on their own. So how can we get stakeholders together? How can we you know, do these wicked problems that no one really can find out? You know, why can't we solve them and try to solve them collectively? And that means that someone has to pay up front to something that's going on 50 kilometers away from my office building because that will save my office building. And that means that we try to, for the Lee Valley, to do a complete vision for the Lee Valley. It's not about the building. It's not about, you know, the bridge or the urban planning of an area. It's actually, you know, planning, trying to see the whole Lee Valley. How can we actually work with water and how can we actually benefit of having water there and how can we do all these things so it actually is a positive outcome and not just an output. The same thing we done in India where we had a huge area around uh, the Ozoa Lake. How could we actually change that city so it was working with the environment, with the lake, with all the water and everything started to sort of emerge into a thing that, you know, was not about the normal things, the infrastructure of the city, they, that came afterward. We had to find out how was things actually nature working. And when you find, when you map that out, then you can start fitting in the human scale and the human part into this one. This is from Shanghai. So, you know, if you've been to Shanghai, you know, there's a lot of concrete, a lot of stone, you know, that, it, you know, so when the heavy rain ones fog comes, you know, it's flooded and it's a huge problem for them. So we were commissioned by Shanghai to come up with a plan. What do we do? And sometimes in China, they're very open to new ideas if they can see that the outcome really benefits them. So what we did was that we actually made, you know, uh, sort of four levels of it, you know, like, you know, you had the gray infrastructure, you had the blue infrastructure, the green, and then you have the governance. Because that if you don't, if you, you can do all these things, if you don't have the governance into this, then it will not work. So what we did was that we actually started mapping out, you know, where do the water run? How will the water run if there was no buildings? Where, uh, where can we, you know, keep water for 15 minutes for half an hour? is the places where it's not possible, where we actually have to do new tunnels that, you know, will take the water out of, uh, out of Shanghai. And now this, we started this project and we believe that, you know, in five years, when it probably be finished and maybe it'll be even be faster, that means that we're working with nature in a really, really dense city with millions of people. And that means that, yes, some mornings when they wake up on the plaza, there will be a lake. Other mornings it will be dry, you know, there will be green uh, spots that will be underwater and then it will be go again. But that's the only way that you can start working with these things. And I know in Copenhagen they also have a fantastic plan for the next 40 years. And cities have to do these things. And the problem is that politicians have to invest in something you cannot see. But when it happens, then you're really glad that 10 years ago you actually put the money in. And that's why governance is, is really important. We move further into, we do quite you know, a lot of uh, rail projects. You can see, you know, I'm involved in a lot of them. And this is a station, it's the first station, it's a high-speed station in Birmingham in England, which has the BREM, gold, platinum, everything, it's made of timber. And to do that, you know, we spent more time getting all the certificates, checking all the boxes, you know, a complete, you know, box ticking exercise to get this done. You know, if this was 100 years ago, 
everybody would say, yeah, that's really smart to do it in timber because we've got a lot of timber, you know, we can do that. Now it's a really big problem. You know, we, we made so many rules that it's almost impossible to do, but we actually done it and it's now going into detailed design. And at the same time, we're saying, okay, you know, how can we do metro stations? Can we do metro stations in timber? So we've done a metro station in Copenhagen, fully timber. You know, everything is timber. And it's actually taking all the regulations of today. So that means there is no excuse. And we use this, you know, test of a station like this. And then it's brought back to all the other projects that if we can do that, this is how we calculate it. This is how it's going to go through municipalities and all these things. This is how it's going to work. And that means that we, are, we have that knowledge <clears throat> when we have to do it again. And especially in Asia and especially also in Australia, they're really interested in this, that you can actually start doing these things in timber. And what we also are doing now is that the elevated tracks were normally huge concrete, very heavy uh, carbon you know, uh, demanding things. We're saying, can we do that in timber? You know, and now we're testing that. So in half a year, we'll probably have a solution. Hopefully, it will be 100% timber. We're not sure yet, but we have to test these things. And if not, it's not timber. Can we actually do it out of recycled materials? Is that is there things that you know we haven't seen because we've been so focused on outputs for so many years that we want to do a beautiful building, we want to do new materials and new ways of of putting glass together, you know, wow, now we have to think completely different. And when we then move a little closer into suburbia, you know, we, we see streetscapes like this. These, I think these are you know, from Melbourne. And we were working with the municipality in Melbourne saying, you know, you know, of course you have a problem. Of course, there's a heat problem here because there's not enough trees. If you go to cities like uh, Toronto, Berlin, you know, who have a lot of trees in all their streets, that means that it, it's not heating up. It's not cold. It actually keeps the heat at winter. It's a lot smarter. So here there's no trees. So we actually came up with uh, an idea how we could change the complete streetscape into, you know, being something for humans. And we did that with the digital overlay. So it's completely digitalized at the same time. It's, you know, it, you can have EVs, you know, you can charge them. And, every, and it was very simple, just changing how you park a car. That's where we started. That if you, if you move the uh, car parks on the left side, then you can actually take all the ones on the right side and put it to the left side. So we just went through a couple of streets in Melbourne. And it's not expensive. It's just rethinking how you do things. And it's rethinking how you do things from a human point of view and also from a sustainable point of view, because how do you take the rain that comes down, how do you get rid of the heat? And then we move closer into, you know, what, you know, it's more architecture. So this is a building that we um, did in, uh, it's called uh, One Triton. It's in the middle of London. We did it, I think, 40 years ago. It was um, a, a building for a city bank. So it's, you know, a completely banking floors, you know, Boom, 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 you know, uh, double glaze systems, all that things. And then um, the owner came and said, oh, we need to refurbish the building. Or they actually said, no, we need to tear down the building and build a new one. And we said, maybe we shouldn't do that. You know, maybe we should actually look at this and say, what can we use and what has to change? And they said, oh, yeah, but there's something called finance here, so we can't do that. And then we said, oh, let's have a look. So what we actually did was that we, we said, you know, that if we actually add three floors extra on the building, which we could, then, you know, it's a 80% uplift of office space. So that means there's more money for the client here. So, you know, how can we actually use that in a different way, right? So we actually said by actually leaving all the existing, we don't tear anything down. You know, we saved, you know, 30,000 tons of, of concrete, right? And the steel was reused. We took down the facades. We actually had workshops around the sites where they took all the rubber out of the facade. They put new gases in. They cleaned all the glass. And they, it all came back. So everything who's there when it, it's going to open next month is actually recycled in one way or the other. And then, you know, we made this sort of, you know, very graphic um, illustration. What is going on in a building that has changed completely? But to the thousands of people who is walking around in this area, they will just see it as one triton because it looks exactly as it has done. But it's, you know, it's completely new inside. 
it's completely new outside, just used old materials, and the old materials are the materials that was there before. And then, of course, it's got a little bit taller, and that's not a problem in London. And then we started looking at, you know, what actually, what, what has happened. So it's 40,000 tons of carbon that we saved. It's enormous just by actually reusing. And the problem in the property industry is that some of the clients we have, they want new build because they say we can't, you know, we, we can't reuse is not going to sell. But thankfully, over the last two years, there has been an enormous shift that, okay, we can move into reuse. And then it had to look like an, um, a New York brownstone industrial building. Then it was okay. But now even a lot of our clients can see that it is actually smart to move in in these buildings who are not with uh, stone but something else and reuse them. And, you know, and how can we save that carbon? And, you know, as it says here, you know, it, it's, it's 40 years of, of uh, operational carbon that's, that we actually saved in this building. Then we're looking into how can we do a, do a net zero, a complete net zero, a tall building, because sometimes, you know, I think that we are doing the easy one. We do a single family house or we do a three story house, you know. You have to do the scale to actually find out what can we do. And this is just a, a competition uh, that we won. Uh, and it's actually working with a facade, you know, a building that is built around how to get to net zero. So the facades are, are different on all sides. Uh, the building is cut through a different kind of uh, things. And we actually invented these sort of, you know, tubes on the outside. You can walk out in the tube and sit there. You can go talk in mobile phone. You have a fantastic view over um, Hong Kong. <clears throat> but it's, it's a building that looks very modern. But at the same time, it is a complete um, carbon zero building. And that means that that building is good. So that's a good outcome. The problem is everything around it is still in the old world. And how do that change? And especially in Hong Kong, where everything is very tight. So we just won a huge competition where we actually was going for what we call Transformation 4.0. So how can we actually start saying that if we do a part of a city that we bring back production? You know, we talk about the 15-minute city, right? But if your production is outside, that means everybody has to leave for work outside. So how can we actually put production in? What kind of production? And you really find out that a lot of the production today is robotics. There's no fumes, there's no noise, so you can actually have an office next to it. You can live on top of it. So this is a part of a city where we actually are combining everything into one kind of structure. And that also means that we have what I call the livable city because, you know, kids will go to school here. So you will have parents in the morning uh, bringing their kids to schools. There will be, you know, um, good productions. There will be, you know, all kinds of people working there and living there and the nighttime you know, again, it would be a lively, lively city with people using it 24-7. So it starts being that 15-minute city that can also change all the time. And <clears throat> this is just a, a section through it, you know, that you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's moving in all directions. And the idea with this was also that, you know, why is it that buildings are always static? You know, why is it that we build a building and then it has to stand there for 100 years or 20 years until some but it knocks it down or you add something to it. Why can't the building change depending on what happens outside? You know, we, we get wiser and wiser in the way we control, um, you know, sustainable issues. You know, there's new techniques coming in. There's new watering system. We want to have, you know, urban farming, more urban farming. This is working. This is not working. So it's also a test, but how can we change that building? And so what we actually did was that we did it as a modular system. So it's a modular system that you can change the water, you can change the height. So you have, I think it's a six by eight meters by eight meters cubes that is all stacked together. And the good thing is that we have a client who want to build it. And they know that it could be risky business because it could be delayed because there could be problems and you know, how do we do all the connections and all these things. And we put this really sort of regime in of, uh, circular design, you know, uh, where do the material comes from, and also attacking all the material, because we know this client that we're working for here also have other buildings, and we are test or we are we are checking all those old buildings for what are they made of. So that's a mm, library. So when we're doing the next project for them, all the building material will be picked from these buildings that we actually did the survey on. So the old buildings are now the library for new buildings. And sometimes you have to, um, you know, 
you're always working for clients that has uh, the headache. And so we also said, ha, huh, we have to do the first circular house, completely circular, following all the rules. You can't cheat anywhere. So we did that in the middle of London, and it was a fantastic learning process because we found out where the problems are. You know, where do, we, where do problems come in? You know, and the biggest problem was when we were finished with it all, the manufacturers, they didn't want to take back the, um, the materials. So we start giving it to kindergartens. We, I think we actually ended up giving the whole house to a kindergarten because, you know, it was just too difficult. And that means that we can do a lot of things if we haven't dealt with how do we, the logistics of delivering things back, the logistics of, you know, how do things come in and out, you know, and also the finance, how do we finance that? Then we zoom in a little bit closer again, and then we have, you know, materials. You know, there's a lot of new materials coming up. There's a lot of materials that, uh, in the beginning, they, you think, nah, this is not really going to work. Or you say, hmm, that's really promising. But we don't know. We don't know until we tested them. So this is a test house. We have a, a fantastic client in Hamburg. So this facade is made of algae. So you have algae in between two layers of glass. And the idea is that in the wintertime, the algae is uh, not dead, but, you know, they don't do anything. So that means there's a complete um, transparency of sun and light into all the flats. This is sort of a double glazed thing where you can have them as uh, shadows, shadowing, closing. And in the summer times, then the heat comes to the water and it's getting more and more um, uh, green. And then the algae comes up and it actually protects the building. We're also moving into food. This is not our food. I think it's fantastic. It's actually you got that you eat the packaging and everything. <clears throat> but we are into food design. How do we design food in these cities? How do we do urban farming and industrial farming? And then we go all the way. Now we're really down. This is an insect hotel in London, a competition we won for the um, city of London. <clears throat> and it's actually for, you know, keeping the biodiversity in cities. So, you know, we have these insect hotels that, you know, we can do. And that comes to that, you know, mind the gap. I think we are, we have thousands of projects we just need to collect them we need to move them into that regenerative future how do we get there and we i think we are on the on the road but i have all this that people are saying you know what is a luxury product right so this is a bag it probably costs twenty five thousand pounds or something like that you know extremely expensive and the problem is that we see that as a luxury product but i guess that 80 percent of people around the world they see this as a luxury product so we have to change the mindset what we actually think is good or bad what we think is what we should do we have this building that was in uh, we were involved uh, with arab on this one and if i'm really honest then it's just another residential tower with big balconies with a lot of trees on it it's not that thing that is actually working together and when we see you know everybody is then saying oh but technology will save us and you know i i really like cedric price for saying yeah but what was the question you know what is the question and sometimes you know you think yeah technology will, will you know will do everything this is just two examples you know so the can was invented in 1810 and the can opener actually came 40 years after right so that's the time when we talk about technology it's not you know that you have a problem and then you solve it the next day with technology. It takes quite a long time. And this is a Swedish example. You know, you had the nice Ericsson phone where you put the finger in and then you turned the dial. In 75, you know, like, you know, uh, time span, you had the digital phone, but they didn't know how to design a digital phone. So they just took an, and then they mucked all the digital phone into an analog design. And it actually took 40 years before someone came up with a phone that was completely digital. So there is this thing about technology will save us. I don't believe it. I think design has to move from outputs that we're not designing building any longer. We have to design outcomes. We have to design systems and experiences. And, you know, it's strategies, it's services, it's interfaces, it's a lot of things that will give an outcome. And the problem we have is that it's called wicked problems. There's so many things. Every time we sit around, you know, want to do something, there are problems that nobody fully understands and nobody owns. And that means that how can we change that game so, you, so we, we start owning the problem and we start, you know, actually understanding the problem and, you know, in a collective 
So it's all about having a different kind of architecture, a different kind of setup. You know, so you need someone who can analyze, you know, to have insight and depth insight into things. You need designers who can do the design thinking, asking the questions. And you need solution providers, you know, who have that domain knowledge that, you know, they actually know everything about two millimeters of the world. And then you need negotiators who can actually start with, you know, getting mutual gains and mindsets, you know, and, and implementation skills into this. And to do all these things, you know, we, we said, you know, there's six scales that we are working with now. So there's the materials, there's the buildings, there's the neighborhood, there's the cities, there's the catchments, and there's the biosphere. And you cannot just walk, work with four without five. They are all connected. And that's why it's so bloody complex to do these things that you have to think and find out methodologies to do it. And this is just, you know, from a car park where we actually said what happens in a car park. You know, we have the conventional, the green, the sustainable, you know, the restorative and the regenerative. So we actually go through all our buildings and say, what, how can we move the dial towards the regenerative with all our clients, you know? And I think, you know, for a foreseeable time, it will not about all this trend. Every time I open a, a magazine, you know, it's, it's trendy new kits and trendy new couch, you know, iconic buildings here, there and everywhere. You know, can we just leave all that? Can we just leave actually using virgin materials, you know, and, you know, large flats, big single family houses, and then just say, you know, all these parameters, they have to change. If we don't change these parameters, we're not going anywhere. So we need to do reused materials, new perception of space. What is a space? You know, no one's talking about space, but they're talking about this bloody kitchen all the time. How can we actually use digital in a really smart way, robot? Artificial intelligence, you know, the machine learning we do, uh, the thing, uh, the job we did in Shanghai was actually machine learning because the, the area was so big. So we actually told the machine that, you know, we learned the machine how to find out where the water was running. How do we use augmented reality, you know, new energy sources? We need a completely new way of actually bidding. So the EU process of bidding uh, has gone because that's a price, but what is the price and what, you know, it's not going to work, you know, the financial system. And by the way, the financial system are moving very fast towards, you know, net zero and even, you know, uh, circular and probably regenerative. So we need to define a completely new aesthetics. So it's not what we think is beautiful. I don't want to talk about beautiful. I want to talk about completely new aesthetics and new way of doing things. And, you know, I haven't seen anyone, not even in our, we're scratching the surface. We're not in there. There's no building where you say, oh, this is leading the way. But I believe that when, what we also saw when in the Industrial Revolution, that there's a kind of architect that comes out of all the constraints that we're having. We just have to do it in a different way. So it will be an enormous task for all of us. But I believe that we can do it together. And I know there's a lot of people who think this is going to be a terrible world. You know, I'll have reused, uh, you know, windows and God knows what. I actually think it's going to be a fantastic world. It's going to be fantastic for humans. It's going to be a fantastic thing for my grandchildren to grow up, you know, in something where they feel they are part of something bigger. You know, where the community is the value. It's not about me. It's actually about that community. And as we as architects, have committed us to work for communities and work for outcomes and not for my ego that I want a wacky building because that's, you know, this year's um, trend. No, it's about actually looking forward to that regenerative architecture and be prepared. Maybe it will not come in my time, hopefully in my kids' time, because if you don't do that, we have a problem. So thank you very much. And please start to rethink your life. And it's going to be fantastic. Thank you. Ending on that optimistic note, Nille. We have a question from our panel, Eva. Yeah, thank you. That was really inspiring. Um, I want to go back to where you started about the right thing to do, which I love. And I think everyone wants to do the right thing, but I find it so hard to know what the right thing is. And looking back in history, we have modernism. We thought they thought they were doing the right thing. It didn't turn out all that good, at least in some parts. Uh, I'm thinking of this survey where they looked at LEED certified buildings and found that 25 to 35 percent of these buildings actually exceeded the energy levels because of people, because people didn't act as computer models. 
So there's something about when you start talking about how can we design buildings that are not fixed. So is is like the next step from restorative, regenerative, is it like responsive design? Like how how can we create designs that actually responds to the changes around? Is is can you maybe expand a little bit and maybe talk about that particular project? I'm I'm really curious. I I think that it can be done. I think the problem we have is always mental, you know. So I'm saying that uh, when I'm a young student, I need, let's say, 15 square meters. I'm, I'm you know, studying all the time. I'm just there at night. Um, then I meet a partner, and then we need a little bit more space, and then we get maybe kids, and then we need more space, you know. And I have to get a new uh, apartment every time. So what happens if the financial uh, institution gave me a possibility of buying the right to, uh, let's say, an 80 square meter uh, floor plate? And then I could actually build out, build in, you know, I could live there all my life. I could actually, you know, the, the building will completely change all the time. Um, and that, I mean, it's an architecture nightmare, right? But I think, you know, Elemental have done it in Peru, I think, where you just built the kitchens because that was what people actually really wanted. And then they built the thing in between, out of control. Um, but it's actually looking really nice. And I think these things that were, <clears throat> how can we do these things? And I, and I think it's it mostly financial. So if we can put that aside, and I think it, it, that will also happen, then I, I utterly believe that we can do structures. Because if we start designing systems and things that goes into the system, then it, it has that ability of change. And I know that everybody is saying, oh, uh, no, you know. That's not for me. Then everything looks like the same. And I'm just saying that most of us has a mobile phone and some of us has an iPhone, right? It's a very, very nice design. And to be honest, I have my iPhone and you have your iPhone because I have an image of, you know, a horse or a cat or whatever. Uh, and then I had different apps from you. So it's my phone. It's exactly the same system. It's a platform for things on it. And that's how it actually working. And you can also say that if you buy, buy a, a Mini Cooper, you know, every 125,000 Mini Cooper are the same, but you feel you have yours because you paid extra to have a flower pot and some special seats and some color in the halo. So I think there is this thing that we can actually do architecture that is changing. And that is with the competition, you know, for Transformation 4.0. That's what we're actually trying to do, that you feel that you have a special apartment, but you don't. It's just exactly the same as the production of, that's going on the uh, uh, going on two stores down. Is that sort of answering your question? Um, I, I think if we could answer it like precisely, we <laughs> would have. You know, I don't know if we needed to no. be here, but um, yeah. I, 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 I think that the problem is that it it has not happened yet, mm. and I think we have to test it. And we and 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 I believe that with the speed I see the chains. Um, with a new green deal in Europe, it's opening up for different ways of doing things. And if we just sit back and do what the conventional stuff, then we'll go nowhere. But if we start testing these things, if you actually start, you know, having clients, and I think there is clients out there who would like to do things, and we see more and more European clients who want to, you know, go into these modular timber things that can change over time, um, depending on on the market that you know right now. There's a need for a lot of housing in cities, but you know what happens when you get older, you need something else, you know, then you don't build more because the whole idea is that you don't you stop building new things, but you reconfigure what is there in a new way. I think maybe a follow up question could be um, I, it, when you talked about the Lee River and you said no one can fix it on their own. Could that also be a way to finding a right solution when we cannot do the I, but we have to do the we solution? I, I, I think that's a, uh, Lee Valley is a really good example. And, and we have a few other projects like that where in the beginning, everybody was fighting everybody. And that's what I talked about, the wicked problems, is that if you can get all the, we don't even call them stakeholders any longer. Yeah. We call them partners. How do you become a partner in that? global problem we have where you can do your bit in the Lee Valley 
And it's good for, you know, the bigger planet, but it's also good for everybody in the Lee Valley. And it's especially good for you because you get a sort of a resilience and protection and things like that. And when you start spending a little bit time up front and getting people engaged and telling them in a, in a very simple way, what is, what is it we're trying to achieve and why is it good for you? And I always say that, you know, I'm really proud of being a Scandinavian, you know, born in Sweden, raised in Denmark. So that we have a social system here where, you know, people who earn a lot of money, they pay a lot of tax. But a lot of times you're actually really happy because that is the system we are doing that every, you know, someone is paying for the ones who haven't got the money. So everybody has a good health. And I think for the Lee Valley, it's, there will be people who will pay more to have a security, you know, that their security uh, ticket is, 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 um, more pricey than other ones where they also want the security, but they pay a lower price. And when you have all that, because it's the benefit of the, the total. And I think the community uh, engagement and also I see an enormous shift after COVID-19 that people actually start caring about where they're living, how they're living, how, what can I do to my community that is more safe, more, you know, with traffic, it, it, it's more livable and all <laughs> these things. So, so I, I hope, you know, I'm or maybe naive, but you know, I think it will happen. And Lee Valley is just one project that where you, it benefits all that you come together. And I think you, that's a huge scale, but you can almost get it down to your your block uh, in the city. That if you start working together, then you have that pride. And I think it's a lot about pride. I think basically everybody wants to contribute to a, a more sustainable planet. A lot of people don't know how to do it. And then we tell them that we're doing all kinds of things from a political side, which is not really happening. So I also think a lot of people see that we have to act. You know, politicians are not going to act in the speed we need. Okay, great. And uh, Christian? Thanks. Um... Thanks, Anila, for an uh, inspiring and uh, uplifting uh, presentation. It's, it's interesting to see how you work, work across scales and, and do projects that uh, yeah, seems to uh, solve problems. So that's, that's great. Um, one reflection, uh, I think this systemic dimension of your, your work, uh, moving from, let's say, building or, or individual projects to uh, more uh, neighborhood scale or more complex projects, I think what I find is that very often it's it kind of dies in, in the complexity of stakeholders or what you don't want to call them, but like all these people who have the, each their part of land or each their fetishism. Or so I wonder if you can reflect upon or give examples on how do you basically uh, address the governance issues or the lack of ownership to these uh, wicked problems, as you say, and, and and maybe specifically on a neighborhood level, because I find very often it's the nobody really has the, the neighborhood perspective, so it get lost either in the bureaucratic structures or in some greedy developer's uh, pocket. So can you reflect upon that, the lack of governance level for community scale? Um, we, we just uh, started a project, you know, they, they're going on site now in, in Madrid, and I think it's called Notre Norte. Um, we have worked on that project for 25 years in a month's time. And for 25 years, we got nowhere. Uh, every time we had, we had new developers, we had new, um, uh, as in, in Madrid, there's a, you know, the housing organizations are, are quite strong. Um, and we never got anywhere. There was always something wrong. And the politicians were, you know, um, just not in line with everything. But everybody could see that, one, they needed a new main uh, train station. Two, they needed a new infrastructure. Three, they needed new housing and they needed parks. They needed all these things. So that was clear for everyone. But it was like we couldn't get anywhere. And that went on. Then we did another project. You know, it just, you know, went on for 25 years. Five years ago, there was a, a bright engineer, young, who just came in and said, you know, hey, stop all these fights. Why don't we actually say, how can we make this part of Madrid the most sustainable part of Madrid, you know, really making it a showpiece for the industrial uh, uh, production, but also for housing and all. And suddenly it took a year to unlock all these things. And then it actually went through the um, Madrid parliament and it was voted with all 
parties voted yes to it. And that means that the uh, developers, they can see this is actually going on. We want, want to uh, invest. And it's now, you know, it's not net zero, but it's on the move to net zero. And that means because it's quite big that the first building that comes up will probably be, you know, a lot greener. And the next phase will be um, circular. And hopefully the last pieces will actually be uh, almost regenerative. But that's a thing where, where you know, how do you, it, it's the, the problem is unlocking these things. And I think you have them, um, it's easier when you do the big thing. But when you come down to that thing with people, I live here, how do I, how, how is my life forming? What is the space I having? And, but I think it's, what is it that we can be that, you know, that collects us instead of dividing us? And that's what we are seeking. And that's also why we use a lot of partners uh, because we don't have all the knowledge in Europe and we, we, don't, we can't cope with all the knowledge in Europe. And that's why we use a lot of uh, other really good companies who knows a lot about urban and how they do urban spaces. We use you know, psychologists. We use a lot of people who, who are better at these things. Uh, you can call it, not call it soft I values, agree. but, you know, soft political values. And we also now have established a complete Bumper. socioeconomic team uh, in uh, Arab. Mm -hmm. So we can actually start calculating and finding out what are the social economics uh, benefits of doing things. But it, it, it comes down to that the whole team, and there's so many partners in, in, in some of these big, uh, you know, urban generation projects, that you need that, you need that hook. And when you have the hook, and it's a sustainable future, I buy into that because the politician can see there's votes in it. You know, everybody can see that this is amazing if we can pull it off. And I think it's this, these projects and, and, and some of the projects we have that's coming up now, there is a pride in actually doing it circular or sustainable that I never seen before. And it's from people I call in the suits, you know, the financial, even those guys are sometimes way ahead in the thinking. And they don't do it because of the planet, I think. They do it because it's actually good for their financial books. And that's fair enough as long as they do the right thing. Thank you very much, Nille. Thank you. Thank you. Vår nästa talare är med oss från Melbourne i Australien. Paul Lowe, arkitekt och lektor, kommer prata på temat digital materiell praktik. Och bland annat om hur vi som arkitekter genom digital teknik kan komma tillbaka till byggarbetsplatsen och till hantverket i arkitekturen. Our next speaker is Paul Lowe from Melbourne. Paul has a doctorate in architecture with a dissertation on digital material practice, the agency of making. He is a senior lecturer at the Melbourne University School of Design. He previously taught at UEL and the AA in London and coordinated the AA visiting school in Melbourne. Paul is a founding partner of LLDS Power to Make a design and make practice based in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Paul, to the Swedish Architecture Dagana. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nilla. Thanks for the wonderful introductions and invitations. Um, before I start my lecture, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land on which I'm currently located in Melbourne, Australia, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay respect to the elders, and family past and present, and any First Nations who are currently listening to this lecture. So Gunilla has asked if I can give a lecture on the theoretical thinking of our practice, LLDS. And um, so there won't be that many kind of glossy architectural images that I'm gonna show you, but rather I'm gonna unpack some of our design processes centered around technology and making. So it's interesting for me to listen to all the speakers before me discussing the role of technology and how it foretold or paints a narrative of techno optimisms or critique of it. So I start to wonder when, where, how my lectures were started to fit in within this context. So what I want to discuss today is on one hand, a very narrow view of architecture as a discipline 
And on the other hand, a, wide a wider concern of how we can start to step outside of our discipline into practice, doing what we actually do best and actually what we're actually trained to do as an architect um, that's actually designing and making stuff, building habitable spaces, cities, and narrative. So I titled my talk today, Digital Material Practice, the Agency of Making. Sorry, I'm just yep, forwarding my slide. Okay. So we are emerging practice based in Melbourne, Australia, just about as far away we can get away from Sweden as we can. So, and as Nella mentioned, I'm a senior lecturer at the Melbourne School of Design, the University of Melbourne. I'm also the founding partner of Design and Make Practice called LLDS Power to Make with my business partner, David Leggett. So as part of this conglomerate, we also have a research arm called Architecture Research Lab. So my lecture today will cover a mixture of work from both research and practice. As like the last speakers already referencing Cedric Price, um, Cedric Price famously raised the questions in his 1966 lectures, technology is the answer, but what was the problem? What was the questions? And I'm trying to get to my next slide. Yep. And for us, the questions of technology is always centered around the notions of making and its relevance in architecture. So our questions in response to Cedric's price question is, can making be an active agent in architecture design? And if so, how? Apology, my slide is not going forward. LLDS postulates a new mode of practicing architecture, what we call digital material practice. This mode of practice utilizes the agency of making as a generator of ideas, forms, geometries, fabrication logic, tooling, tectonics, and ornamentation. Advanced fabrication technique using computer numeric control technology and robotics took on agencies to shape matters. We explore design through a dialogue between materials and tooling. Here, the tools are not just a means to an end, but are generators of design language and effects. Constant negotiations of limits, constraints, and opportunities that are latent in the making processes. Making is no longer merely an exercise of executing an idea, but a thinking procedure in its own right, an incremental form of building design knowledge. Material effects become ornamental to textures on surface. It's evidence on the very physical interaction of material manipulation through making from furniture to the architectural scale. The tonic, the assembly of material and building parks are critical to our practice. The making of joints or junctions between material is a moment of articulating architectural thinking, what can a friend call instructional craft. Here, detailing through constructional craft facilitates the development of unique architectural expression through continuous prototyping, design language evolved until it strikes an effective balance with tooling and the tectonic procedure. Digital material practice is a complex set of relationships that bridges the practicality of buildings, the design strategy as agencies and affordances, and finally the delivery of projects through procurement. Projects are interconnected to a set of affordances, both off and for design, meaning that they are never independent, but always coexist in parallel and interconnected. Through serial prototyping at various scale, constructional means or method and techniques become the fundamental ideas behind our work. We research through design and actively fabricate our work in order to test its potential. It is therefore important for us as a practice to question the nature of making and craft. 
More critically, how it is important to current design and construction industry after decades, if not centuries, of marginalization of the architect's profession. So next slide, please. Next slide. So what I've just narrated is a particular approach to practice that we have developed in, our, in, in my practice LRDS. And I will try to unpack this in the remaining of this lecture. So here's the mapping of a contemporary discourse around craft and making in design and architecture, especially in relationships to technology from Richard Sennett to Freling to Eddingson. In this lecture, I want to highlight three critical theoretical framework that I hope will give you a sense of what crafts and indeed making means now in design and architecture. Perhaps more precisely, how this framework can be used to sketch an emerging theory of making and of course, how our practice is positioned within this framework. Next, please. We'll start with the work workmanship of David Pye, followed by critical making, and we will end with the theory of material engagement. Next. Part one, workmanship. So David Pye studied architecture at the Architecture Association in London before becoming professor of furniture design at the Royal College of Arts. He, worked, he wrote his most influential book on craft in 1968, titled The Nature and Art of Workmanship in which he talks about workmanship in terms of tools, materials, techniques. In fact, he disliked using the word craft as he thinks it's not precise enough and indeed completely meaningless, as it means different things in different culture and contexts. Next. I have summarized the relationship between tools, materials, and technique as described by David Pye in the web diagrams on the right-hand side. And here you can see the relationship between tools and technique is measured by its appropriateness. The relationship between materials and techniques should be driven by care, de judgment, and dexterity. And finally, the relationship between materials and tools is one of establishing control. So between 2014 and 2016, I interviewed several craftspersons, people in Melbourne, and tried to validate if this is still the case in contemporary craft from Steve Howden, the leather jacket maker, to Marcos Davison's a jeweler's, and Chris Cord, who is a ceramicist. And this study aims to measure contemporary craft theory against the framework set up in Pi's definition of workmanship. Next. Some of us already will be familiar with Pi's, so I'm just gonna go back one. Some of us may already be familiar with David Pye's ideas of workmanship of risk, which is often associated with the concept of digital craft, where digital techniques are being used to produce craft-like objects. However, if you're not, workmanship of risk essentially implies an indeterministic outcome to a making process, exercise to control, judgment, dexterity, and care, essentially all the relationship that I was describing in the last slide. I think it is worth pointing out that Pi's ideas of workmanship of certainty or risk is not a static one. Rather, they should be thought of as a dynamic sliding scale and not absolute. In other words, if we consider tools, materials, and techniques as agents in the making process, the agency is not fixed and dynamic depending on the context of making from mass productions to craft productions. There exists a greater or letter, lesser degree of workmanship of risk simply depending on where you check the pulse. Through my field research, a few key ideas emerges. Taking to take tools and techniques, for example, here's what Marcos Davison's the jewelers call a repertoire, which is constructed from the permutation of tools against its technique in order to create a varied and unique outcome. I also observed that almost all the makers I interview somehow or rather makes their own tools and to enable them to make whatever they want with the aim to actually expand their repertoire. And it's a very important activity that I'll discuss a little bit later. For some craftspeople persons, there are, all, there are very few distinctions between physical and digital tool sets. And for them, tools 
either add as a procedural chain and sometimes as a kind of plug and play system. But what does this actually mean for architectural practice? So I suggest that if we want to consider digital fabrication as a craft practice in the sense of the, in the true sense of the word and not based on how things actually looks, we will need to consider how tools formulate repertoire for design and how techniques become transferable between projects. But I'd like to kind of leave these talks for a second and then we will come back later on to interrogate this. Part two, critical making. With the increased accessibilities of open source software and hardware, we have observed an inversion of knowledge hierarchy in engineering in the past decades. The pyramid structures on the left-hand side is an engineering approach that require mastery of a specific domain. The network-like structures on the right, however, I, I, I will argue is more like a designer's approach, a brick collage method of approaching kicks apart from specific contexts both architecture engineering knowledge to devise solutions to critique, making, and iteration. What Matt Rata called critical making, where he situates the hacking culture as a scholarly activity. The question is, how does critical making allow designers to make sense of the affordance in electronic prototyping platforms and material system to generate novel design? I call this affordances for design as opposed to affordances of design. The psychologist James Gibson coined affordances in 1977 to refer to the possibility of actions with an object or environment based on the user's physical capability. So for example, the affordance of a chair is to allow us to sit and hang rail to grabs and hold one's weight. These are some outcomes from the master studios that David and I run at the Melbourne School of Design titled Machining Aesthetics. We're interested in the affordances for design through technology. In other words, how technology can be generative. And over the last few years, we have had our students working on a very simple but rather complex brief, and that is how to make machines to make architecture. And to start us off, we look at Banacle's structure of generative design. He suggests that an idea is necessary for us to set out the algorithm of the rule set before designing the code. This is then evaluated by the designer, which is then modified, which then modified the, the rule set to iterate the ideas. And the process produces a feedback loop to, to create generativeness in design. Through our teaching, we observe the potential to radically invert these generative models through making. In fact, this bottom-up approach has been around in the past two, 20 years or so, where, gener where geometry, algorithm, and material system are privileged above the ideas and design intent. Design intent is merely a consequence of the design as a process. In other words, the aesthetics and the quality of making, and by quality, I mean the poetics, the atmospheres, the shadows, the texture of a space, are foregrounded as disciplinary knowledge. So a few years ago, we put these notions of critical making to the test. We take on a brief that we gave our students and develop a machines to make architecture. So as a practice, we develop a new tools, a computer numeric control machines called parametric adjustable mode or PAM. And PAM is basically used for fabricating curved concrete panels with a single adjustable mold. And the technology is currently being going through the international phase of patents process and is commercialized through a new startup company. So the new machines that we develop is to address the problem of mold making in our concrete construction industry. And as most of you know, concrete is as good as the mold it is cast in. The traditional method is becoming expensive for curved concrete precast system in Australia, taking about 30% of the cost and generates significant waste. In fact, in the state of Victoria, where I currently am, construction waste amount to 20.4 megatons annually for a population of 5 million people. And what you see here is a graveyard of steel formwork about 20 minutes outside the city of Melbourne, and most of these formwork are fabricated overseas and shipped in for very specific projects and used once. 
And of course, the ideas of an adjustable mode is not a new one. And on the left, you, there are all these, there are a series of typical solutions consisting of multiple pins moving in a single direction, including early work by Renzo Piano for free-forming plastic panels. On the right shows a more recent technique using 3D printed wax as lost form work. We took our inspiration for our machines from the 1958 Philips Pavilion by Le Corbusier and Zanakis, particularly the hyperbolic paraboloid geometry. And on the right is the making process of the cladding panel using sand casting technique. Now, as, as laborious as it is, the design is actually starting to think about ways in concrete formwork and using geometry as an economy of means to deliver a fairly complex form. The process of casting using PAM involves setting up the PAM machines where concrete is then cast into the yellow silicon mold that you can see on the image. And once the concrete is set, um, it is then shaped into the desired curvatures using the four-point actuator formwork through a bespoke um, software. The panel is left to then uh, set for 12 hours, depending on the concrete mix, and then it is then demolded. The last step is to trim the panel into a useful shape using an industrial robotic arm. Now, we utilize the geometric characteristics of hyperbolic paraboloid to develop the mechanisms of the machines. The first is really the four vertexes that defines the geometry. And by moving them, um, the four corners, essentially, you will start to automatically achieve a varied form. The second is the ability to use the second order geometry to form a seamless surface through connecting the ruling on the surface. The four vertexes of the hyperbolic paraboloid are translated into um, the four set of actuators um, using reasonable kind of straightforward uh, transformation max to describe the planned deformations, which we will then be measured as a skew ratio of the panel and a folding angle, what we call beta angle. So here's the machines in operations, leading to several full-scale prototypes over the two, last two years. And one of the key innovations is the joint that allows the frame to move freely without over constraining itself. And here you see all the full extent of the beta folding angle. When casting the panel, the form mode is first moved into the skew positions before being folded into the beta. And the center position of the panel is always kept as a constant reference point. These are early prototypes that measure the three millimeter tolerance within the Australian standards for precast concrete. And once cast, the panel is registered with industrial robotic arm by literally drawing on the panel itself. It is then trimmed using a diamond saw blade. We developed a 12 panel rain screen prototype, each about 10 millimeter thick, as a show showcase to launch the new startup company. And we're now developing the design for an acoustic research pavilion that looks at using the panel to enhance speech intelligibility for an outdoor setting. The pavilion is used as a catalyst in a new urban regeneration area just outside the city of Melbourne. And the design utilizes acoustic property inherent in the curved hyperbolic paraboloid panel. The load bearing panel is 50 mil thick, and early experimental experiment shows the potential to erect the structure without scaffolding. So coming back to the ideas of critical making. The tool making process allows us to synthesize what I call the background knowledge of the, of the techniques, the know-how of casting, for example, with the geometric models of the hyperbolic paraboloid through electronic prototyping. Here we can begin to trace the agencies of making to tools and tool making to produce design. Malaforas defines agents as any elements which make other elements depend upon itself or translate its will into the language of its own. While the agency or the agentive capacity is the capacity of an agent to act or deliver information and knowledge. Now this brings us to our last of the trilogy. Part three, material engagement. 
a framework that emerged out of archaeology and is deeply rooted in Bruno Latour's actor network theory. Actor, ne actor network theory is essentially a theoretical and uh, methodological approach to social theory where everything in a social and natural world exists in constant shifting network of relationships. Lambrus Meloforus in his book, How Things Shapes the Mind, a theory of material engagement, describe how a primitive man or woman will make an axe head from the filling stone. Now, instead of the traditional assumptions that making process is preceded by a design image, Meloforus described the act of making as a constant negotiation between the hand and the mind, which means that there is no image of an axe head, but rather each strike conditions the next one as incremental form of making, as shown in these diagrams from his book. Now, he claims that there is no fixed agencies or fixed agentive roles in the process. Instead, there is a constant struggle towards a maximum grip. Indeed, I've observed the same techniques by craftspersons that are interviewed when they shape their tools. And I'll also argue that we were doing very similar things in the PAM project as we shaped the tools in order to create them. However, the questions remain, how do we bridge the scale of architecture? We explore the ideas of incremental constructions in a house project that is still on site and is about six months away from completions. The house is sited in an inner city suburb of Melbourne on a disused car park spaces fronted by what we call the laneway in Melbourne. And these are the sort of typical tiny back alleyways about four meters wide, typically. And it's the kind of urban characteristics that's left over from the Victorian era. Now we conceive the house as a prototypical typology that can be replicated and starts to begin to infuse very skinny leftover land spaces that we just described in an otherwise underdeveloped part of our city. The aim is to create a series of green finger in the back lane of our cities as we as our population to approach 6 million people by 2030 and that's a 20% increase. In many ways, the typologies are reinterpretations of the Victorian ter terrace housings, which are typically defined by two boundary walls. So to deal with a very tight, narrow site, which is about four meters wide and 20 meters long, we lift the entire ground up to form a gardens. Um, and, and the garden essentially formed a roof, which housed a series of rooms. And in many ways, this is a room, uh, a kind of a roof project. So the ground floor contains the most intimate spaces, the bathroom, the bedroom, while the first floor is left as a kind of large hall, a kind of reference to the old warehouse building in this area. The hall is punctured by a circular, what we call the Baroque staircase. The trap circles on the ground floor plan define the snug or lounge area, and it also adds a spatial dividers to create anti rooms and extended thresholds to eliminate corridors from the design. So every inches of the space is made to work hard. The roof contains the terrace and a green roof garden, as you can see as you saw earlier from the kind of um, the uh, animations, which is then punctured by thirteen roof lights. The green roof is a contribution to the urban setting to support biodiversity of the area. The section shows the very thick laminated timber roof, which acts as a giant plant pot that contains the roof garden. And the skylight bring natural daylights deep into the interior where the snark is. A storm boundary wall means that we only have the two short elevations to bring in more natural light. The east elevations, like the one on your right hand side, um, is kind of the key moment where the soffit of the roof is actually visible from the laneway, from the street itself, a kind of an urban public frontage. And the west elevations really have a kind of filigree steel screening that shakes the evening sun. Now, this is a diagram that describes the procurement of the project. Um, as you can see, the, we utilize our manufacturing capacity to insert as much control over the quality of the project as we can. 
now to fabrication of the mold and also the um, in the case of the roof itself, the entire structure. We also have two engineers involved in this project, Bolinga Gromans, um, who has an office in Melbourne as well, of course, in Europe as well, and uh, who's working on the main concrete frame itself, and a timber specialist, timber imaginary, uh, working on the timber structure roof. Now, in this lecture, I'm just going to focus on the two aspects, the roof, the roof and the concrete structure. The key innovations in the concrete casting is the insertion of a layer of CNC milled polyurethane formwork within a Perry system. Now, the Perry system is a modular formwork developed in Germany, as some of you may know or already used them. And the modular formwork is very useful for this very tight site, as we can also attach scaffold systems to the formwork. After the concrete is cast and Strike back, the polyurethane is upcycled essentially as installations on the roof and below the street on the ground floor. We work quite closely with our off form concreters to develop the sequencing of the formwork, which allow us to understand the opportunities and constraints of the system. Now, at the same time, we started to explore the surface patternations of the concrete to a series of prototypes. Now, the patterns aims to scatter the acoustic in the big rooms that I was describing earlier on the first floor. And this is really to reduce the flutter echo effect. So flutter echo are basically sound energy that's been trapped between the two parallel wall, um, which essentially will cause um, speech uh, distortion. So the experiments lead us to the set of prototypes on the right-hand side um, that you can see here. Um, and the pattern is really created through two set of interfering two paths. They are two-dimensionally milled on a formwork with different routing bits. The diagrams on the right shows the two set of two paths in, two, in the different colors. Um, in fact, this is one aspect of the design where we only work with the physical prototypes and the two paths of the CNC machine to create the pattern. There's almost actually no drawings at all done up onto the construction stage, in fact, after the things is all been built, we only started to work on the internal elevations as a representation purely for communication purposes. As we progressed with the concrete pour, we took a series of high definition digital scan and used the scan to recalibrate the pattern for the next pour. So as you know, many things on site can go wrong. And we use the scan as a means to carefully correct the fabrication information to achieve the final build outcome as a form of feedback. This is the photos of the big hall space that I was talking about earlier on the first floor, taken about a few weeks ago. As you can see, the shadow gaps on the concrete just above kind of um, the floor level um, is essentially the construction joints between the two poles. And you can also start to see, to pick up on the variable pleat surfaces is across the surface where the concrete take on a softness and texturality, almost like a fabric. So this feedback workflow creates incremental form of constructions, not dis dissimilar to Malaforus descriptions of the X head process. And we call this incremental constructions, where digital fabrication information become responsive to the S built data. The benefits here is to capture the reality of the built and use it to adjust the design information. Of course, it eliminates surprises on site, but for us and from the design point of view, we are, we are much more interested as a, in this as kind of design approach where we no longer see design as a static predefined images, but a dialogue between the built reality. In other words, we're constantly negotiating the image of the built formed with the image with the physicality and the reality of the site. And the process is refined as we move on forward to cast the vaulted concrete soffit on the ground floor. Now, similar to the roof, the soffit is designed only with two paths and with tooling, reducing the texture to a set of two paths that converge and diverge in order to create um, and manipulate through the materials. Using this digital scan on site, the entire mode is reparentized to the S built information and robotically milled to fit the S built wall. 
Here, the mold fits within the within about five millimeter tolerance on all sides within the S-built wall, as you can see, and it's designed so that it can also be safely demolded from the underside. And for us, there's a very interesting economy of means in the use of simple two paths to create the highly textured folded surface. In other words, robotic technology enable or provide affordances for design for us to design the soffits, producing a textured space that capture lights and shadow in a very different way, including the imprint of the grain of the timber on the mold on the soffit itself. Now, the last package I would like to talk about is the timber roof. Um, the form and the shapes are a negotiation of multiple criteria on site, including privacy for neighboring windows, for example. Now, like the concrete package, uh, we synthesize the entire pro workflow from design to robotic fabrications in a single computational workflow. And making full-scale prototypes has almost become a standard practice at this point. Here, the innovations, at least within the Australian context, is the use of birch plywood as a laminated structural roof beam, which has not been done in Australia due to the building code. And we work closely with Timber Imagineering, the timber specialist, to devise a manufacturing process so the entire operation can be fabricated in our workshop. The video shows the load bearing of the beams testing at the engineer's workshop, um, which breaks about, about six tons of point load, which is um, almost double the um, load index expected by the engineers. The roof itself is cladded with a layers of plywood sheets, um, which is warped in geometry. And we design a very manual experiment to understand the property of the ply. Here, the ply is warped. When the ply is warped beyond kind of the limits of the materials as shown in the diagrams on the right, uh, we simply manufactured them as pre-laminated panels, as you can see in the videos, similar to how you make a skateboard. So this is an early prototype of the roof light with green roof, uh, with the green roof. Um, and this is exhibited at uh, future prototyping exhibitions in Melbourne last year as part of Melbourne Design Week. And they're currently being manufactured um, almost um, at this moment. Um, it will be installed hopefully within the next month or so, as we're still kind of um, trapped within our lockdown period in Australia. Um, we're almost at the end. And um, here's a video showing the manufacturing process of what we call LVP, the laminated veneered plywood. And this is the lamination process developed with timber and imaginering, with each beam typically taking about six hours to complete, including the drying time. So last October, the main roof beam were being craned into positions. And on the right hand side, you can see the um, digital scan that shows how the roof is then again being modified um, to suit the S build conditions. The large Nogi members or spacer members is then being installed. and followed by the plywood roof deck. The cantilevering roof sections is craned in glass, which is probably the most challenging aspect of the build project.
So this is the interior of the large rooms um, showing the roof in relationship with the concrete wall. And last, a glimpse of the cantilever roof and the facade facing the laneway taken about a few weeks ago. So I want to leave you with this um, image of the incremental constructions of House 5 projects. Um, David actually called the scanning process a way of exercising dexterity and care in constructions, which I thought is quite fitting as we look back to our first framework of workmanship after critical making through tool making, and lastly, the incremental construction process. So here we suggest that contemporary craft in architecture can be reevaluated as a form of digital material practice that utilize making as a form of agencies to deliver design knowledge, and indeed, and perhaps another way of practicing architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, I have with me a panel of, of two uh, colleagues from the industry here in, in Scandinavia. And the first one to ask a question is Christian Pag. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul, for a really uh, captivating presentation. And uh, there's a lot of things to be said about your work. I think both uh, the process and the result is, in a sense, equally <laughs> impressive. So, so thanks a lot for, uh, for that. And, to have a, one reflection is that I guess what you're trying to show is that it's possible to make fantastic uh, work with the quality that you would expect from, uh, let's say, old school uh, workshop work with digital tools and, and, and actually make things that are equally as beautiful. Uh, the question is then to be maybe boring is that can it be equally as effective or at least somehow compete with the standardized industrial production of uh, the build fabric across the world that we, that we see these days. And so I, I work in Norway and I'm uh, incredibly frustrated with seeing just uh, one ugly building popping up like a mushroom after the other and being com completely alike because you see that the big entrepreneurs, they just, they use what they know and what they can build cheaply, et cetera. So, so the question is somehow, can, can you see this uh, being scaled without having uh, people with, with your talent, so to say, facilitating the process? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, um, you know, the issues of scales here, and also, um, I think certainly it's possible in my mind, and I think it's very much about um, education, and it's also changing the way we started to practice and started to approach constructions, and not seeing it, and not seeing constructions as kind of, um, um, like say, a, a detached. Um, practice outside of architecture, but really see construction as part of the practice of architecture. And if we can start to absorb that process or reclaim that um, territory back um, for the architects um, and actually get our hands dirty, so to speak, um, I think there is a huge potential to, uh, for some of these process to actually um, compete with standardized process, you know, the kind of modernist notions of standardization of parks, uh, essentially, you know, it's a very cliche kind of form of saying that, you know, um, technologies already allow us to do it with a series of mass customizations. Um, the questions now really is for us as a discipline, as a, as a practice, um, and as a collective kind of community to say as well, how can we actually turn this around and um, make it to our benefits, you know, to sort of to respond to also some of the larger questions that was being raised in today's discussions on Anthropocene. Um, and I think I was trying to also, hopefully, through my work, started to highlight that um, it is not just about a deep disciplinary understanding or deep disciplinary knowledge that you can develop, but you can also um, use this knowledge to actually then expand a little bit beyond um, looking at how the way we practice. And at the end of the day, we are the one who, um, as, as a kind of it's professions, um, as much as li very of sideline that we can be sometime, we are also the one that's actually generating um, our built environment. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul. I think that's, uh, that's a good answer. And I, I guess it remains to be seen in both, both ways, how, how the architects can maybe come closer to the construction process, but, but also the other way around. I, I sense we need, a, that's also what Nili before here was suggesting, that we need to 
to have the, a systems approach to the whole process of, of the built environment that, um, uh, where maybe a sense of urgency is needed also amongst the other actors. But thanks a lot. Yep, and, thank you. And with that, Paul, actually, I think we will let you go and say thank you so much for a very inspirational talk. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Och um, i, efter den här eftermiddagen, det skulle vara intressant att höra innan, innan vi avrundar den här panelen också och ert deltagande under eftermiddagen. Om ni har några reflektioner, vad har vi sett och hört? Vi har varit på lite, i olika delar av världen och vi har diskuterat olika ämnen också. Eva, vad säger du? Ja, men jag äm, ska faktiskt ner någonting som kom förbi när Jenny Greppe visade sin lilla film, inspirerade film, så, så stod det någonstans äh, Caring World. Att det känns som det här med att, att skapa någonting som är caring, som tar hand om. Vi har varit inne på det liksom, fast på väldigt många olika håll. Äh, om det är den här regenerative grow after loss or da damage, där någon, att någonting faktiskt kan återskapas och, och, och ta som hand om. Och det är egentligen oavsett skala, om det är globalt eller lokalt eller eh, design av en, en, en sak eller en, en, ett system. Alltså hur skapar vi teknologi som vi just såg, som, som nästan är caring eh, <hör> i utvecklingsskedet. Så det, det, det tar jag med mig. Jag tänker att, att det är en fråga. Som man skulle kunna ha i alla projekt. How is this caring? And caring for who? And caring for what? Som en, en väldigt fin sådan responsiv eller ett, ett, ett sätt, ett förhållningssätt att tänka på fysisk miljö och arkitektur. Mm. Fint. Christian, vill du lägga till något? Ja, ja. Eh, det är måske en tanke om att flera av de projekt vi har sett idag visar nödvändigheten av att man kan inte få bli in i sin egen tunnel. Alltså alla må på en måde gøre noget mere, end de plejer. Man kan ikke bare være arkitekt eller øh, property developer. Eller, øh, altså, man må på en eller anden måde tage mere ansvar, som også øh, Liams film i dag på en måde antyder, tage mere ansvar for det, der ligger ud over en selv. Mm. Altså, og det er jo et stort krav. Altså, man må ligesom tænke over den der telefon eller den der kop kaffe. Hvor kommer det egentlig fra? Altså, så der er jo nok en eller anden form for nødvendighed af, at ja, du kalder det kære, eller ja, en, en større bevidsthed, det er jo så udfordringen. En ting er at erkende, at man skal tage mere ansvar. Det andet er jo at, <laughs> at lykkes med det. Og, og der bliver det jo i høj grad et spørgsmål om, om evne. Altså evne til faktisk at forstå sammenhænge og styrke evnen til at arbejde tværfagligt, som jo også har været et stort tema i dag. Og det er jo sådan en ongoing øh, ja, udfordring. Men altså det, det at erkende den udfordring er i hvert fald et godt udgangspunkt. Og jeg synes i dag, det oplæg, vi har set i dag, har været Spændende og inspirerende netop bekræfter af det. Stort tak. Det har været både værdefuldt og trevligt at have er med her under eftermiddagen. Så jeg siger stort tak til Eva Westermark og Christian Pag. Tak. Selv tak. Och då blev det ett par sekunders fördröjning. Nu har jag med mig i studion Agneta Hammer, ordförande för Sveriges arkitekter Skåne. Välkommen Agneta. Ja, men tack. Så mycket. Mycket trevligt att ha dig här. Vi arbetar ju på olika sätt lokalt. Jag har arbetat med att bygga upp något i Malmö från en, som en kanslifunktion för södra Sverige. Men du arbetar just med den ideella delen av Sveriges arkitekter. Eh, berätta, hur arbetar ni och vad betyder det lokala tycker du? Det lokala samtalet är ju jätteviktigt och kanske väldigt mycket frågor som just diskuterats idag. Det här med att influeras, att dela med sig av kunskap men att mötas i just de lokala frågorna. Men det vi också tycker är viktigt är, och det är ett ständigt levande samtal, det här att diskutera vad arkitekturen betyder 
av vår livsmiljö. Men också arkitektens roll och förmåga till holistiskt tänkande. Som gör att vi kan klara framtidens utmaningar. Och att det ska vara ett ständigt levande samtal. Vilken typ av aktiviteter har ni då här för, för att samla eh, lokalföreningen och branschen? Vi har ju traditionellt våra avbarer som drar mycket folk. Och är väldigt omtyckta men nu under pandemin så har vi ju inte kunnat ta det. Istället har vi haft något som vi kallar tre år, ett digitalt mötesforum där vi kan se djupa frågorna. Och nu har vi flera spännande sådana inplanerade under hösten. Vi har också gjort filmning, filmningar om landsbygdsproblematiken. Och sen är det samarbetspartners och nu senast så diskuterade vi just att bredda diskussionen över hela regionen på Kivikart Center där vi diskuterade tillsammans med LTH betydelsen av romslighet och där vi jobbade gränsöverskridande med frågan kring just arkitektur, konst och landskap. Och vi har ju ett trevligt och återkommande samarbete som är att ni varje år på arkitekturdagarna bidrar med den sista föreläsningen den första dagen. Så kvällen den första dagen så har ni en föreläsare som ni bjuder in. Och nu skulle jag vilja be dig att dels berätta vem ni har bjudit in och varför mm. och sen att du presenterar ja, era ja, gäster. Ja, jag gärna. Som tradition så bjuder vi in en internationellt känt eller internationellt kontor och föreläsare som är nytänkande. Och nu har vi bjudit in Ossidiana, Studio Ossidiana som är ett ungt och välkänt kontor från Rotterdam. Och de arbetar lekfullt och färgstarkt och gränsöverskridande. Precis det som vi tror på är väldigt viktigt. Och de jobbar i skärningspunkter mellan arkitektur och konst och forskning. Och genom sina verk så adresserar de vår tids stora utmaningar som klimatförändringarna och sociala integrationen. Så, då ska jag introducera Studio Ossidiana så väldigt mycket. Och det är ju... Welcome to you, Alessandra Covini. I think you will. You there you are. <laughs> welcome, Suriosiana, and welcome to Alessandra Covini and Giovanni Bol Bel uh, Belotti. And we are so glad uh, that we have the opportunity today to listen to your speech and to take part of your skills and experiences. So, uh, welcome to the Day of Architecture in Malmö and help us deepen our knowledge in the sharing point between architecture, design and nature. So, welcome again. Thank you so much for uh, having us here and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, like today we wanted to share with you a, a selection of projects all based uh, on a common uh, research thread, uh, which is an interest uh, in uh, mediative objects, uh, tools and spaces uh, that as uh, people uh, like have developed uh, in order to mediate our relation with other species. And uh, before going there, uh, we wanted to share a few words uh, and images about our studio. And uh, like at Studio Sidiana, like we uh, work mainly in projects that are related uh, to public space uh, with uh, commissions uh, ranging between art, uh, architecture and landscape, uh, both in terms of contracts, uh, yeah. uh, but even more in terms of method. And uh, like in this image, you can see um, uh, like the project, a project called Amsterdam Allegories, uh, which is a project we uh, did three years ago. Um, and that uh, uh, with which we won the Dutch Prederom, which is a competition in the Netherlands that is held uh, every four years. And uh, yeah, it proposed to reimagine an area of Amsterdam, six, seven, as a vast water square uh, inhabited by a collection of floating islands, uh, each bearer of a certain idea of nature and of a possible relation with the environment, uh, reflecting on contemporary ecologies uh, of the city, so from the polders to monocultural fields, uh, to the port, uh, to coal deposits, uh, uh, logistical hubs, uh, to the coastlines, uh, uh, generating a contradictory landscapes, uh, so with which we wanted to reimagine certain uh, genres uh, 
of nature, so the sublime, the uncanny, the pastoral, and so on. And in the past few years, uh, we feel that uh, in some way we have been building fragments uh, of the world we were imagining uh, with Amsterdam allegories. Um, this, for example, is uh, the fire dune, uh, a landscape of dunes and sc sculptural fireplaces that we designed uh, for a public square uh, in Utrecht. Um, and uh, it is made by like, a series of, uh, um, a series of uh, um, fireplaces, fire pits, uh, um, uh, and the chimneys uh, were to cook together uh, um, uh, in, in the very heart of the new neighbor neighborhood of the city. And uh, it became over time a vast playground where to find a shelter, cook together, uh, but also to explore the materials of the city, uh, rediscovering a very simple ritual, which is uh, like sitting by the fire, telling stories, uh, sharing food. Um, and another theme that is uh, quite important for us uh, is uh, the theme of play. Uh, and not play as a form of distraction or pure uh, entertainment, uh, but as a form of abstraction, uh, of word making. Uh, so this one, for example, is uh, a playground in a, a town called Flöten, close to Utrecht, uh, where we realized a, ser uh, a series, a uh, sequence of uh, sculptural uh, play objects, uh, and, um, which like abstracts ponds, tree canopies, uh, and for us it's a landscape of affordances uh, for the new local school. And uh, recently, we've been working on a small floating uh, museum, which will be finished the next year in March, uh, connected to Floriade. And Floriade is uh, like a horticultural fair uh, held every 10 years in the Netherlands. And here we imagined the main room of the museum as a vast water square uh, framed by a pier uh, to which the museum itself uh, is docked as a ship. So the museum is literally a port uh, where boats can dock, allowing for curation along with the cultivation of this uh, water room. Where, along with uh, imagining uh, like uh, art and landscape exhibition, one could swim, could fish, uh, could ice skate. And uh, through this work, uh, we have become more and more interested in the capacity of space to inform relations, uh, not just between people, uh, but between species. Uh, and the title of today's presentation, which is uh, the design of the encounter, uh, is not related with, so, to a single work, uh, but is the theme of an, an ongoing research, uh, looking at uh, the spaces and objects uh, through which uh, we mediate, inform, and transform the relation, not just uh, between people, but uh, between uh, our species uh, and others, uh, in particular with, uh, with birds. And the um, first of three projects we want to present with the first of three projects, uh, we will go more in depth with these variations on a birdcage, which in part is currently exhibited in Venice at the Architecture Biennale. And, but it's been a project that has really been with us as a studio and also sort of personally for quite some time. It began as my postgraduate thesis uh, three, four, four years ago at MIT. It continued with a commission, a very peculiar commission for Turkish artists called Kutugataman for the design of free geese shelters in Eastern Turkey, in Elzinchan. It was then exhibited uh, uh, at Het New Institute in uh, the Netherlands a couple of years ago and then developed also through artist residencies in particular in Maastricht at the Van Eyck Academy. It's um, not just been close to us professionally, we, it's also close to us. Firstly, I mentioned we lived with a parrot, it's called Coco, who's an Amazon Atex, who's about four years old. And um, so it's a work that has been with us in and out of work really for quite some time. And um, in Venice in particular, the exhibition is on until the end of November. Maybe some of you have seen it. Either way, we hope to kind of give a, almost a, an overview of how we imagined it. Uh, we, are, we brought three different installations. One is at the Arsenale in the Arsenale, which is a platform for humans and birds. We designed a pigeon tower, which we'll also talk a bit about today in the Giardino delle Vergini. And a furniture piece, part of um, Studio Over Spaces, is a collective exhibition called The Assembly of the Future uh, in the Central Pavilion. So the project Variations on a Birdcage has many scales. It goes from almost urban territorial scale to furniture making to some architectural projects and material research. But the starting point has always been uh, the same, and it has always been the cage. And with that, we mean the cage as an object, uh, but also and the cage is a sort of archetype. So we think of the cage as kind of connected and tied to a family of uh, relatives, of uh, bird perches, of feeders, bird feeders, and aviaries. And more and more we see it as a rather complex uh, object, not just a place where we contain or where we frame nature, so not just as an enclosure, but 
as a kind of profoundly political object, something uh, which of course is physical and uh, tangible, but is always a model of something else. It's always a model of a certain idea of nature that we carry. And indeed, we mentioned uh, other animals, but uh, we've, it's a, a bit untrue. We are actually particularly interested in birds, and we think there are a few reasons uh, why that resonates so much with us and with our work. Uh, birds in every culture have been perhaps more than any other species. They have carried metaphors. They connect the ground and the sky They're between heaven and earth. Uh, they are also very much and very literally uh, one of the greatest forces behind the globalization of nature. And that is, of course, along us, along humans, in the way they disperse seeds. Uh, they come to occupy and adapt and exist in almost every corner of the planet. So they're always around us and they're always very close. And there is a long history of cohabitation. And the one we're particularly interested in is actually the cohabitation that happened for sort of non-utilitarian purposes. So in relations that were uh, intentionally and deliberately about more than a sort of exchange of calories. Um, besides this kind of uh, physical proximity, we think that in a way birds even exist within us. The imitation of birds probably predates and precedes any form of music and any form of language. And um, these, these three images to us are quite relevant and they compose a, a schematic, incomplete and rather imprecise, but we hope kind of clear, at least for us, important uh, sort of progression of uh, how birds and parrots in particular kind of entered our world. The one you see on the left is actually an Alexandrine parrot, um, which used to be a fairly common sight in Roman times in Europe. Today, the Alexandrine is considered one of uh, the pests, a sort of invasive species in many cities. One of the many stories that surrounds its kind of appearance in our cities goes that uh, the generals of Alexander the Great coming back from India brought some of these birds with them and they then proliferated. Of course, many different cities have a different myth about them. But in a way, they, we, know almost, we know for a fact that uh, birds and parrots were a fairly common sight. We also know that they tend to disappear uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, so around the 5th century. And so somehow, we think less present in the flesh, they start to reappear in stories. They appear in paintings, they appear as metaphors, they become myth, they often appear in the role of uh, witnesses as symbols in representations until they do return and they return this time not just for um, nobility uh, but they return for a kind of uh, growing uh, middle class or a bourgeois class so they return as pets where we think they then take on yet other meaning so this kind of key has been a bit the starting point to look at these animals kept for reasons which were not strictly utilitarian uh, animals we keep for our own pleasure, for their singing, or for affection, for companionship. And of course, this line between utilitarian and non is one that, that blurs and fades uh, very quickly and becomes very confusing to, to trace. Um, and so the cage in all of this is with all these kind of burdens, we think it's kind of a very direct way in which we introduce birds in the domestic realm. And of course, we, they come in with all the burden of metaphors, they come in as physical beings. Um, they come in through a sort of miniaturized ecosystem, which has its own flows of energy, requires maintenance, where there is life and death unfolding, where there's transformation of food into guano and so on. And with this, we think they, they bring um, um, something quite powerful uh, within the domestic realm. They bring a whole uh, different idea about what a territory can be. So beyond the idea of a geopolitical entity of a nation state, we, through, the, through a bird, we kind of can see that the territory can be a root. It could be a sound. It could be the space that one needs to feed, to play, or to make love for a season or for a lifetime. Uh, we see that it's something that is constantly redefined, that it's an ongoing project. And um, of course, we also see that there is an obviously sinister trait to the cage. The analogy to the prison is very obvious. Of course, most. Uh, bird cages, in fact, awkwardly look like miniaturized and simplified um, houses, human homes. Foucault, in fact, suggests that Bentham, the architect of a panopticon, this kind of model prison where a single guard could oversee hundreds of prisoners, had seen and was referring to the menageries of Louis XIV when he was designing the panopticon. So it's also, I think, not really surprising that uh, most of the kind of most important scholars in the field of uh, human-animal relations actually come from the field of uh, gender and race studies, as through this we can address ideas of otherness and 
different forms of control. So at this point is when, um, while working on these references and collecting these images and gathering stories, it's also where we began to think that the cage uh, is much more than the uh, place of an animal in the house, but uh, it is this kind of mediative object. It is a form of built and physical language through which, of course, we know that the bird becomes humanized, he becomes tame, uh, he is controlled, but we're thinking perhaps like in any aesthetic relation, we're looking and we're also being looked back at. So perhaps there is a possibility also for the human to become a bit of a bird. And um, in the end, the looking through the cages, I think, means also being looked at. It means making our own behavior known. Um, the, it defines, the cage can define a bird as a pet or as exotic, as endangered. Um, and in case it escapes, it can become wild, feral, and invasive. But it also um, defines us ultimately as the species that has to invent all these objects, sort of mediate their encounter and relations with the world. And that's where we began to design some cages ourselves with this, this, within this kind of expanded uh, definition. And we started by making a series of models. Some of these were interpreting existing types, others were physical sketches of our own proposals. Uh, we began working on larger prototypes. The idea behind these was always to challenge the cage to become this sort of man-made intermediary between people and birds. And um, one of the, the powerful things, of course, is that the cage doesn't just contain life, but also represents it. In the same way, we think in which a garden represents uh, the world, or, uh, and in turn, perhaps a carpet represents a garden. So we think the cage belongs to this family of objects which exist in multiple places at the same time. This was a sketch model we made for a foldable cage, which would sort of flatten itself in a pure display of bird paraphernalia, sort of two-dimensional cage, working on the explicitly on the simplification of nature. We then developed this into three interconnected walls, which uh, transformed as pushed, pulled, and pivoted spaces of a bird and of a person. And uh, so we began to think of it as a sort of domestic screen where one could negotiate its own territory and kind of question whether it was the artifact itself or, or the space after the boundary that was being, uh, that was being uh, discussed. Um, of course, we're working with a species, with an animal, in a way with a client who can fly, which is um, quite uh, liberating. And this is a, a diagram we, we, we are quite fond of, which uh, synthesizes the veering space uh, of uh, some uh, insectivore birds. So based on this, we sketched a series of cages around a single action, sort of designed not really to accommodate, but rather to visualize the veering space, in this case of a sparrow, in a way to start to think of air itself as a form of territory and as a form of infrastructure. Other models were explicitly about what a territory is. Um, if for a bird, territory is bush, trees, shrubs, uh, and for a tree in turn, that space uh, the, the, the plant needs to live or produce and grow includes actually other forms of life besides rocks and lichens, fungi, birds' nests, a lot of bacteria, different kinds of ground and so on. So even if so the cage becomes a way to define an habitat and also to reveal the kind of many interferences that start to appear when we sort of try to simplify uh, the world around us and try to abstract it. We thought of timid cages, proposing the mildest form of encounter, where we, one would only be allowed to look at the distance, and the only threshold one should really cross would be the one of its own fear, to dare to go as high as possible, to kind of spot the birds. Only the threshold of, of peril would be there. These are the geese grottos we designed uh, for Kutlugataman, um, we mentioned earlier. These were the models we made uh, a few years ago, which are, and the, the, the the project was not to design a shelter for the geese where they would live in. Uh, they're actually shelters where they only go twice a year to lay eggs. And uh, so it's mainly actually about a uh, space for the farmer to observe and guard the flock from the terrace. The elements themselves are have submerged the uh, colorful bricks uh, which protect the flock from the wind and uh, offer this roof for the farmer to oversee the birds. And um, while some objects were projects, others which we began to collect in this kind of family of, of models on these uh, sort of variations on a birdcage, were uh, made uh, to look at existing architectural types that we found uh, particularly powerful. Uh, this is, uh, these are schemes of um, architectural objects called the uh, aeroccoli, which um, we know in the Italian variation, we're sure they exist in other forms, in other, in other places. 
in Italy, they've been used since the 14th century to capture uh, uh, migratory birds alive, which, of course, is not an easy uh, feat in itself. The way they would work would be that a singing bird would be used as a lure. They would attract other birds to a garden enclosure. Uh, nets would be kind of concealed in the perimeter uh, among shrubs and trees and berries and fruits. And then once lured to the enclosed gardens, this flock would be frightened by a hunter with a decoy, which uh, is called spawakio, it's one on the top right of the screen, which really means something that brings fear, as, as it would resemble when thrown a sort of uh, bird of prey. The preys would run, fly close to the ground to escape and remain caught in the nets. So it's obviously um, a very explicitly sort of violent uh, object, architecture. Their use for hunting is prohibited. It is still partially used. A lot of them are used for, for research purposes, which is not sort of without uh, uh, polemics. But um, what we think is um, that the violence in these objects is, of course, very, very explicit, even if there is perhaps a degree of violence in every encounter we have in the environment. This one is very intentional. And, but they are also, to us, quite intriguing. The alcohol is something which is part architecture, part animal, part human, and part plant. So even if kind of ethically charged and rather problematic, it's also, we think, quite uh, contemporary. We've also been going through a, a pigeon phase. We've been completely obsessed with, with pigeon, which we find to be an exceptional family of birds, ranging from the sort of ever-present rock dove to prized racing birds, with a spectrum and degrees of relation to people, which is uh, incredibly wide. They range from uses in agriculture to communication to leisure um, to farming. And of course, they go deep in the field of metaphors. Uh, doves have been freed by popes and uh, revolutionaries uh, alike for, for centuries. So this one was actually inspired by the Egyptian dove gods, celebrating a bird, the Columba Livia domestica, which is said to be the, the first bird to be ever domesticated, from which almost all our pigeons today come from. Most likely this happened in Egypt around 10,000 years ago, but it could have been much earlier. And we think this was a bird in a sort of ar an architectural type, which was completely, which is completely tied to um, human survival, almost at a planetary scale. Before in the 1910s, uh, Veit Sabe figured out how to fix nitrogen artificially, and then Carl Bosch found a way to forward this process industrially. It was birds actually that would provide us with the nitrogen we needed, not just for our farming and fertilizer, but also for our weapons. So it's an animal that is tied to wars and it's tied to trades and to kind of global phenomena. Today it's somehow unnecessary, let's say it's kept for racing or for display, but it's mainly sort of looked at as some kind of nuisance. We pay tribute to Oscar Niemeyer's pigeon tower in Basilia, which then again is, we think, bearer of other metaphors, a sort of bird born from labor, liberated from labor in the capital, in the new capital of Brazil. A modular tower collecting a stack of architectural styles, which became pigeon lofts. A timber version uh, covered in shingles, which we started to imagine as a, as a bird tower dressed like a bird. The bat tower is another architectural type we've become quite fond of. Also, this one particularly carrying a story we, we find quite fascinating. Uh, before the use of pesticides, there was um, bats through pigeon towers. Bat towers like these were actually introduced um, to try to reduce the spread of malaria. And this was happening in particular in Sardinia uh, and in central Italy, as well in, as in the United States. And actually these towers have been uh, patented by an American scientist who shortly before Second World War collaborated with an Italian army general. And um, so the, the kind of two analog towers, one is in Florida and, uh, and, uh, and one is in Italy. And uh, it's quite, we find quite fascinating how the Italian version became a little chapel with a, with a cross and with a warning asking to respect the birds because we're not emissaries of Satan, but they're here to protect us. And um, of course, it's also one of the first, uh, one of the earliest examples, well, explicit examples of um, ecosystem services, of what today we call ecosystem services. It's a certain idea of sort of giving a monetary value uh, to, um, to services provided by every species. This was our model of a bat tower as a sort of tribute to this story. We all, most of you probably know the Snowdon aviary, which is maybe one of the most famous, uh, the most famous aviary uh, ever designed, built in 1965 for the London Zoo. Cedric Price and Frank Newby designed and imagined sort of the first walking aviary, uh, at least in the UK. 
And what usually gets uh, told and noticed, of course, is the extremely elegant uh, tensile structure, which also holds uh, kind of brilliant ideas when making of a mesh would allow for small urban birds to fly in and out while protecting the collection of the zoo actually from larger uh, birds, larger urban birds. But what we were really interested in was actually in the, the cliff, which is this kind of anthropic rock at the base of the aviary, which was to become the true aviary in the sense that the metal mesh was thought to be removed uh, once the territory of the caged birds had been established, something that didn't really happen. But um, I think the, the, the aviary is now being transformed, has been transformed in, a, in an enclosure for primates. Bird perches also became a bit of an obsession. Uh, perches that work at a territorial scale where birds of prey or migratory birds may rest, the domestic one for parrots and all the paraphernalia for, for falconry. We began to see those objects almost as a part of the same family of, of buildings and furniture and clothes almost made out of lines, which, um, uh, for which we designed a series of, of tall perches um, for either migratory birds or birds of prey to um, sort of oversee their territory, which can only really be legible from a bird's eye perspective as a sort of language of shadows. And many birds, in fact, actually see and can read the shadows on the top right that's a result, a diagram from an experiment done in the 30s, trying to demonstrate how uh, preys would recognize the shadow of a, of a hunter from, from the movement. We made models for larger scale aviaries. This one, a uh, tribute to Cedric Price's and Newby's intuition about this kind of aviary that would open with time. In our case, uh, imagining that um, the, 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 the cage, the elements, the perches could be could be opened from above and allowed to flex in the wind, allow birds to pass, and only forbid the entrance to sort of larger and clumsier ground-based uh, mammals on the on the floor. We also began to think of combinations of models and of the possibility of intersections and of sort of contaminations between uh, different kinds of relations, cages in cages with a growing uh, complexity where habitats would collide and be superimposed establishing sev different degrees of, of maintenance, which for us is quite a key, a key word in an approach that more and more becomes for us oriented towards practice and gardening rather than the construction of the frame uh, as a goal in itself. In this case, we thought that uh, the further one went, the more protected the garden became, the lower the maintenance became, but the higher the regulations would be in a way producing what today we would define as, as wilderness a place sort of blessed with the least human presence. So a sort of zoo, which would then be defined through literal acts of invasion or liberation towards a sort of growing complexity of definitions of uh, territories. So with, uh, with the models, and I presented quite a few of them, with uh, there's more in Venice, uh, what we wanted to, to say was actually that uh, the case is violent and crude in the way it uh, simplifies the world, but we think it's also a rare and very special moment in which, um, in, in which, in a legible way, metaphorical, quantitative, and sentimental layers of the world and of thinking and operating upon it have to be read and designed together, which we think is kind of quite important, especially the idea of being able to maintain a sentimental scale, also when thinking about the larger scale possible, also when thinking about territories. So to always keep in mind that a flock is made of individual birds, let's say. And along with the models, uh, we also worked uh, uh, over time on a series of uh, prototypes. Uh, the work actually started uh, with uh, like a research uh, in the US by Giovanni. And, um, and then at the time, we became particularly interested in uh, quack furniture, uh, which is uh, the quintessen quintessential North, uh, North, North American um, sculpture, um, furniture. And, uh, and then after that, uh, like uh, during the quarantine last year, uh, Giovanni and I like found ourselves uh, like working from our studio in Rotterdam without our team, with the only company of uh, our uh, parrot Coco, uh, which is uh, yeah, this uh, two, year, two years old Amazon Oratrix from Reiswick, a place close to Den Haag. And uh, so during, uh, like, uh, yeah, during the first months of the pandemic, uh, we had the time, a lot of time to spend with him. Uh, and he really enjoyed uh, flying uh, uh, freely in our studio, perching on our chairs, uh, and playing with our uh, little models, uh, uh, probably pe picturing himself as a sort of feathered dinosaur attacking miniature buildings uh, while we were distracted. 
And, um, and then this basically, like this time led to the production of uh, like some furniture uh, for us and for him. And then this a selection of these objects is now exhibited at the Biennale uh, within uh, Studio Other Spaces Assembly of the Future exhibition, where we were asked to design a seat for an Newman representative, uh, and in our case, uh, uh, an Amazona Oratrix uh, parrot. So we designed uh, um, a bench for him and for us, uh, which is a variation on the Windsor uh, benches, uh, which is uh, designed to accommodate uh, us uh, together uh, with the parrot, uh, like perching and sitting uh, on it. And uh, we designed a chair uh, with an elongated backrest uh, for Coco to sit while we um, work uh, or eat. And we really love this uh, furniture style because of the variation it allows, uh, whimsical and pragmatic uh, at the same time. So we started developing a few more. Uh, this, for example, is uh, a sort of throne for a person and a bird, uh, part perch, part chair, part bird. The throne is designed to accommodate uh, the parrot on the tallest branches, uh, while hosting uh, his featherless companion. Uh, below. And our bird actually keeps flying uh, towards it and he really enjoys uh, the vantage point. Uh, we also designed a perch coat hanger, not great for the well-being of expensive clothes, uh, but it's great for the bird who is constantly brought new objects uh, to explore. And uh, uh, another one is a tall frame, which is uh, part perch, part a scarecrow to be dressed up uh, like a bird while hanging clothes uh, under uh, the gaze of the parrot. Uh, and the last one is a side table where to empty uh, your own pocket at the end of the day or to leave a book uh, by the bed, uh, providing new exciting objects to be discovered and destroyed by the birds, uh, beak and claws. And uh, we also worked on a modular bench, uh, and this was actually the first prototype of a larger platform that then we presented uh, at the Venice Biennale. And uh, it is, uh, yeah, like we see this as a sort of... Uh, uh, man-made rock, uh, and it's, it's a bench which we thought of as a garden where nature is abstracted. Uh, the lake becomes a water bowl, the mountain a block of clay, the forest a series of perches. Uh, and we made it as a surface uh, to be used uh, outdoors uh, or shared with a domestic bird, uh, where to play or eat on, uh, as well as a map to be occupied, uh, abandoned and transformed. Uh, in fact, it's made with a variety of composite materials binded by lime or compression that can also be edible or destroyable by the bird. And uh, in Maastricht, uh, we designed it on the, we installed it on the, on the ground floor of the Van Eyck Academy, facing a beautiful garden. And Dax uh, quickly uh, built the courage to venture inside, uh, even joining for aperitivo at the opening. And, uh, and then during the last uh, year, the platform, which uh, we planned to be exhibited in Venice, uh, grew, becoming both a one-to-one -one object, uh, a platform for humans and birds, uh, and in a way, a map where models, textures, seeds, plants uh, uh, merge. So this one was made for the Arsenale in Venice, where we presented within the curator exhibition in a second room dedicated to the scale of the body. And, um, and it's a modular and a cast landscape, which is rich in affordances and possibilities of action. So it's a place to, to eat, to play, to touch, and to negotiate boundaries between our species and others. And the collection of scale models that, that Giovanni presented before like, is, is, is also presented here and uh, yeah, reflects on different scales of engagement and action. And it, it becomes a landscape for birds and humans at different scales. And uh, we also built some perches uh, um, at a, and that, that bring in an ambiguous scale between the domestic and the civic. Uh, and then uh, Dovecot Towers uh, define one of the perimeter of, this, uh, in a, of, of, of the platform uh, as a sort of inhabitable lofts uh, for pigeons. And uh, the platform was also, uh, is also inhabited by a series of games. Uh, chess pieces uh, become both one-to-one -one and in a way models uh, flanked by volcanoes feeders uh, and petrified pillows uh, for humans. Uh, and uh, the, the platform is also inhabited by a series of edible insertions uh, as a terrazzo with seeds, shells, uh, or water collection bowls, uh, but also cork bowls, uh, which, for example, Coco loves and loves to destroy, or squid bones uh, that supply birds extra calcium, uh, and, and uh, other games. Uh, uh, and we also paid a tribute to Ensomari animal puzzle with a cast puzzle of uh, birds, uh, which become part of this petrified carpet. Uh, and here there are some images uh, of the process. So sometimes, sometimes we cast ourselves uh, in the studio, for example, these uh, bubbly tiles, uh, which are made with lime and expanded clay. 
Uh, this is uh, our, our uh, preparation of the formwork, uh, where the terrazzo, which is uh, typically done with precious stones, uh, is made with uh, seashells, uh, squid bones, and other edible insertions. Uh, and uh, yeah, others uh, we, we actually uh, made at the Tomello Manufactory, which is an, or an Italian original terrazzo company based in the port of Rotterdam, uh, where we did the majority of the pouring uh, and polishing. And then uh, the pigeon uh, obsession that Giovanni mentioned before was also developed into a larger tower uh, composed uh, of modules uh, seg uh, assembled in three segments. Uh, and uh, actually, this one, we made uh, three of these towers, uh, one in hemp and lime, one in rammed earth, uh, and one with a porous mix uh, of uh, expanded clay that we've been experimenting with. Uh, this was also exhibited in Maastricht in the gardens before the lockdown in March. Uh, 2020, and uh, each floor is dimensioned as a usable space for a, as a, for a pigeon loft, uh, which compose a sort of uh, pigeon totem. And again, here the ducks uh, knew no boundaries uh, and uh, didn't seem to care they were actually picking into uh, pigeon lofts. Uh, and still, as part of our research on dovecots, we designed a pigeon tower for the Venice Biennale in the Giardini delle Vergini. And um, yeah, which uh, we see as a metallic feather dovecote that uh, in a way echoes uh, the city's uh, bell towers, offering shelter to pigeons, uh, magpies, uh, ravens, uh, and other urban birds. And uh, this for us had a quite a significance presented in Venice because pigeons are uh, uh, constantly fired by tourists, uh, reviled by preservation committees, uh, yet uh, they are intrinsically part of the city. So we made this uh, sort of Trojan horse for the birds. Uh, and uh, that take the color of the context, uh, like green or blue. So it's a pigeon tower dressed like a bird with a, a beak-like uh, gutter and a feet that oversee the flock of Venetian pigeons. Uh, and then more briefly, we would like to also share uh, two completed works. And uh, the first one uh, is uh, like a project we completed in Stockholm, uh, a public space for ACDES, the Swedish Museum of Architecture and Design. And uh, uh, here we were asked to design a public space for their summer program. And uh, we envisioned uh, like the project as a garden and as a map of intersecting, uh, of intersecting frames that were uh, designed as a place for the encounter between different gr groups of people and different species. And the project is also an astronomical clock that is pointing north. So it's a design following axes that also mark uh, uh, dusk and dawns on the 21st of June, as well as the dusk range. And um, so the project is also like a platform, so it's a platform design for the encounter between humans and birds, but also uh, with plants, minerals, and artificial rocks. Uh, and we see that also as a mineral garden, a garden of intersecting frames. So in a way, it's also a tribute to the ground. It is uh, made, in fact, by different types of soils, uh, uh, different types of shells, uh, gravel, uh, loam, and sand. And uh, this different type of ground can be, and, and like uh, in, in the months. Uh, started mixing, uh, creating, uh, in a way, a new soil. And, um, oops. <laughs> and uh, like the project, we also see the project as a civic stage uh, for urban horticultural rituals. Uh, so like as a uh, mixing soils, uh, digging, uh, getting the feet wet, uh, picking a flower or some berries. Uh, uh, but it's also a place where to play games, uh, give speeches or lectures and gather, sleep, some bathe on the sundial. sundial. And uh, all these uh, different forms that we uh, like place together uh, uh, allows for different affordances and possibilities of action. So every action around the platform becomes a performance uh, and is a place to observe and be observed. Uh, and, uh, and the, the project is also made by uh, different fragments and different elements. Uh, so one of these elements uh, is uh, uh, a weighted frame all around, uh, which is uh, in between hedges of gardens uh, and a petrified uh, chaise longue, uh, which is uh, like a place to sit, lay on, or run on the top. Another element uh, is a sundial that is uh, pointing north, uh, which is both a slope facing south, uh, and an object that marks uh, the passing of time, uh, the hours of the day, if you stand in front of it. Another element is uh, the bird garden, uh, which is an embassy of the Swedish forest uh, uh, with mosses, uh, different types of berries, uh, ivy, jumberry trees uh, that is only accessible to birds, uh, with a series of openings uh, for humans to pick through. And the garden is also inhabited by a series of man-made rocks uh, as a platform for games, uh, plants and seeds. Uh, and this in a way is a, a fragment of the Venice Biennale platform that now we are uh, testing in public space. Uh, 
prefer to play chess uh, or backgammon uh, and other games. Uh, and uh, um, so games here were played by different groups of people, uh, people of different ages. Uh, we introduced also this, uh, like the bird puzzle as an urban game. Again, it is homage to Insomari, animal puzzle with different bird species. Uh, and at the center, uh, of, uh, of this public space, there is a pond that we, we, we see as a mirror, of, which is a mirror of water. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we use the black gravel uh, for the bottom of the pond, uh, which uh, uh, makes it becoming a dark mirror, uh, reflecting the sky and the surrounding. Uh, and it's filled with water plants as the uh, iris, uh, marshkellas, ranunculus. Uh, and it has been immediately discovered by the feather inhabitants uh, uh, as a buffet or as a spa where to lay in the sun. Uh or bath in the waters. Uh, and uh, alongside the family of birds, uh, young human discovers affordances uh, playing water games uh, uh, while the birds observe. And another element of the project are the tall perches, uh, uh, which we this time we introduce as an urban scale, uh, which intersects the root of migratory birds uh, and casts a shadow on the ground, becoming a projected language. Uh, recalling antennas and masts of sailing boats. And um, there are a series of bird ladders, uh, bird feeders, uh, that have been, uh, like, uh, in this month, conquested by a family of seagulls uh, that use them as a vantage point, uh, which, we leave us, which leave us a little bit worried uh, about the families of ducks and geese uh, beneath. Uh. But also give us, to us, as designers, and to the curator of Arcdes, uh, the responsibility of being gardeners uh, and literally curating, uh, taking care of the work, uh, in this human and non-human population. Uh, and, yeah. Should I... We know we're a bit late, but we're hoping to present one more project. <laughs> um, I'll try to, to go through it as quickly as possible. It's called... The project is called uh, Buyukada Songlines. And um, it's a project we developed for the Istanbul Biennial, Design Biennial, following an invitation by Mariana Pestana, who was a curator. Uh, for which we designed a floating garden, which um, traveled and cruised the waters of Marmara and the Bosphorus, um, connecting to the mainland, to Istanbul's Princess Islands. And uh, we wanted to share a bit of what is behind the project, and then maybe close with a kind of quick journey over the floating garden. The images in the slides are all from uh, Ottoman era miniatures, and uh, show a selection of floating pavilions, which in different times kind of inhabited the waters of Istanbul. So for us, it's a project that fits within a certain uh, tradition of architecture, which is certainly not belonging only to a culture, to a place. We think it's actually a tradition that binds um, water cities in general, and uh, one that allows to speak of multiple contexts, the one in which the object is immersed, but also the one where it could be or could have come from. This is the Teatro del Mondo, which is we probably all know where Aldo Rossi combined uh, early Renaissance Florentine kiosk architecture together with Elizabethan theatre and lighthouse architecture and a tradition of kind of ephemeral uh, carnival related uh, uh, scenes uh, in Venice. And among other contemporary projects, this is a sketch from Robert Smithson who dreamed of a floating island which was only realized actually after his death which kind of sailed around Manhattan. Um, for us, mm, there's, it was important to kind of think that we belong to this tradition, um, which really belongs in a way to water and not just uh, to the archetypes of water on water, but to um, a traditions of storytelling built on it, from uh, Homer to Conrad, from Stevenson to Ursula Le Guin, and not, and of course Aldo Rossi and Robert Smithson and many others. And Istanbul is this kind of 20 million inhabitant uh, city, uh, typically, of course, described as the convergence of Asia and Europe, or as the meeting point of, of uh, free cities, of uh, free, free uh, used to be free cities, of Galatapea, of the Golden Horn, and of Skutai. And actually, the islands are just on the bottom of the map, this kind of archipelago of nine islands, five miles of the, of the, of the coast, which have been... Uh, for for century, really, for, they've been inhabited for millennia, but they've always been somehow a place of retreat, uh, whether voluntary retreat or non-voluntary retreat. And they have this unique microclimate and ecology. It used to be where Ottoman royalty um, would exile its kind of unwanted relatives. It's also where Trotsky, for instance, when fleeing from Soviet Russia, uh, retired to and spent three or four years there between 1929 and 1933. 
So it's a place that has a tradition of uh, sort of intellectuals living there and working there, but of course also fishermen and generations and thousands of years of inhabitation. And this kind of multicultural vocation we think goes, as it often is the case, stretches from the human realm to the non-human one. The waters of Mama um, are already stratified, the brackish ones coming from the Black Sea flow uh, on top, while beneath flow the saltier ones coming from the Aegean Sea. And uh, there's Within the archipelago, there's a history of sort of millennia of human and non-human nomads uh, and of kind of negotiation between wilderness and cultivation and domestication. So in this context, we managed, began to imagine a project which was Buyukada Songlines, Buyukada being the name of the largest of these nine islands, echoing Chatwin's uh, diaries of the Aboriginal Songlines, where again, we could start to think of other definition of territories uh, in this case, uh, territories which emerge not as lines on a map, uh, but through the knowledge of stories, of music, of plants and minerals and so on. So this is more or less the route we followed, coming from the Asian shore, approaching the archipelago and then heading to the European shores. And this was um, our garden some weeks ago this summer, as it was docked on the commercial port of Buyukada, sort of waiting to sail off. So it's really a project which is as much a design project as it is the design and the curation of, of a journey. So the host was this floating installation, uh, which was a garden built on a barge to designed to accommodate plants and soils and insects, along with birds and people, which was towed between, uh, between the islands. And um, the thought was that this would become a sort of floating embassy, where the garden would collect uh, plants and artifacts and materials, as well as kind of be enriched with an immaterial collection of stories from the islands where one could literally cultivate and curate uh, at the same time. There's three installations on it, sort of earthly platform uh, based on our prototypes for Venice and for, uh, for Utomos Verket, for Arcles, a marine terrazzo medallion at the center made with aggregates gathered on the shores of Buyukada, and a collection uh, which becomes a sort of central medallion of the carpet and a collection of perches, in this case, kind of protected, protecting a kind of coring almost of the island's uh, plants, which are harvested and collected from the islands. And uh, so this became a place where there were conversations and it always existed, I think, a bit like gardens often do at the threshold of, uh, of politics, of design and of ecology, where the idea for us would be that we could walk stale on the waters that we're actually trying to describe and that we could uh, discuss things while being on top of them. So it traveled, it hosted uh, yoga sessions, fishermen, insects, um, academics, quite a few stray cats in the evenings. And uh, the photos you see actually are from a colleague of ours, Ikado De Vecchi, who traveled on the last stretch of the journey with us and uh, documented uh, from this moment, more or less, when a rather surprised captain kind of greeted us in Buyukada before traveling across Myanmar and heading to the European, to the European shores. And that this for us kind of is tied to a photo on water as a possibility of a public space and the power of a place where rules are always something that needs to be understood and uh, negotiated and where all the definitions of tourist and traveler kind of fade. So we, the barge became this kind of observer of a city as it moved around the coast of Buyukada towards the islands of Neandos, which uh, seemed, was described as uninhabited. In fact, it's inhabited by a rather lively uh, colony of cormorants on its shores, uh, towards the coast of Eli Beliada, uh, and some islands like Siriada, which only appear in the distance, which actually carry some uh, really meaningful stories. This is where 80,000 dogs in around 1910 were abandoned to be left, to, be, to, to die, essentially, by the, by the municipality at the time. And traditionally, it had been a place of exile. Uh, Yasiada, the island where actually the generals and many uh, politicians and academics were tried and sentenced after the coup of 1960. So a place which of course is between leisure and fear and, and politics. It's a place kind of completely rich with human sister, uh, history. We had uh, some kind of, of course, non-human passengers um, as we recorded conversations. Crows took a lift from island to island, along with bees and butterflies, which eventually find, found their way back with us to the Buyukada, the islands they had left from. And um, um, eventually we arrived to um, Fatip, the tip of Istanbul, 
with Ajah Sophia in the Blue Mosque in the distance under the Galata Bridge until we arrive to Halic, the port where we docked and uh, where the barge stayed for a few weeks open to the public and with the stories until a few weeks ago it sailed back to uh, Buyukada for one last time where it was installed on land. Thank you. Thank you so much for your most impressive speech. And of course, it ra raises a lot of questions. But uh, I think that you explore and you search for new connections and theories, and you realize it into different physical solutions. So what uh, reactions do you really get from people, ordinary people and decision makers? and what from that could be your best advice to other architects as us here uh, what to do uh, if we want to work with uh, the sharing point between architecture and nature Would you like to <laughs> um thank you i mean we're always up for receiving advice as much as giving it <laughs> we're a young studio and i think what we um what was important for us was actually really to focus when we began working together on a theme which for us quite quickly became public space because with all the burden it carries we still believe it's the prime place for actually for experimentation and also one of the realms which has kind of been dumped down the most which has become the most uh, banal and globalized in not a very happy way. So we thought that uh, there is a possibility through work to tell uh, stories, to embody stories and to suggest narratives and uses. And um, this has been, um, uh, in general, I think, I hope, well received. We actually are quite amazed ourselves when you look back at the work, we realize that we are allowed <laughs> and encouraged to do some of the projects we managed to complete. This last project we showed was incredibly complex from a logistical point of view and from an administrative point of view it happened in the middle of a pandemic it was perhaps more valuable than ever uh, but uh, it happened exactly because there was the will and the desire to see it work and because other people shared this uh, kind of unconventional <laughs> format and so in that case the city as well as the curator and many many people in our team and artisans and others saw the the value and the, and the possibility of uh, work projects with a project like that, which is not a fantasy, it's a sort of a stretch of the imagination, but it's a stretch of the real, it's not a fairy, fairy tale. And it's, uh, yeah, it was really um, a collaborative project, uh, this, uh, uh, this last one. And what we love in projects is uh, uh, that uh, usually, like this, uh, the collaborators. Uh, uh, that I mean, that, like uh, yeah, project would has uh, all these kind of different collaborators make, make us uh, think think at different, uh, uh, other, like what it means uh, being authors, uh, because uh, at the end like there are different kind of uh, uh, all these kind of different parties uh, like in the project are really like uh, contributing to making it happen, uh, and the project becomes really a collective project, and this happened uh, in many different forms uh, from. Um, uh, like the, this uh, cast uh, platforms that we presented at the Biennale, where uh, like all this, the project also came uh, like from the intelligence of the manufacturer. We worked with uh, our team. It was really like uh, certain objects were made uh, by us in our studio, and others were cast with them, uh, and uh, or the team of Arkdes that really like pulled together all this the project uh, in the middle of the pandemic, or uh, uh, like the Istanbul project with fifteen completely different parties coming from uh, very different backgrounds. Uh, so. Yeah, like I think this kind of collaborative uh, aspect uh, of our practice is one of the things that we, we, we enjoy the most and we, we value as the most very valuable. Uh. Okay, thank you very much again for the most inspiring speech. And now I give you the word, Gunilla. Thank you. And as we conclude the first day of the Swedish Architecture Dagana, I want to thank all the participating speakers that we have met today. It has been a great pleasure listening to your talks. Also, thank you to our discussion panel and to our partners and sponsors. Och med detta så tackar vi för idag med framförallt ett stort tack till våra föreläsare, paneldeltagare och samarbetspartners. 
Imorgon är programmet på svenska och nordiska. Vi kommer starta dagen med Sigurd Leverens och vi kommer avsluta med New European Bauhaus. Och däremellan har vi ungefär 25 föreläsare och gäster. Jag hoppas att vi ses imorgon. Stort tack för idag.